honourable members, the Speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I uh, wish to correct the record in relation to one aspect of the debate on the privacy amendment, private yeah. sector bill. Attorney General is in seeking indulgence to correct the record and may proceed. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, as I said, I wish to correct a record in relation to one aspect of the debate on the Privacy Amendment Private Sector Bill in the House on the 8th of November 2000. In comparing the application of the national privacy principles to existing data in the Bill to the law that applied when the Public Sector Privacy Act was introduced in 1998, 1988, I said that the Retrospective aspects of the bill mirror the provisions that applied to the public sector at the time that the public sector provisions of the Privacy Act 1988 were introduced. That's at Hansard, page 22387. My department had provided this advice but has now re-examined the issue. I'm now advised that the position under the bill is more complex than my statement might suggest. The broad approach in section 15 of the Privacy Act 1988 and clause 16C of the Privacy Amendment Private Sector Bill is the same in that some principles will apply to all information whenever collected and some only to information collected after commencement. However, it's necessary to consider the position in relation to each particular issue. For instance, I acknowledge that in relation to the particular issue of access to and correction of personal information, the position under the proposed bill is that the relevant NPP on this issue only applies to information collected after the commencement of the bill. The explanatory memorandum on the bill makes this clear. In this respect, the position does not mirror the position under the 1988 Act. In certain other respects, such as National Privacy Principles 1 and 4, the position in relation to collection and security of information under the bill is consistent with the position taken in relation to those issues under the Act. Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I, I wish to raise a matter of unfinished business yesterday. Are you going to ask the, the, uh, of the, the Minister for Education Services to withdraw unconditionally? The, 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 the minister, a little less help from the member for Jagger Jagger would go a long way. The minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Uh, Mr Speaker, what, what I was uh, going on to say was the minister who got to the table. Uh, we are seeking, as we saw it yesterday before he after he exited the chamber, an unconditional withdrawal as all other members of this House are obliged to make in similar circumstances. The Leader of the Opposition, may, as is evident, the Minister for Employment Services is seeking the call. The Attorney General has been given precedent because the matter raised by him was a matter that could have been interpreted as uh, unwittingly misleading the House, which clearly was not his intent, and it seemed to me for that reason to have precedent, and so the Attorney General was granted appropriate precedent. The Minister of Employment Services. The, I, I will uh, invite the Minister, in the interests of the House, to resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business. Mr. Speaker, our concern is not that you allowed the Attorney General to speak first. That was proper. Our concern is not that the, the, this Minister. It is a point of order. I do not need any help from the member for Mitchell or any other members on my right. The manager of opposition business is being granted a good deal of latitude, as he knows, and he's aware of what is about well, to happen. The point of what order point I'm seeking to raise is that, that, Mr. Speaker, not that this minister be given leave to make a statement, but that you require him to withdraw the remark. That's what happens to everybody the else. Manager of opposition they business are required will resume to withdraw unconditionally. Manager of opposition business will resume his seat.
as will be evident to everyone in the House, it's not the right of any member of the House to dictate the terms to the chair. I have had no conversation with the Minister for Employment Services other than the conversation that I had already relayed to the manager of opposition business uh, yesterday evening. And, uh, the Minister for Employment Services indicated that he wishes to address the House, and I recognise him. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, seek your indulgence briefly to clear up an apparent misunderstanding. Oh, oh, no, Minister for Employment Services, resume his seat. Leader of the Opposition. The point of order is simply this: a member of Parliament has required him to withdraw. A uh, statement that he made yesterday. That is all the matter that ought to be before Leader the House. Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. Leader of the House. My point of order is that uh, you have provided them. I understand that uh, uh, you intend to provide the minister with indulgence, and that does not provide an opportunity for uh, debating by the leader of the opposition. The leader of the opposition. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. As the occupier of the chair, I will in fact listen closely to what the Minister for Employment Services has to say and then respond appropriately in the interests of all members. The The Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you. I refer to page 476 of House of Representatives Practice, Mr Speaker. How can giving leave to the Minister to make a statement meet the requirements of the standing orders that, having been asked to withdraw, a, a, speak, a member must withdraw immediately in a respectful manner, unreservedly and without conditions or qualifications? How can a statement meet that requirement? The Leader of the House. The order is uh, very simple, Mr Speaker, and that is it is uh, uh, clear from your remarks that you intend to give the Minister the opportunity to address the House. Under those, circumst <laughs> under those, cir under those circumstances, whatever might be the uh, issues that the Opposition wants to raise, they can't be raised by way of phony points of order uh, to prevent, to prevent the, the Minister from addressing the House. Uh, they have their problems, Mr. Speaker, on the, the opposition side. The uh, we, we've the all read the Daily the Telegraph today. Leader of the House, page one. His seat. The leader of the House. The leader of the House will resume his seat. The leader of the House will resume his seat. The House will come to order. The House. The Leader of the Opposition. That, uh, that has just been raised. I would have thought the appropriate precedence is this. You can, of course, give indulgence to any member of the House as you see fit at any point of time. But the unfinished business here surely would take precedence over any indulgence. It is a simple matter, a request for a withdrawal. Simple, ordinary matter. It happens every day in this chamber and every day you exercise your authority. If after he has withdrawn you are prepared to give him some sort of indulgence, well, that's a matter entirely for you. But uh, what, is, uh, what is there in precedence is that uh, we now have the first opportunity of this minister being in the House after he has been required to withdraw us or requested to withdraw a statement from a member of parliament who has been offended by something that he has said, and that ought to take precedence over anything else he does. This is the last. This is the last occasion that I will recognise a point of order on the current ruling before me. I recognise the Leader of the House. Well, thank you for your uh, patience, uh, Mr Speaker, um, but uh, the facts are that the Minister has not been asked to withdraw by you. Uh, so the submit what, the leader of the what the Leader of the Opposition is attempting to do, Mr Speaker, is to, is to beguile you into preventing the Minister uh, from uh, addressing the House, which you indicated was your intention. And we simply invite you to proceed with your stated intention without further delay. Leader of the House will resume his seat. I have indicated to the Manager of Opposition Business that, in fact, I have taken this as far as I intend to take in terms of an absurd—
I, I want to know I, Member for Sturt. Member for Sturt. At the great risk of diluting the authority of the chair, I recognise the manager of opposition business. He knows the spirit in which I concede that to him. I appreciate that point. But, Mr. Speaker, you've just said correctly that there's a ruling before the chair. Can you tell us what the ruling is? Are you ruling that he does not have to withdraw and that you are not going to require him to withdraw? Is that your the ruling? The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. For the information of all members, there is a matter um, which was exacerbated by my misunderstanding of a statement yesterday. Following that, I spoke briefly to the Minister for Employment Services, who was in transit to Melbourne. And I indicated to him that the House would be facilitated if he would um, come into the House and make a statement. I, I do not. I have a great deal of confidence. I have a great deal of confidence in the common sense of all members of. I have a great deal of confidence in the common sense of all members of this chamber. I do not believe that the Minister for Employment Services seeks in any way to um, at, in fuel the difficult to fuel would not facilitate the House in any way if the Chair were forced to take disciplinary action on any member of the House at this particular point in time. My conversation with the Minister followed the remarks that are being referred to in the Chamber. I, in fact, invite the Minister to clarify the matters that were raised yesterday. No, and, and I will take action if I consider his action has been inappropriate following the conversation I had with him. The Minister. The minister, leader, the minister has been recognised, and the, the minister has had no opportunity. Look, there has, there has been, there has been no ruling. I have in, I, I am, as in, there has been no ruling. I, I am merely inviting the minister to come to the dispatch box and clar and clarify a matter which I have already discussed with him, and I recognise the minister. Thanks, the minister. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, my comment in the House yesterday: uh, How can you the keep minister the minister cannot be heard above the hubbub when you're taking their money? Uh, was clearly a reference to the Australian Democrat Party, which the member for Dixon then led. It was not a reference to the member for Dixon personally. The, the, leader, the, the leader of the opposition the leader, the leader of the opposition the leader of the opposition's comments will not as yet be recorded because I had not recognized him. The leader of the opposition. Mr Speaker, I formally again ask that he withdraw his comments of yesterday. And I will read these comments to you because what he has just said is an out and out lie. And I will, the leader I will, of the opposition. I, the leader I will of the go opposition. No, an out and out untruth. The, the leader of the opposition will. The leader of the opposition will proceed. The, uh, the statement he made yesterday, and I'm now reading from it. She issued a press release. And now, Mr. Speaker, yesterday the member for Dixon, responding to a misleading statement from ACOS, issued a press release. Mr. Speaker, she issued a press release. Mr. Speaker, she didn't do live media, lest she be asked the obvious question. How can you keep the so-and-sos honest when you're taking their money? How can you keep the so-and-so honest when you're taking their money? There's nothing generic about that, Mr Speaker. The, member for, the mem member for Dixon was repeatedly identified as the person who had taken the money in that particular statement. It was an allegation, therefore, and the clear implication of a bribe. We require an unreserved withdrawal right now. The Leader of the House. 
The member for Longman. I just. I would be very disappointed if, in order to get an opportunity to stress the House, I had to rise. In a genuine effort to clarify this matter, I invited the Minister for Employment Services to make a statement. I distinctly heard him say that he was uh, in no way reflecting on the member for Dixon as an— and I will And I distinctly heard him say that he was separating the member for, for Dixon from member for Dixon. I manager of opposition business will, will resume his seat. I distinctly heard him. Member for Wentworth. I distinctly heard him say that he was separating the member for Dixon from any reference that he made yesterday. I now ask him I now ask him if in fact that was precisely what he did and if he withdraw and uh, if he withdraws any inference that the member for Dixon was in receipt of any money. That was my understanding. That was my understanding. Now, the Leader of the Opposition. I believe that your ruling be dissented from. No, 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 no. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, the, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is that there has not been a ruling. I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, if, he, if he cares to move a motion, for the suspension of standing orders, I warn the member for Swan uh, to uh, to allow the matter to be debated. The government would uh, allow him, without gag, to move a suspension motion, and the minister will be very happy to respond to each to each and every one of your baseless uh, claims. The fact of the matter is, the government, Mr. Speaker, the government supports the minister. We support the, leader of the House what he says. Resume, The leader of the House will resume his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. The The manager of opposition business may be seeking a great deal, but until the House is orderly, he will not be recognised. Manager of opposition business. I'm seeking a ruling from you on, on the standing order 75, 76 and 77. 75 says no member may use offensive words against any member, against either House or the Parliament or any member. 76 says all imputations of improper, improper motives and all personal reflections are highly disorderly. And 77 says, when any offensive or disorderly words are used, the speaker shall intervene. Yeah. Are you ruling that those words were neither offensive nor personal reflections nor disorderly? Given the, some of the things which have required us to withdraw, including statements about him. Leader of the House seeking the call. Um, on, on a point of order, uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, fact is that you did not make a ruling. Now you are invited to establish a ruling uh, for the purposes of the opposition's games that they want to play in the House this morning. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker uh, there are forms of the House, and as the government has said, we are, we are, we are more than happy uh, to uh, not exercise uh, our rights to uh, gag any suspension motion. If they want to move a suspension motion, they should do so. But, Mr. Speaker, a request, 
a request to you to make a ruling simply for their political purposes is not a request which, in uh, uh, our view, Mr. Speaker, you should accede to. It's as simple as that. The manager of. Oh, you said he can't give us. Oh, so you're giving the answer, Mr. Starling. You're instructing the Speaker. So you're instructing the Speaker. Yes, he is instructing. That's what he is doing. He's instructing. You're instructing the Speaker. The member for Kingston. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on the, uh, on the point of order. I draw your attention to Standing Order 78, Speaker to determine offensive words. When the attention of the Speaker is drawn to words used, he or she shall determine whether or not they are offensive or disorderly. There is no way that I, any of my predecessors, or I'm bold to suggest any of my successors, would do anything that in any way eroded the status and authority of any standing order, I hope, but in this instance particularly the standing orders referred to by the Manager of Opposition Business. In an effort to ensure that an, what could have been seen as an unfair reflection on the member for Dixon was appropriately dealt with. As the occupier of the chair, I both granted her more indulgence and is normally extended in a personal explanation yesterday afternoon, contacted the minister who was in transit, asked him to come in and make a statement which would ensure that there could be no suggestion that the member for Dixon had been implicated in the comments he made. And he not only did that this morning, but when I asked him to clarify the matter, indicated he had also withdrawn any statement he had made. For that matter, I for, for that for that reason, I believe that the matter had been entirely appropriately and fairly dealt with, and that the standing orders had been maintained. The, my belief is that the Hansard record will show that there is nothing that the that has been said by the. Minister for Employment Services that could in fairly impinge on the reputation of the member for Dixon. The Leader of the Opposition. I move that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. The Speaker's ruling, which has just been given. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, only a few moments ago, the Opposition were asking you to make a ruling. You didn't make a ruling, so they got up and so they so they get up and pretend that you've made a ruling. Now the fact is, there has been there has been no ruling. Uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, on that basis, they have only one choice. We've offered it to them. They ought to move a motion to suspend standing orders, and then they can have their say. Um. No, no, I'm not, I'm, the Leader of the Opposition has never been denied the call and is not being denied it now. I merely apply the rule that I have applied for over two years and that is that unless people can be heard, they will not be recognised. The, the member for Prospect, as an occupier of the chair, leader of the... I have... The, the, leader, the Leader of the Opposition. All right. With the motion that I have moved that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. 
Mr. Speaker, as was uh, pointed the out, the leader of the opposition, I am not aware, as this, uh, I'm not seeking to frustrate you in any way. I'm not aware of having given a ruling in the. Well, we didn't have to you ruled, you ruled that Within that was the a satisfactory withdrawal, Mr. Speaker. You ruled that that was a satisfactory explanation from the minister, and I disagree with your ruling. I am moving dissent from it. And uh, the, uh, therefore, I move the speaker's ruling be dissented from. You clearly have given a ruling, Mr. Speaker, and I am dissenting from it. So, Mr. Speaker. The uh, manager of opposition business pointed out quite clearly in the course of his remarks that uh, there are a series of processes in standing orders which have to be undergone if a member of parliament takes offence at anything which is said in this chamber directed personally at them. The effect of that has over the years been that uh, speakers generally have taken the view that when a member finds something offensive, no matter the what it is— The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the House— uh, Mr Speaker, there is no motion before you because you have not been—one, uh, you did not make a ruling, and secondly, you have not accepted uh, that a motion of dissent to that ruling could be given, seeing as there was not one. And on that basis, Mr Speaker, the uh, Leader of the Opposition is not entitled to address the House on a, uh, the basis of a fictional, a fictional uh, motion based on a fictional ruling. And on that basis, uh, he should not be given the call. As the Leader of the Opposition is well aware, I was in fact consulting the clerk to ensure that my understanding was consistent with uh, what I believe the standing orders would dictate. I did not believe I had made a ruling. Uh, I was allowing the Leader of the Opposition to continue his remarks until I had clarified that matter. I still not, do not believe that in the comments I have made I had actually made a ruling. I had merely reinforced the standing orders and said that I believe they had been upheld. The Manager of Opposition Business. How can you interpret Standing Order 78? which requires you to determine whether words are disorderly or offensive as not a standing order under which you just made a ruling that those words were not offensive or disorderly. I mean, no. how, otherwise, you, you have an obligation under the standing orders to determine. You've done it. We think you're wrong, and that's a ruling, and we are disagreeing with it. If it is not, then are you proposing to rule? Are you therefore proposing to rule the Leader of the Opposition's motion out of order? Um, the Manager of Opposition Business. The Manager of Opposition Business is aware that all that I have done, uh, clearly I did, I did um, indicate as I had yesterday that I, on, when I had an opportunity to look at the statement made by the Minister for Employment Services that the words were. Um, Offensive, uh, offensive to the member for Dixon, and the, for that reason I required him to come into the chamber and indicate that he was not, in fact, uh, uh, faking those words at the member for Dixon. Now, now, and 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 the Minister of Employment Services had said that he was, in fact, prepared, had withdrawn them. Minister for Employment Services. Uh, uh, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent the member for Dixon from making a statement to forthwith explain her actions in relation to the 1996 preference selling deal between the ALP and the Australian Democrats. Come on, let's, let's have the debate. You say you want the, the debate, minister, let's have it. Come on, show minister, a bit of for what. Minister will resume his seat. Manager of Opposition Business. I raise a point of order, Mr Speaker. That motion is out of order. There's already a motion before the Chair. Unless you are going to rule the Leader of the Opposition's motion out of order, this motion is not in order. You have to determine 
which you can't avoid ruling forever. One of these motions is out of order. You have to determine which one. Yes, I, as the manager of opposition business is aware, in consultation with the clerk, and I can see that the leader of the opposition was continuing to address the chamber, not inappropriately. I did not believe that the leader of the opposition had a valid motion because I did not believe that I had ruled, and I have so ruled. Yes. But the, the, The Leader of the Opposition. We now have a clear cut ruling. The ruling that you have just made, Mr. Speaker, goes to the, uh, the view that uh, there was not a valid, rule, a valid matter before the House because you felt that uh, the request yesterday that this minister be required to withdraw the statements that he made, the withdraw the statement that he made, had been adequately dealt with by what he had had to say here in this chamber. And that, uh, and that, that you had sufficiently stand, you had sufficiently exercised your jurisdiction under standing orders. Now, quite clearly, that is not the case. And you have now ruled that it is not possible for me to move a dissent motion uh, from uh, that particular ruling. And I now, yeah. and you have now ruled, and I move dissent from what I your understand. ruling has just, the, uh, that has just been delivered. The leader of the opposition will resume his seat. Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government has afforded the opposition an opportunity to debate this matter. Uh, this is clearly this is clearly a this is clearly a fabrication, and on that basis, uh, we move that it be no further heard. The, the, the question is that the leader of the opposition be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells. Member for Banks. Member for Banks. Member for Banks.
Lock the doors. The question is that the Leader of the Opposition be no longer heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Corangamite and Hinkler tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 75, no 60. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Manager of Opposition. I second the motion, Mr Speaker. This minister is a disgrace and the government's support for him is a disgrace the and the Prime Minister should be ashamed of himself for supporting this scumbag. Resume his seat. The question is that the Manager of Opposition Business be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute.
Member for Cowan. Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister for Foreign Affairs. Lock the doors. The question is that the Manager of Opposition Business be no longer heard. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. As this is a successive division, anyone entering the chamber should report to the tellers. I appoint the tellers as the member for Karangamite and Hinkler for the eyes and the members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrn on for the nose. Member for Barker, not in his seat. Order. The result of the division is I 75, no 60. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion of dissent be agreed to. The Minister for Employment Services. At the Australian Labor Party is in a deep political crisis, and the one thing they don't want to hear is the Member truth. The Minister for Employment Services will resume his seat. The question is that the Minister for Employment Services. Order. 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 The question is that the Minister for Employment Services be no longer heard. All those that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute. As this, is a as this is a successive division, anyone entering the chamber should report to the tellers. When all the suicides over, I'll maybe jump to my feet. Lock the doors. The question is that the Minister for Employment Service has been no longer heard. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the members for Karangamite and Hinkler, tellers for the eyes. The members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong, tellers for the nose. 
Order. The result of the division is I 60, no 75. The question is therefore negative. 
Would members please quickly and quietly resume their seats? The Minister for Employment Services. Mr. Speaker, why are members opposite so scared of what Cheryl might say? Why are they trying to impose a vow of silence on Cheryl? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Australian Labor Party is rock, is is locked the, into, a, into a deep crisis, the, a deep crisis, the, and they don't the minister, want to... the minister for Employment Services, both the leader of the opposition and the manager of opposition business, are aware that I cannot accept the resolution. The House has just voted that the Minister for Employment Services be heard. The Minister for Employment Services. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, why are members opposite so scared of giving the member for Dixon an opportunity to hear us, to, to, to speak? Why can't we let the this Minister for Employment Services explain the, the Minister for Employment Services will resume his seat. The leader of the house will the leader of the house will resume his seat. Minister for Forests and Conservation. The, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition. No, the leader of the opposition was. Uh, the, the leader of the opposition resume his seat. The member for Cowan, the leader of the opposition, I, 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 have, I have given an indication, understanding order, an opinion, understanding order 86, which in fact I would have, I would not have said I'd given a ruling. I would have given an opinion. But standing order 86 insists that should any of the questions be negative, no similar proposal shall be received by the speaker or the chair. And I have no other choice but to indicate they are the standing orders. Either my motion's in order or you've ruled it out of order. There's no third position. Is my I motion in order or the, not? The motion, of the, the motion moved by the manager of opposition business is not in order. And I have ruled the motion out of order. The Leader of the Opposition, like anyone the in this of the place opposition. to move that a ruling be dissented from. Now, this cowardly bunch opposite decided to gag both of us when we were up on our scrapers speaking on that dissent ruling. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, as far the as we are concerned. The leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is not entitled, not because of any ruling that you've given, but because of the standing orders. And you, can't, you, you, can move, you can move a dissent against rulings which require the exercise of judgment by the Speaker, but you can't move a dissent because you don't like the standing orders. And Mr Speaker, he used to be the Leader of the House. You would think he would understand just you would think that he would at least understand the elemental features of the standing orders. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, one the last point, of the House. one last point to make, Mr. Speaker, is that, uh, Mr. Speaker, the last point I make, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, the fact is that the suspension motion, the suspension motion, uh, expire, the time for that expired at 24 past. That motion, therefore, should be allowed to be put. And then we can hear from the member for Dixon. In order to facilitate the House, let me pick up the point made by the Leader of the House. The time allotted for the suspension of standing orders moved by the Minister for Employment Services has expired. As the question was not stated by the Chair, the motion lapses. The, question, the motion currently before the chair is a motion of dissent from the chair's ruling, which was not dealt with prior to the resolution moved by the Leader of the Opposition.
The motion currently before the chair is a motion of dissent from the standing orders moved uh, beg your pardon, dissent from the speaker's ruling moved earlier by the leader of the opposition. It has not been dealt with. But, but the, to clarify the point raised by the manager of opposition business, all that the chair has sought to do is progressively deal with the resolutions before it. And the resolution currently before the chair is a resolution of dissent from the speaker's ruling moved by the leader of the opposition. And the, and the manager of opposition business will be recognised at the appropriate time. It's normal for the call to be given from one side to the other. The call the the, the, clerk is in, the clerk has pointed out to me that not only my resolution but the clock furthermore reinforces the fact that the person who currently has the call is the Minister for Employment Services. Minister for Employment and Mr Services. Speaker, the point I want to make is, is, is why are they scared of letting Amelia yeah. Dixon speak? Why wouldn't they accept uh, our original, our original we, suspension? Because they're terrified, absolutely terrified, of what the member for Dixon might say. The member for Dixon is the booby trap at the heart of the Labor Party. That's what the member for Dixon is now. The Minister for Employment Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Dixon. The member for Dixon should explain exactly what she has had to do with the 1996 preference-selling deal between the Democrats and the ALP. She shouldn't leave it to Meg Lees to explain these matters. She was the, the Minister leader of the for Democrats. Employment Services will resume his seat. The Minister for Employment Services will resume his seat. The Chief Opposition Whip has been expressing perhaps understandable indignation, but he must appreciate the fact that it is neither appropriate nor necessary for the Chair to recognise him when he is not in his position. I am well aware, I am well aware of that, and the Manager of Opposition Business is in the House. For that reason, I was unable to recognise the Chief Opposition Whip. Manager of Opposition Business. If the motion before us is the dissent, he is not speaking to that motion I and is out of order and should be not be allowed to continue in that tone in I this debate. Oh. But in any event, I move that he be no longer heard. I wonder if the Manager of Opposition Business, whose resolution is in, uh, would in fact like to reconsider that resolution. In fact, I had a, given the Minister of Employment Service a good deal of latitude. Anticipating, anticipating that he ought to come to the debate and then, as I trust the manager for opposition business noted, required him to resume his seat. Uh, I am, uh, if the manager of opposition business cares to withdraw his resolution, in fact, the Minister of Employment Services' time has almost expired. The, the Minister for Employment Services' time has expired. The question is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented with. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is a division required? Yes. Ring the bells for one minute. The Minister for Forests and Conservation. Minister for Forests and Conservation. The Minister for Foreign. The Minister for Forests and Conservation and the Minister for Foreign Affairs.
Lock the doors. The question is that the speaker's ruling be dissented from. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Port Adelaide. I oh, beg your pardon. Karangamite and Hinkler tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong tell us for the nose. The member for Dobell. There was, I understand, a one minute ring of the bells. Uh, in fact, I am unable to explain to the House why there was a one minute uh, uh, calling of the bills. And
House will come to order. Member for Farrah.
do not have the result of the division. That's why I couldn't respond to it. Speaker, as I, indicated, as I indicated to the Leader of the Opposition earlier when I was accused of ignoring him, I do not have the result of the division. Manager of Opposition Business. My point of order, Mr Speaker, is that at least two government members were admitted to the vote after you had required the doors to be closed. The member for Macon, yes. the member for Macon and the member for Mitchell. Mm. The Mitchell and Macon came in after the doors. Yeah, they were standing here on this. Mm. The, I am, I am conscious of the matter raised by the Manager of Opposition Business and, in fact, have been conferring with the clerk about it. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, it seems to me, and on the assumption or the supposition uh, of an equality of votes, what the circumstances are, are clear, I think, to everybody in the House, and that, and that is that uh, there was an intervening debate but a one-minute division call. Now, Mr. Speaker, under, under, those, under those circumstances, the leader of the House has the call. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I did not, I did not hear all of the words of the leader, uh, manager of opposition business. But obviously, if that were the case, there would be two courses of action uh, available. Uh, I understood him to suggest that you could. Recommit the vote, which is which is which is which is which is, which is, which is not uncommon in the Senate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, or, fur or furthermore, Mr. Speaker, you could rely upon you could rely upon the leader of the House has the call. You could rely otherwise, Mr. Speaker, upon the general principle that for a vote to be carried, a majority is required. Or finally, Mr. Speaker. Uh, without uh, further checking my constitutional legal principles, but I put it to you, Mr. Speaker, that to, the to, chief opposition to put the, the chief opposition whip is out of order. To put the matter beyond doubt, Mr. Speaker, you would, of course, be perfectly entitled to exercise a casting vote so that the matter is dealt with expeditiously. The Leader of the Opposition. Is it not a fact that the result of the decision is the division is 57 votes all? The division has been conducted in accordance with the requirements that you have laid down, with the bells rung to your satisfaction and the, and the members who wish to vote entering this chamber to vote. It's 57 all, as we can all see here, Mr Speaker. That leaves you in the situation of a casting vote. Now, Mr Speaker, you are now in the situation of determining between the dignity of the House and your job. Um, right. <coughs> when the House has come to order, including the member for Prospect, when the House has come to order, 
I would respond to the Leader of the Opposition by indicating that I do not have the result at this stage. No, I, merely, I, merely make, I merely indicate to the Leader of the Opposition that I do not have the result. The member for Farrah. The member for Lyons. The member for Farrah. The member for Lyons will be dealt with. The member for Farrah. If I, if I could, I would recognise you, and I now can, thanks to the member for Banks exercising some courtesy. The decision is in the hands of the clerks. The clerks are in a position to hand it to you. Oh, thank Mr. you. Mr Speaker, what is the result? The Leader of the Opposition understands that I am not in a position to pronounce the result of the division until I have the division sheets. As the manager of opposition business is well aware, the clerk in fact makes the sheets available to the occupier of the chair when he or she is satisfied that the division is accurate. And, and I am in, well, simply awaiting that event. The, the Leader of the House. Just uh, prior to matters uh, being brought to a head, uh, Mr Speaker, I simply. Mr Speaker, I only put to you, uh, in response to the comments from the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the fact of the matter is that there was a one-minute intervention, and we can see people standing outside. Uh, the, fact, the, fact, the, fact, the fact of the matter is, Mr Speaker, not too much of this should be made. It should simply be dealt with by either the casting vote or by the recommitment. Uh, and on that basis, Mr. Speaker, I mean that is obviously a matter for you. I would put to you the simplest thing is that this you to exercise a casting vote, which no one doubts that you have. The manager of opposition business, the manager of opposition business, is in fact being a little less patient than is normally the case. I had just finished hearing a point of order from the Leader of the House. The result of the division is eyes 57, nose 57. The question is therefore not resolved. I have the power as the chair to exercise a casting vote. It would clearly be inappropriate for me to cast a casting vote um, with the eyes, given that I believe that my original decision was entirely appropriate. It would also be equally, in my view, inappropriate for me to exercise a casting vote with the no's, because I do not believe I should vote simply to maintain myself in office. For that reason, understanding order 208, it seems reasonable to recommit the vote. Yeah. Ring the bells for four minutes. The I will. The bells are being rung. There was an error. There is no error. That's a walkout. Look at the high. Thank you very much. Yeah, good.
Right, 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 terrific. Be proud of yourself, you hyena. That is great. Lock the doors. The question is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Hinklatellas for the noes, the honourable members for Port Adelaide and there being, there being no tellers for the ayes, the question is therefore negative. The members, please quickly and quietly resume their seats. Leader of the Opposition. This House has no confidence in the Speaker. Oh. Mr Speaker, this is an unprecedented day. Stupidity. And this day is, has uh, arrived without precedence basically because of faults in your own rulings. You had an opportunity at the beginning of this day to uphold the standing orders of this parliament. The standing orders of the parliament, which you have exercised hitherto with rigour, 
on this side of the House and with some vigour from time to time on the other side of the House. There is, and it may well be, an oddball standing order in one sense, but there is an absolute requirement if a member of this parliament raises a point that is something that is said to them as being offensive that they are obliged to withdraw. And generally speaking, when a leader of the opposition gets up and asks for a withdrawal of a comment that has been made, it is withdrawn unreservedly. Now I realise you have a child on your hands and an unguided missile in the form and a bully in the form of the Minister for Employment Services, and that is a difficult thing for a speaker to deal with at the best of times. A difficult thing for the speaker to deal with at the best of times. But it is one thing to have a termagant on your hands, but it is quite another thing to allow him to get away with it. And what was required this morning of this character, who's gone out there for all over the last 24 hours, the last 24 hours in defiance of the concerns that you expressed yesterday, it was time to bring him to order. See, characters like Abbott, characters like this minister, uh, characters like this minister, are uh, invariably time bombs under their own decks. And the time bomb under this deck has blown up on you comprehensively, Mr Speaker, destroyed the authority of your speakership, destroyed the meaning of standing orders, destroyed decent behaviour in this House. Now the, the minister got up. Instead of being required to withdraw, instead of being required to withdraw at the beginning of proceedings, a simple procedure, he was allowed to stand up and lie in this chamber. He was allowed to stand up in this chamber and say, despite the existence, despite the obvious implications of what he had to stay and stand in the Hansard. And it's not an implication. It was a clear-cut statement. He uh, decided to deter. He decided to excuse himself by saying all that his comments were were generic, and then to compound that defiance of normal standing orders by getting up and 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 uh, moving, getting up and moving that the member for Dixon be obliged to answer a lie. That is what Abbott did. In the, the minister did in this chamber. That's what the minister did. The, he got the, up. Minister for Forest and Conservation. On the point of order, nobody who's lecturing you should be using members' names no, the when they know Forest the rules and of the house. Resume his seat. I, the minister for Forest and Conservation. The leader of the opposition, in fact, corrected the error he had made, and for that reason, I did not intervene. The leader. Of the well, opposition. Mr. Speaker. What the minister has been doing over the course of the last 24 hours is cocking a snoot at you. The last, he knew full well yesterday you acknowledged your mistake, and the way in which you acknowledged it, you made it clear cut that if you would understood the full implications of the meaning of what uh, was said by the minister to the member for Dixon, then you would have required action on his part. And what the minister has been saying. What the minister has been saying over the airwaves since then is that he intends to come into this place and defy normal parliamentary precedent. And get away with it. And get away with it. And how smart Alec I am. And he's been boasting around the benches of the parliament. Look, I'm the big bomb thrower, I'm the big deal, I'm the fellow who can get the opposition running. Leader of the opposition will resume his seat. The, the le the, the Minister for Forests and Conservation will resume his seat. The Minister for Forests and Conservation will resume his seat. Minister for Forests and Conservation and the Leader of the Opposition will resume their seats. The and the Member for Lions is warned. Member for Hindmarsh, Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs will not conference in the chamber.
the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, what was said by the member, the Minister, yesterday was this. Now, Mr Speaker, yesterday the Minister for, member for Dixon, responding to a misleading statement from ACOS, issued a press release. Mr Speaker, she issued a press release. Mr Speaker, she didn't do live media lest she be asked the obvious question. How can you keep the so-and-sos honest when you're taking their money? How can you keep the so-and-sos honest when you're taking their money? Now, this is, this is plain language, Mr Speaker, plain language. It is a suggestion in this plain language this plain language that the member for Dixon had received a bribe. That was the implication of it, and it is against those sorts of implications that the standing orders stand to protect members. Stand to protect members. Then the minister came into this, this uh, chamber, firstly misled this chamber by saying that all he had said, that all he had said was a generic application to uh, Democrats as opposed to the. Uh, the member for Dixon, which is a defeat of plain language, I would have thought, that particular proposition, and then compounded this inter reasonable interpretation of it by getting up and moving a resolution in this chamber to try to get the member for Dixon to come in and state that she hadn't received a bribe. Classic when did you stop beating your wife type performance. Now, none of that would have happened if something very simple had occurred earlier in this day. Earlier this day. And that is if normal standing orders had proceeded. I was reminded earlier today of an incident in the Senate in 1988 when, uh, the, uh, when uh, my Senate colleague from Western Australia, Peter Walsh, described Senator Walters as a harpy. <coughs> Walsh then left the chamber after a withdrawal had been demanded. Left the chamber. The President of the Senate, and remember, the President of the Senate does not have necessarily a majority supporting him, sent the sergeant of arms down to Walsh's office to arrest the Black Rod down to Walsh's office to arrest him, to bring him back into the chamber to make a formal withdrawal. That was Doug McClellan. That was a presiding officer. That is what happened. That is what happened then. That was a president of the Senate determined to uphold the standards of the Senate. He was prepared to have the Black Rod arrest the minister to oblige him to enter the chamber to make a formal withdrawal. That's guts. That's defence of the parliamentary process. That was not actually required of you. A simple requirement of the minister at the table to get up and withdraw. And I note recently you've developed this habit of uh, also asking for apologies, though I must say that's nowhere in standing orders that I can find. But nevertheless, it might have been useful on that particular occasion to ask for an apology as well. Because accusing somebody of taking bribes in the political process is a, in anybody's terms, in anybody's language, in anybody's language, a, uh, an offence against standing orders that requires at a minimum a motion and backing up that motion with a serious presentation of evidence to that extent. None of those things, of course, were occurring. So that's how this whole imbroglio started. And then we proceeded to, after they, with their smart aleck efforts at, uh, at seizing the, uh, the standing orders in this place and, uh, and getting into us found themselves arguing against impossible propositions that rulings weren't rulings, <laughs> absurd propositions. Whenever you pronounce on the standing orders, you make a ruling. Whether the ruling is clear-cut in your favour or whether it's an area of discretion or whatever, it is a ruling. You make rulings when you're asked by members of parliament. You cannot sit in the chair and say, this is not a ruling. <laughs> I'm just giving you some sort of advice. Of course you can't do that. Everything you say from the chair because you're the presiding officer in charge of standing orders is a ruling. Every point is a ruling. A motion of dissent may be well based or ill based. And generally speaking, motions of dissent are rarely moved in this place. And you've got yourself you've found yourself in this situation, as I said, uh, only partially through uh, through uh, fault of your own. But at the end of the day, 
You have to be independent of all of us, and you have to make rulings. If we dissent from your rulings, then that is, uh, uh, then that is a matter for debate in this chamber. It is a perfect entitlement of all members to do it. But in trying to slip slide around that persistently, we finally get to a position where a ruling, a dissent motion, was acceptable even to you, and uh, your very strange interpretations of what uh, what a ruling is in this place. Now that dissent motion was then put before this chamber, and in the course of that dissent motion, the uh, the bells were rung. They were rung for a period of one minute. We, on our side of the House, suggested that perhaps they should have been rung longer. When we suggested that they should have been wrong, rung longer, you ruled. You ruled that we were wrong. You ruled, Mr. Speaker, that uh, that it was perfectly appropriate in the circumstances for the bells to have been rung for one minute. It is not as though there was any doubt in the minds of any member in this chamber. There was a small problem with that, in that one or two of the folk who uh, voted ultimately for you found themselves on our side at the normal closure of the division and were allowed, as you spoke, slowly to move to the other side in the course of uh, the— oh, they came through the door after you had closed the two of them through. And uh, had they, of course, been locked out, it would have been 55, 57 against you. Now, Mr. Speaker, then there was the vote, and the vote was 57 all. A vote legitimately, co legitimately counted in this chamber, and a division legitimately held. A division legitimately held when all objections that could have been raised to it—that is that the doors hadn't been sufficient hadn't been quickly enough locked on the other side and that that one minute was not a long not a long enough period of time for the division to be held had both been ruled on by you those were the only potential impurities in the division the only potential impurities and before the count was held you'd ruled on both of them you had ruled on both of them and then when you were finally had handed to you, after avoiding it for a period of some 10 minutes, the clerk's recording of the division, you then stood up and said, well, as far as you are concerned, there was uh, a level of confusion, a sufficient level of confusion, for you not to cast your vote, either for or against yourself, and to invite a further division in this chamber. Well, Mr Speaker, there was no confusion. There was no confusion or error. You had given clear-cut rulings. There wasn't anybody sort of lying in the cross benches there who were counted twice uh, on one side or another by the tellers. There was no issue as to whether or not the particular bodies in the seats at the time were, the, were, were alive and, uh, and actually in the seats at the time. There was no, there was no issue as far as that was concerned. There was no question of a stranger in the House appearing to vote when the stranger should not have been voting. There was no question of that. There was no question of a member under suspension voting in the chamber and creating confusion and contaminating the result as a result of that. There was no person involved at all. No person involved at all in confusing the division. And any potential inadequacies in that division had already been ruled on by you, and we did not persist with them. You made the ruling. Of the couple of characters who uh, were let in after, the, uh, after the, the doors were supposed to have been closed could vote. Fine. We didn't persist with it. You made the ruling that uh, one minute was long enough for the division after we made it, after we asked for it. We did not persist with it. We accepted the rulings that you made, and then it came to 57 57. Now you find yourself in the position of, uh, of working out what it is that you ought to be doing. You have to make a choice between your job and the dignity of this place, between your job and the operation of the standing orders. And I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, you did not take the choice that most accords with the dignity of this place. Hence, we have been obliged to move no confidence in you. No confidence in the handling of the processes around this division. No confidence in the way in which you've handled 
this particular minister who has been treated with kid gloves, treated with kid gloves over the course of the last 24 hours. And I can recollect yesterday, I can recollect yesterday, one after another, our people being obliged to withdraw. And I cannot recollect one of those withdrawals involving an accusation on the other side that they'd been involved in bribery or that they'd been involved, they'd been involved for example, in, uh, in that particular case or incident which occurred in New South Wales uh, when, uh, a, uh, when in fact a, uh, a member of parliament, a senior Liberal, invited uh, the Shooters' Party to change their preferences on the basis of paying. We made no accusations to the Prime Minister on those matters, though he, of course, was the leader of the party at that point of time. We had plenty of opportunity to sling mud yesterday on those uh, particular matters, but we didn't. Only had we done so would we, have been found, we, would we have found ourselves in a position where somebody on this side of the House said something anywhere remotely as offensive, as was said by this particular minister. Now, this particular minister is, is the classic bomb thrower. Is the classic bomb thrower. He is he so proud of his he is so proud of his reputation that he does not care what happens to you. He does not care what happens to the government. He does not care what happens to decent standing orders in this place. He is utterly, utterly arrogant. Now, from time to time, from time to time, people who live their lives in a state of suspended adolescence arrive in this chamber. People who spend their lives in a state frozen in school debating techniques of their childhood, people who have never left the sand pit do arrive in this place and, of course, have no moral function, have no moral direction, no understanding of traditions that apply in this chamber, but only an utter self centeredness and utter pridefulness an utter disregard for the basic decencies which dominate the political processes. And uh, those children really have to be stood on by speakers to establish their authority. To establish their authority. There is one child in this House now, and this is the child who has got you into trouble. But the child could have been dealt with you by you, Mr Speaker, so simply, so easily. You, all you required of him was a simple withdrawal, a simple withdrawal. Then he could have moved his childish motion after that if he had wanted to. He could have moved his childish suspension of standing orders then if he had wanted to at that point of time, having been subject to the normal decent processes that apply to all the rest of us. But that, Mr Speaker, was not a course you took. You have made, as a Speaker, error after error in your handling of this material over the course of the last 24 hours. You have allowed the chair to be defied. You have allowed the chair, therefore, to be defied in the way in which uh, this, uh, you have conducted yourself in this regard. And then finally, then finally, you have allowed a division to be bodgy. This House Order. can have no confidence Order. in you at all. Order of opposition's time has expired. Manager of Opposition Business. In the motion, reserve my right to speak. The question is that the House has no confidence in the conduct of the Chair, the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you are, Mr. Speaker, you are a good Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you are an honest Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, not one person. The Leader of the House will resume not his seat. The Leader of the Opposition was heard in silence on what is obviously a matter of great moment to the House and the occupier of the chair. Similar courtesy will be extended to the Leader of the House. Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, uh, you are a good speaker, you are a fair speaker, you are a, you are a highly respected member of this the parliament. The member for Perth. Mr Speaker, on, on both the sides. The member for Perth. Mr. Speaker, on both sides of this parliament, uh, your decency, your fairness has been respected by all members. 
And only, only this week, Mr. Speaker, I have heard senior members of the Labor Party speak in glowing terms of you, not only as a person, but furthermore as a speaker, with the goodwill, Mr. Speaker. The member for Prospect. Leo, with, it's you. Uh, Mr. Wonderful. Speaker, with I the chair, speaker, the leader of the house. So is the member for Blacksland. The leader of the house. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have heard members of the Labor Party say, despite their constant interjections, despite their constant interjections, uh, that you are a speaker. Uh, who has clearly exhibited a good will, the member for Denison, the bona fides of a speaker attempting to do what is everybody recognises is always a difficult job. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I member will, for Denison, uh, I hope forensically uh, uh, show in my remarks today all of the claims that have been made against you are either completely and totally exaggerated out of all proportion or furthermore in some cases as as in some cases simply and completely fabric just fabricated just fabricated just to give you uh, you know a quick example uh, just to give you a, a quick example I heard uh, deputy I heard, leader of the opposition I can barely believe my ears but I did hear mr. speaker the leader of the Member opposition Perth, say he said um, Everything you say is a ruling, and therefore attempting to justify some of the absurd motions that he moved this morning. Well, Mr. Speaker, I refer you to page 204 of 204 of the House of Reps practice, where in 1984 Speaker Jenkins, Jenkins named a member, and an attempt was made to dissent from his ruling in naming the member. The Speaker then ruled that the proposed motion of dissent was not in order, as he had not made a ruling. Now, Mr. Speaker, in other words, there is a Labor Speaker making the very point that you made this morning, and we had this, well, quite frankly, a stupid suggestion, a, but I say, Mr. Speaker, a malicious suggestion from the Leader of the Opposition, because he knows otherwise, Mr. Speaker, he knows otherwise because he's been a Leader of the House, to make that claim that those motions that he moved this morning in dissent were validly based. He, he knows to be wrong. And for him then to use that as justification for this motion shows you that when he's after you know, a political objective, in this particular case uh, the Minister for the uh, for Employment Services, this weak leader is prepared to attack a speaker who is well respected well respected by people on his own side. Speak well respected by people on his own the side. The member for Denison so simply attacking you, Mr. Speaker, and fabricating arguments for his own political purposes. Well, Mr. Speaker, that is that is weakness in the extreme. Member for Melbourne, weakness Force. in the extreme, and we utterly, completely reject it. As we will, of course, member completely uh, reject this uh, baseless uncalled for, unreasonable, member for unjustifiable motion. Now, Mr Speaker, all this comes about uh, as the of— The member for Denison is warned. Mr Speaker, this comes about because yesterday, uh, as is often the case in question time, there was a controversy. There was a controversy. Well, I don't think the member for Dixon should uh, you know, throw barbs in our direction when the manager of opposition used the word scumbag in the House this morning, reminiscent you know, of one of the worst, worst, uh, uh, the worst offenders member for in this House, namely uh, the former leader of the Labor Party, the man with whom the leader of the opposition learned some of his tricks, uh, the former uh, Prime Minister Keating. But, Mr Speaker, it came about because yesterday there was a fracas because, as Australia now knows, there have been federal Labor members in Queensland who have been associated with payments in cash, in brown paper bags, uh, to provide financial support to other political parties. 
and as one of the editorials, as one of the editorials, House member for Banks. I have a point of order in relation to the comments that the member is now making. I'd argue that this is a no confidence motion against you, Mr. Speaker, the and this is no, this is not relevant to the substantive the motion before the seat. House. Member for Banks will resume his seat. The Leader of the House had prefaced his remarks by indicating why he was uh, using this illustration. The Leader of the House. Speaker, I am simply explaining the context in which this matter came about. And the Labor Party is very sensitive because one of theirs has been caught up uh, with the allegations of corruption being made in Queensland. That's why, That's why you are Member so sensitive for about it. Now, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, uh, the words used by the uh, Minister for Employment Services, and he can go to the details uh, of that. Um, he can go. He can. He can go to the details of those. Well, pass me over the quote. I'm sorry, I don't carry it around with me. You know, big deal. But what he referred to, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the House has the call. What he referred to uh, was a slogan. Member for Dixon. A slogan of the Australian Democrats. And that slogan was, vote for the Democrats and we will keep the bastards honest. That is the slogan to which he referred to. And what he did yesterday, he, was, he referred yesterday in question time to the fact, to your great embarrassment, the Australian Member Democrats were receiving money from the Labor Party in a preference deal. Mr Speaker, in the 1996 election, the party that says they would keep both sides honest in fact did a secret deal with the Labor Party. That is your embarrassment. Member for Melbourne and then, of course, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, then of course, the member for Dixon, she joined the Labor Party and she's now on their front bench. No wonder you are embarrassed. No wonder, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, so what is the Labor Party's tactic today? We, they came in here today. Oh, they were so affronted. Oh, you know, after the years of abuse which they piled onto our side, he makes an obvious statement, namely that the Democrats, and in particular because she was the leader of the Democrats, that uh, the member for Dixon was involved in a deal to member receive money from the Labor Party in an exchange of preferences. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, they waltzed in here, oh yeah, full of fabricated uh, and confected concern and anger and angst about those particular comments. And Mr. Speaker, they had, of course, they had every opportunity, every opportunity to allow, to allow the member for Dixon to get member up on her feet and explain herself. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, when, when it was obvious that they were so determined uh, to Member have a Jager debate Jager. on this matter, we offered them the opportunity. The, the Minister for, the Empl for Employment Services actually moved a motion to suspend standing orders to provide her with the opportunity uh, to speak. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, many things Member are said the in Northern this place. Territory. And, Mr. Speaker, when you considered the matter yesterday, when you considered the matter yesterday, Mr. Speaker, uh, you actually took a, you took a different interpretation of what was said. And at the end of question time, I mean, you, n no one in this house could ask more of a speaker than what you did yesterday, which was to stand up and honestly say, on the basis of what you had heard. And no one should forget, when you're sitting in the speaker's chair with the babble that comes from that side, you don't always hear every last word. But you had the decency and the honesty, Mr. Speaker, to stand up and say, "Well, you'd heard these words uttered. You thought they meant one thing, and you were therefore prepared to go away and have a look at it." Now, Mr. Speaker, seriously, can anybody uh, genuinely believe that any more could be asked of a speaker? Well, I tell you what. When the Labor Party was running in this country and we had Labor speakers, we never had as fair a go as the fair go you yesterday provided to the opposition on this matter. And Mr Speaker, furthermore, you, were, you provided ample opportunities, ample opportunities in giving the opposition the call this morning. Uh, you know, up and down on their feet like a yo-yo this morning. Mr Speaker, the Minister for, the, for Employment Services uh, provided the context within which 
uh, he made his remarks, and that basically was the end of it. But of course, from the Labor Party's point of view, it can't be the end of it. It can't be the end of it because so embarrassed are they by this matter that they knew when they came in here, when they had the opportunity to put up the member for Dixon, what did they do? They attacked the speaker. They attacked the speaker. Instead of defending their own, because they don't trust her to get her on her own two feet to explain herself, oh no, they, they fabricate an attack on you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Deputy Mr. Leader speaker. of the Opposition. And part of that fabrication was to say— Member for Sydney. Part of that fabrication. It's the old. It's the the member for Melbourne Ports is not in his seat, and I warn him. It's, it's the, the third time I've had to draw his attention to what it's ought to be a courtesy extended to all members in the House. That's the old tactic, Mr Speaker. Put up, put up a straw man and say, oh, he alleged there was a bribe. What he alleged was that there was a deal for the passing of money between the Labor Party and the Democrats. And, he, and given the fact that the member for Lilly had, in fact, in the House, publicly disclosed that and confirmed it, and we know the Leader of the Opposition he knows all about it because he's had them all in to explain themselves. How could you contest that? That was, in fact, a fact on the record in the House. And it is a shame on you that you should attack the Speaker as a political defence on your own part. Mr uh, Speaker, um, a couple of other matters uh, need to be said. Um, first of all, they, uh, I mentioned the point about the rulings. Uh, the fact is that the standing orders are the standing orders, and you simply implement those standing orders. There are times, there are times and circumstances under the standing orders where it's necessary for you to exercise a discretion, and it's quite clear from reading the standing orders. But, for example, in respect of the closing of the doors, uh, for example, in respect of the closing of the doors, Mr. Member Speaker, for prospect is warned. Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's only a small point, but it, just, it does again just uh, contradict what the uh, Leader of the Opposition claimed. I mean, in respect of the closing of the doors, that, that's not a discretion for the Speaker you know, to sort of exercise to let a few in to suit yourself, which was the snide, unpleasant, totally unsubstantiated accusation. The fact is, this is, this is a requirement Member under the law. standing orders. This doesn't require an exercise of your discretion. It's as simple as this. As, uh, as the standing orders require, the doors are closed. Full stop. Full stop. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, uh, just uh, sure, a small matter in a sense, but typical of the Leader of the Opposition, make any claim, regardless of the standing orders, regardless of the, regardless of the facts, because he's fabricating, fabricating a uh, completely baseless, uh, unjustified uh, motion uh, and arguments in support of it. Uh, Mr Speaker, in respect Member of the four Dennison. minutes and the one minute, uh, look, uh, I, I thought there was intervening debate. I'm, I'm, not, I'm now not quite sure whether there was or there wasn't, quite frankly. Uh, but I know this. We'd had, at least, uh, we'd had at least two, if not three, divisions beforehand. Uh, I do know the government won the election last time round. I do know, Mr. Speaker, we do have the numbers on this side of the House, and I do know, Mr. Speaker, I do know, Mr. Speaker, that some members of the House were off to the main committee. They are off to the main. They are off, off to their other job, if you like. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, they would have naturally enough, if they had thought that there was going to be another division, they would have been entitled to think, as I think the leader of the opposition half admitted, uh, that they would have been entitled to presume that there'd be a four-minute break. Well, there was a one-minute break, and I saw some of them standing outside. Well, quite frankly, so what? It's hardly the biggest deal I've ever heard of. So what? And, Mr Speaker, to show— Order. To show Order. The Leader of the House's time has expired. The Leader of the House's time has expired. The Member for Batman. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I second the motion. This is a crisis that arises because of a failure of leadership of the Prime Minister. It's his responsibility to point you into line. He had the opportunity yesterday not to put you in this position because he could have and should have required the Minister for Employment Services to come in here and withdraw, and he did not. 
He spoke to him after question time, but it's clear he did not require him to come in and withdraw, as he should have done. It is ultimately the responsibility of the Prime Minister to ensure that these people who misbehave in such a childish, irresponsible, rude and continually arrogant manner get pulled into line, not earmarked for promotion. And it is a failure of leadership. And it is an issue more serious the issue we raise with you, Mr Speaker, about your behaviour today and why we have a lack of confidence in it, accepting as we do that you have been put in an extremely difficult position by the irresponsibility of the Minister for Employment Services and the incompetence of the Leader of the House. Yeah, yeah. We do understand you were put in a difficult position, but this is not a minor matter. When we have a division in this House, the Constitution of Australia says how it should be determined, and it has not been applied. The Constitution at section 40 says questions in the, arising in the House shall be determined by a majority of votes other than that of the Speaker. The Speaker shall not vote unless the numbers are equal, and then he shall have a casting vote. Now, that does not say unless he feels like us calling a second division. It does not say there is. It's a bit embarrassing. Let's have another vote. So, what cover did you cut, did you develop on the best advice you had, but not good enough, that you'd go for section 208 and say there was an error or confusion? The leader of the the leader of the opposition has clearly destroyed the potential argument that there was an error. There was nothing which occurred that was not known before the vote was declared. There was nothing that was known that did not establish clearly in advance that the vote was being conducted in a manner which you considered was proper and valid, was in, a in conformity with your decisions. Had the rules been more precisely applied, the vote would have been carried because the member for Mitchell and the member of, for Macon would not have been entitled to vote because they came in after the doors should have been closed. But okay, that happened. But there's another reason why the vote was carried, that if the standing orders were being consistently applied, would have meant the vote would have been carried. One member on our side yesterday was suspended for 24 hours because the nature of her apology to you was not sufficiently grovelling. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you suspended her for 24 hours. And what she said, and in light of what you now know was the provocation that led her to do it, suggests that that was a much lesser offence than that of the Minister for Employment Services, for which you gave him the opportunity to repeat his remarks. Didn't require him to withdraw them. You said, "No, I repeat them. I reiterate them." And then I want to come in and move a motion to say the person who's aggrieved should explain themselves, not the aggressor, but the victim. It says the person against whom I made this slur should explain the basis of the slur, but I shouldn't have to withdraw it. So, if you had applied the standing orders consistently. The member for Fowler would have been in here voting and the motion would have been carried, yeah, and yeah. then we would have a very interesting situation, Mr Speaker. You wouldn't have had to worry about your casting vote. It would have been carried. Now it's clear that there is no argument to support your position, or the Leader of the House would have used it. But he didn't use one. He thought he might get away with attacking the member for Dixon again. She must have had the temerity to win a the seat they thought they were going to win. What a shocking thing! And this offence has been something for which she served a penalty of two years sustained attack from the Minister for Employment Services without justification or basis in fact. The things, the things which he said yesterday were not only scurrilous and unjustified, they were untrue. And they seem to be pretty good grounds for requiring them to be withdrawn. Now, let me refer to you, Mr Speaker, to how you defended him against statements that were made about him. Yesterday I said, no wonder David Oldfield left, you were not good enough for him. Now, it's true that I said that. I still believe it to be true, and it wasn't generic. But I can tell you this. You said 
that you wanted to apply high standards and you asked me to withdraw the remark. And I did. I said, can I seek clarification? I will withdraw that qualification, but are you seriously saying that I have to withdraw something that I said to him, the Minister for Employment Services, when he does not have to withdraw alleging that somebody took money? Now, how can that be a fair application of the standing orders? That when we say he is lower than David Oldfield, which is true, and David Oldfield left, but it is not unparliamentary and it is much less an accusation than that which he made about the member for Dixon, and I, unlike him, have the defence of truth. My statement is accurate, his is false. It was preceded by another false statement. He said she issued a press release, she did not do live media. Even the presumption on which it was based was false. And then he went on to make false, unreasonable assertions, which the standing orders say absolutely have to be withdrawn. We understand that you initially misinterpreted his remarks, and we, critical as we are of what has happened subsequently, we did not criticise you for that. In fact, we bent over backwards to give you time to require him to withdraw. We said we wanted it done yesterday, but at the end of the sitting we accepted reluctantly your advice to us that he would come in this morning. And we accepted that you, in extremely difficult circumstances because of the character, personality and consistent pattern of behaviour of this minister, the only minister who's had to be thrown out of this place for his behaviour, yeah. and it probably rescued him from something more serious if you had not. Probably rescued him from something more serious if you had not, which in hindsight we may regret, but you did the right thing then, Mr Speaker. But we bent over backwards to say, yes, let him come in this morning, even though that meant the member for Dixon was subjected to that unjustifiable insult for the whole of yesterday, and it was reported last night. And while you were saying, while you were being advised that the minister was not available to withdraw it, he was out repeating it. But he said, oh, "I'm not available. I'm leaving. I'm interstate." He was out doing television interviews, repeating the assertion. But even then, we gave you time. Did you require a withdrawal? No, you gave him licence to reiterate. Now, it is an untenable position that you were put in, but the standing orders say how you should resolve it. You should resolve it by requiring this person to withdraw. It needed to be withdrawn. Everybody in Australia knew it needed to be withdrawn, including the Minister for Employment Services. He simply chose to defy you, and you chose to accept that defiance. You should not have done so, and it has led to this series of events culminating in that motion so incompetently handled by the government, but which led to the division which you are now seek which you sought to have recounted without a skerrick of justification merely because it was extremely difficult and embarrassing. Now that, Mr Speaker, is not an acceptable standard for us, and we cannot accept it. Now, it would not be, in my view, an appropriate course, but we are being left with little other for us to come in here and say the scandal which took place in the, the scandal which took place with the Liberal Party's behaviour during the Lindsay by-election was the responsibility of the Prime Minister. Yeah, we have be. never said that, even though he took the state campaign director who was responsible at the time and promoted him into his office. We have never said that it was the Prime Minister's fault. We believe it was a rogue element in his party doing the wrong thing. But perhaps it wasn't, given that he promoted the person who was running the campaign at the time and brought him into his office. But we have never made that allegation. We have never made the allegation that the very worrying claims raised by the Chief Government Whip last night about behaviour in the Penrith City Council, which is part of a link of events directly linked to the office of the local member, the member for Lindsay, we have never said even that the member for Lindsay knew about that, even though everybody involved worked in our office. 
We've never said that she knew about it. We've never held her responsible. We've certainly never said it was the Prime Minister's fault. Now, that, those allegations would be equally valid as the allegation the Minister for Employment Services sought to make, and we have never made them, and we will not unless we are forced to. But can I make it very clear? There's a lot more if you actually want to go down this road. But we do not wish to do that, Mr Speaker, and we do not wish your behaviour to force us to do so. But let us make it clear. We will not sit idly by while this minister continually, rudely, arrogantly and untruthfully attacks one of our colleagues. It will not happen. Each time he comes in, gets outside his portfolio, attacks our colleague, abuses our colleague, and tells lies about our colleague, we will not stand idly by, we will stand and fight. And if you do not stand up for the standing orders in that process, we will be forced to say that the failure which he started has flowed on to you. And that is where we are today, the failure which this person started by his pattern of irresponsible, rude, arrogant, untruthful behaviour, the pattern of this serial offender which he started, has flowed on and you have been caught up in it. Now, that is not all your fault, but you had the capacity to resolve it and you did not. That is what has led to this motion. In our view, you should have resolved it yesterday and you did not. You should have resolved it this morning and you did not. We then led to a debate consequent upon that failure and we got into a very serious situation where a vote of no confidence in you was put and the government could not deliver a majority in support of you, Mr Speaker. They could not deliver a majority and you had to spend minutes pretending that you did not know what everybody here knew, what the result of the division was. Now, in my view, that is not consistent with Standing Order 203, which requires you to declare the vote. Sitting there pretending, I see no evil, I hear no evil, so I can speak no evil, is not an acceptable position for the Speaker. You had to accept that that vote had been counted and led to a result which was uncomfortable and difficult and caused by the incompetence of the Leader of the House, to which you should be coming accustomed. But it is not an acceptable position to fail to declare that, that, rule, that vote and then, when the vote goes in a manner which is unacceptable, to seek to have it recommitted with no provision in the standing orders which justifies that provision. And it is a very serious matter. It goes to the heart of how this parliament works. The Leader of the House said, well, it shouldn't matter because we won the election. Well, maybe we just call the parliament off and he could rule for three years or perhaps he could come in here with Rottweilers and a few people in masks. But we are not going to have the balaclavas and Rottweilers in here, Mr Speaker. We are going to stand up for the standing orders and we are going to stand up for our colleague and for the requirement that the standing orders be fairly, impartially and consistently enforced. And when that is done by you, you will have our support, and when it is not, you will have our censure. Yeah. Yeah. The question is that the Speaker be censured. The Minister for Employment Services. The Minister for Employment Services will resume his seat. The Minister for Employment Services. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me say at the outset of, this, uh, of my contribution to this debate that, in my opinion, you have been the fairest speaker that this parliament has seen, at least in the decade that I have been associated with it. And, Mr. Speaker, the fact. The Minister. The fact. I would remind members on my left that some of them have already been subject to warning. In fact, if the, spirit, if the chair is to exercise the authority expected of it, they will be required to leave the chamber. And Mr. Speaker, the minister has the call. And Mr. Speaker, the fact that members on this side of the House are from time to time 
accustomed to grumble about one or two of your rulings uh, is a sign of just how fair you are. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, in declining to exercise the casting vote to which you were undeniably entitled, you were showing yet again the high sparks of honour which have constantly motivated your occupation of the chair. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, I have to say that I deeply feel for you. Deputy I deeply of the feel for you. Uh, Member for Burke, you're having to deal at this point the in time with a feral opposition, a feral opposition which is frightened of the truth. A feral opposition that is frightened of the truth. Now, Mr Speaker, what happened today? Minister will resume his seat. The member for Patterson. I find the comment feral opposition offensive the and I ask the minister to withdraw. The member for Patterson will resume his seat. The Speaker has heard, I'm sorry to say, a number of offensive remarks this morning and I am allowing the minister to continue because I do not consider that the comment he used was unparliamentary. The minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. If I were to be consistent. Uh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I warn the member for Lawler, and if necessary, I will issue a general warning if that is the only way that the Minister for Employment Services gets an entitlement to be heard. I warn the member for Lawler. Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, what happened today in the House uh, which sparked, uh, which sparked uh, the behaviour of the opposition, which sparked the opposition's motion, uh, is that uh, I came in here and clarified a comment yesterday which had obviously been misunderstood, perhaps willfully misunderstood, uh, by members opposite. Uh, having clarified my comments yesterday, uh, I then gave I then sought to give the member for Dixon an opportunity uh, to fully explain, to fully explain uh, her role in the 1996 preference selling deal and the member most for important Sydney. point the most important point which has emerged member from for all the proceedings in this house today is that the member for Dixon has been gagged by her own side. The member for Dixon has been gagged by her own side because her own side don't trust the member for Dixon to explain exactly what happened, what happened in the course of that 1996 preference buying deal. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, what happened yesterday? I came into the House and. Minister, the member for Bendigo. Mr. Speaker, this is a, uh, a motion of no confidence in the Speaker. It has nothing to do with the member for Dixon. I'd ask you to uh, get the minister to keep his comments towards that objective. Thank the member for Bendigo. In fact, the whole exercise in which the House is engaged this morning has a great deal to do with events that occurred yesterday, and I was endeavouring to lis listen closely to the minister's remarks. Minister. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what I said yesterday was, uh, how can you, how can you keep the so and so honest? How can, how can you keep the so-and-sos honest when you're taking their money? That was what I said yesterday. Now, it was, it was, a, reference, it was a reference to the fact uh, that the Democrat slogan in 1996 was keep the so-and-sos honest. At that time, the member for Dixon was the leader of the Democrat Party. There was, there was a deal. There was a deal. Uh, between the Australian Democrats and the Australian Labor Party, we know that there was a deal. We know that there was a deal because the member for Lilly has told us in this house. The member for Lilly has Minister, told us. Through Minister will resume his seat. Chief Opposition Whip. And no doubt, Mr. Speaker, that lack of confidence motion in you has been caused by this minister, but he cannot canvass that. What he should actually be doing is talking about why we shouldn't censor you rather than why we should be the censoring him. Chief Opposition Whip will resume his seat for reasons that should be obvious to everyone in the House, with more intent, I suspect, than anyone else in the chamber. I am listening closely to what the minister has to say. He has not at this stage said anything that is unparliamentary, and for that reason I've allowed him to continue. I, more than anyone else in this chamber, have a vested interest in the minister's comments. The minister. 
Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member for Dixon was the leader of the Democrats at the time. There was a deal, the member for Lilly told us. There was assistance provided uh, because the leader of the opposition has told us that there was assistance provided. Minister. And it's Minister. Chief Opposition Whip. Mr Speaker, my point of order is that this is a motion of no, lack of confidence in you. And what the, the government should be doing is saying why the, why the House opposition should whip. have confidence in you. He obviously doesn't. The chief He's not willing to say so. Resume his seat. The Chief Opposition Whip is aware that the Minister has said nothing that is unparliamentary, and I am listening closely to what he has to say, and I trust he is merely building his case sequentially. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, and it's perfectly reasonable for members on this side of the House to want the member for Dixon to come in and explain exactly what were the terms of that national deal. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, this motion is a censure motion of you. It is a censure motion of you. But clearly, from everything that was said, clearly from everything that was said, the minister will resume his seat. Member for Denison on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, your ruling that uh, the minister has said nothing unparliamentary. I will determine whether or not the member for Denison is heard may be strictly and literally accurate, but nor has he said anything relevant to the motion before the you. And it's your Denison responsibility, particularly— seat. I'm making a submission, the Mr. Member for Denison will resume his seat. The member for Denison had made his point of order. It was a point of order on relevance, and I, and I indicated that the minister was being relevant. The mem member for Denison is obliged to resume his seat. Mem Minister. Mr Speaker, in the course of this debate, there have been numerous accusations by members opposite towards, Member for uh, Prospect. towards uh, me and other members on this side of the House that we are getting personal. Well, any fair-minded observer of this House who is, listening, who is listening to the accusations that are being hurled from members opposite, who is listening to the filth and drivel that habitually comes from members opposite, would know that there is no getting personal on this side of the Minister parliament. Minister will resume his seat. Member for Burke. Mr Speaker, already once member this morning the government will resume his seat and another member is addressing the chair. Mr Speaker, already once this morning the government has failed to provide the numbers to support you, and now in this motion they are not even prepared to talk to the issue of defending the you. It the is member not for relevant. will resume his seat. By any measure, by any measure, the comments made by the minister refer to an unfortunate incident yesterday which has provoked the me chief opposition whip is warned. By any measure, the minister is referring to an unfortunate set of events yesterday which has culminated in the actions this morning. I could hardly, therefore, rule him out of order. The member for Franklin. Speaker, I would ask you to ask the honourable uh, member, the minister, to withdraw that comment of filth and dribble coming from this side. I find it very offensive. I am the first to agree with the member for Franklin that it was an undesirable comment, and in fact, under my normal requirements, would, would re I would require him to at least refrain from that sort of statement. However, I have sat here in the chair this morning and for a matter of now two and a half hours heard a number of most undesirable remarks levelled at the minister. Minister. Chief Opposition Whip. Mr Speaker, the member, the member has asked for a withdrawal. Are you going to ask the minister to withdraw or not? I have indicated that I am not requiring the minister to withdraw, because if I were to be consistent because if I were to be consistent in my application of the principles, we would have spent a great deal of time making withdrawals this morning, and I'm simply seeking to facilitate the debate. Member for Chifley. Speaker, I rise understanding orders 75 and 76, and that is that the minister should not be able to impugn the reputation or make offensive remarks that the honourable uh, member of Dixon found offensive yesterday, and under the guise of this motion, 
uh, reiterate them again today. And I ask you to uh, ask him to withdraw it and enforce those standing orders. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, the, if the minister were to say anything that uh, the member for Dixon found, if the minister were to say anything couched in yesterday's remarks that reinforced the slur he had made on the member for Dixon's reputation, I would be the first to require him. The, the statement I have just made, as the leader of the opposition, as the deputy leader of the opposition is aware, I imagine because he will have conferred with the manager of opposition business and the Leader of the Opposition is consistent with my entire remark to all people who were in my office yesterday. Minister. Uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. goes to this debate. If, in fact, you have now admitted what he said yesterday was a slur, why don't you require him to withdraw it as the standing orders require? The As the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is well aware, if in fact the Chair to require all slurs made in this place withdrawn, sadly, sadly we would spend little time in debate. I, I have dealt as fairly as I can with this issue, and I would want to use the remaining time to facilitate the Minister for obvious reasons. The Minister. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. The further point of order, Mr Speaker, is that withdrawal can come about through two courses. One, your requirement, and two, as a result of a request from the minister defamed, ask, the member defamed asking, which is exactly what the member for Dixon did yesterday. And on every other occasion, when a member has asked statements slurring them to be withdrawn, you have required it of them. You have required it of us on every occasion. You were given the opportunity to reflect on this over 24 hours. Clearly, that reflection has come to a conclusion. It was a slur. Uh, she asked it to be withdrawn, and it should be on her request. Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, members opposite, one of the marvellous marks of your speakership is that members opposite have not been able to bully you the way the Leader of the Opposition staff try to bully front benches opposite. The Leader of the Opposition staff have got more ticket than the Leader of the Opposition. That's the problem. They've got, the staff have got more ticket than the Leader of the Opposition. Now, Mr. Speaker, now, Mr. Minister. Speaker, The member for Denison. That is an absolutely disgraceful behaviour. And he still hasn't said anything nice about you. Minister. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, 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 one, the one basic point that has emerged from all the proceedings this morning is that members opposite are in fear of their political lives. They are absolutely terrified that they will be consumed by the fire that is burning the Beattie government in Queensland. And Mr Speaker, you are a marvellous speaker and you fully deserve the confidence of this House. The question is that the motion of uh, the motion of no confidence in the speaker. The question is motion of no confidence in the speaker. I recognise the member for Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Explain. The <laughs> member for Fisher is warned. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to talk, Mr. Mr. Oh, yeah, Speaker. And so is the member for Swan. 
Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to speak, although I do not consider myself accountable to the Minister for Employment Services, the member for Fisher or anybody else sitting on this side of the yeah, chamber. Yeah. In fact, Mr Speaker, I abhor the hypocrisy and dishonesty of the member, Minister for Employment Services and for the way he calls himself a practising Christian. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I make this point because you told me yesterday that the minister could not be asked to withdraw because he was in transit. In fact, he went straight from this house, scuttled out of this house, knowing that he had said something specific and not generic and repeated accusations to a doorstop, of which I, I have uh, um, a transcript. And amongst other things, he said, where did the money go? Did someone pocket the money? Certainly Wayne Swan has admitted that the money was paid over. And this is where the connection takes place, Mr Speaker. He said, what happened to it? Cheryl Kerner was the leader of the Democrats at the time. Make that connection, Mr Speaker. But the point, Mr. Speaker, the reason, the reason that I mention the reason that I mention my abhorrence of his hypocrisy is he went from that doorstop to Paul Lynham's funeral service. The com car drivers told me that he arrived at 4:30. Obviously, he thought it was more important to get out there and continue to defame me than than to uh, to go to the funeral service. But I want to point out. That I think I have a perfectly valid right to point to the hypocrisy of a man who, who willingly joins in these words. This is the man who considers himself a, a specialist on Catholic doctrine. He goes into Paul Lynham's funeral and joins in the hymn. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil Member for side. Dixon. It's perfectly Member relevant. Perfectly relevant, Member Mr. Speaker. For Dixon will resume her seat. I, Member for Dixon has the call. I think I could reasonably be to have presumed that there was someone seeking. <laughs> the member for Aston, I believe, was on his feet. She's missing her space. I am not seeking from the member for Aston a point of order. I am seeking an assurance that he was, in fact, on his feet when I interrupted the member for Dixon. Mr Speaker, I was merely going to raise a point of order on the question of relevance. She's, the, speaker, the member for Dixon was not addressing the question that's before the House. The, the member for Aston will resume his seat. Mem I merely want to indicate to the member for Dixon that my intervention was as the result of a genuine belief, in fact an observation that there was someone on their feet. Speaker, we all remember what uh, the, min the Minister for Employment Services said about Greg Wilton's funeral. We all remember what he said in here, and we all remember what he did less than two days after. And I think that the point the leader of the opposition, the point that the leader of the opposition and the manager of opposition business has made about this minister being a serial offender, is a point well made. And it is where this issue began. And the comments that this minister made, and which I asked to be withdrawn, and which you failed to act on. And, he now admits and a that, slur. yes, and which you now admit has, was a slur on my name. And Mr. Speaker, I regret, I regret that we have to have this debate today. But it was in your hands yesterday. You allowed a minister to say what he said with intent, with intent to smear. I'm not accountable to him. But I am very happy to talk about the circumstances of the preference negotiations. I have nothing. <laughs> Minister, <laughs> Minister for Aged Care. Do you want us to start there? Member for Dixon has a call. That proves our case, though. Mr. Speaker, the minister's remarks about my role as leader of the Democrat obviously have nothing to do with his portfolio, but that's never stopped him before. I was the leader of the Democrats. I am grateful for the opportunity that afforded me to contribute to public debate in this country. And I resigned—unlike others, I resigned Member from Parliament. Member for Eden Monero. 
I resigned from Parliament before recontesting a seat for the Australian yeah, Labor Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And despite your best efforts to defeat me, as a member, as the leader of the Democrats, I was travelling around the nation quite extensively, but I did take part in some telephone conference hookups. I am aware that at the national executive a decision was made to direct preferences to like-minded candidates first and then no you are wrong and then in a split ticket to both the liberal party and the labor party that is in the senate after that mr speaker conversations were held with members of the preference committees of both the Liberal Party in every state and the Labor Party in every state. The Liberal Party is not excluded from these conversations. And as a result of these conversations, I find myself in the ironic position of, of having been part of a decision which recommended preferences against the Leader of the Opposition, the then member for Brand. So it's not simply about it's not about and then Mr Speaker the Democrats announced that that preferences were Minister. that preferences were directed to X number of Member for Page. X number of Liberal seats and a X number of Liberal seats and a similar number of Labor seats. It's as simple as that. Mr Speaker I was not involved in the campaign for Lilly or in the state discussions about those allocations. I know nothing about any donations, about any donations, and I join Gary Gray, Robert Ray and Meg Lees, who speak with authority on this matter. I do know that Senator Bob Woods did approach Senator Vicky Bourne with all sorts of offers. I do know that. But I do accept. Well, I mean, I, I think the minister is being deliberately misleading in attempting to single me out as a member of a party. I was the leader. But to use his, to, to use his argument, John Howard should then be responsible for the actions of the former Senator Bob Woods in uh, negotiating preferences and how to vote card printing with the, with the Shooters Party candidate in the by-election in Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I categorically reject, Mr Speaker, any association with this decision or any money which may have changed hands. And that is why I was extremely disappointed in you yesterday when you failed to uh, require the minister to withdraw that statement. It was not a generic statement. It was a specific statement. It was said with intent to smear, as we know, has been the actions of this minister ever since the day I joined the Labor Party and he began peddling his poison about me to the press, some evidence of which I have, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member the minister does not have the call. And neither does the member for Dixon. But the clock is ticking because the minister cannot be heard. As he now can be heard, he has them call. On the point of order, Mr Speaker, she said I poisoned people against her and I was doing this consistently, and she said she had evidence. The, Produce the, the evidence. Minister will resume Please. his seat. Minister will resume his seat. That is no valid point of order. The, minister, the member for Dixon. Was he seeking a withdrawal? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, anybody listening and watching this debate would be asking why are we carrying on like this? Well, 
I'll tell you why, Mr Speaker. Because it's about the style of John Howard's government and the abuse of this parliament in lying and defaming people almost on a daily basis. And we on this side have had enough of it. And we've particularly had enough of it from this Minister for Employment Services. Some old cynics would say, "'Twas ever thus." Mr Speaker, there's a very big difference between the argy-bargy of daily politics and the use of this chamber to daily, daily smear, smear and slur against the character and reputation of members on this side. It is your duty to uphold the rights of people on this side as much as you do of, this, of your government by virtue of the fact that they are ministers. And I take great exception to people leering and jeering from the other side, from a man who vilifies the unemployed, calls them job snobs and said you can't trust politicians. I take exception to a person leering and jeering who presides over a crisis in aged care. I take exception to a minister involved in telecard rorting. I take exception to the many ministers who have failed the Prime Minister's own code of conduct and continue to occupy the front benches on the government side. That's what it's all about. That's what it's about. That's why we are passionate. That's why we are passionate about it. Mr Speaker, unfortunately, unfortunately, Mr Speaker. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, your failure to defend my rights to have that slur against me withdrawn yesterday when I asked for it, when the minister has misled you about his inability to come in here yesterday and do it by telling you that he was in transit, it causes us to reflect on the way you have exercised your authority in that chair. I did come to see you. you I, I'd be very happy to put that on the public record, and I am still dissatisfied with the result of the outcome. Because, Mr. Speaker, this is the result of where it's been repeated all around this country. Because you didn't give me the protection that I asked of you, and I object to that too, Mr. Speaker. And I told you so. So, Mr. Speaker, in conclusion. We, we do need. We do need. <laughs> Member for Dixon has the call. Mr. Speaker, we do need to look at the way you have conducted yourself in this particular aspect of the debate. We do need new fare to both sides, standing orders which are relevant and where truth matters. Where truth and relevance matters. That's why our passions are inflamed. That's why I talk about Paul Lyman's funeral. That's why I talk about the man or nation that chooses the darkness or the light. The Minister for Employment Services always chooses the darkness. The question is that the member for Denison. The, man, the deputy leader of the opposition, the deputy leader of the opposition, and the minister. Deputy Leader of the Opposition and the Minister for Arts and Centenary of Federation have just illustrated the very remarks between each other that each other would want withdrawn and the difficulty the Chair has had intervening this morning. The question is that the House has no confidence in the Speaker. The Minister for Arts and Centenary of Federation. Uh, the first thing to say at the outset of this no, uh, no confidence motion is that Nobody believes you are anything other than nonpartisan, able, fair, balanced and decent in your behaviour in the, in the chair and outside it. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition this, me this no is one of those occasions where uh, political emotions on both sides run high, and the simple fact is 
that it's a grave mistake to attempt to shift the blame to the umpire. There's something of the John Kerr syndrome at work here, uh, in that the Labor Party will dump onto the person who refers it to the proper voting procedures or processes the ultimate decision. So you are the subject of a no-motion confidence simply because, sim simply because you put the vote to the parliament. Where is the gravity of, of that error of judgment as alleged by the opposition? You simply left it to the parliamentarians to resolve the issue. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it is odious of the opposition to bring this matter uh, before you in, by way of a no-motion confidence. Mr. Defi Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, the interesting thing is that the Labor Party, having run two years of shock tactics in the House, of, of organised disruption, of, of calculated noise and interference, interjections, points of orders, so that they've overturned decades of established reasonable behaviour and restraint by parties on both sides of the House, they now try to take the moral high ground. And it simply doesn't work. And it simply doesn't especially work to involve you in it. You have been a reformist Speaker of the Parliament. You have attempted, in the face of daily provocation, at times from our side, and you have dealt with people on our side. I have been subject of your warnings. Members on our side have been evicted from the House. We respect you for it. But the opposition does not, because they constantly test the boundaries of your authority. And when, Mr. Deputy, when, Mr. Speaker, you refer the final arbitration of this prolonged and at times complicated exchange this morning, they cry foul. They cry foul because the Parliament resolved the issue as it ought properly. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, let's, let's look at this matter sequentially. It started yesterday when there was a dispute about the interpretation of the words used by the Minister for Employment Services. Now, Mr Speaker, the, the fundamental issue is that you, if I understand you correctly, came to the conclusion that the Minister was referring to the Democrats generically or as a party. And uh, as you explained yesterday, you had a different interpretation at, from that put on the minister's words by the member for Dixon and by the leader of the opposition and the opposition at large. The dispute then arose about um, how to interpret those words and to what extent you would require withdrawal, but the minister was not in the House. You then, with typical fairness, balance and goodwill, uh, for which you are rightly known, undertook to examine the record. Which brings us to today. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the Minister was spoken to. The Minister gave an explanation and points of order in rapid fashion followed. Uh, you then, to try to resolve the matter, sought confirmation that the Minister had not meant to reflect personally on the member for Dixon and that he withdrew any reflection on the Minister. And the Minister did so. The minister, as I correctly understood him to say, was that he was referring to the Democrats. Now, this was not good enough for the opposition, no, because they wanted to stage manage an attack on the Minister for Employment Services and, in doing so, were prepared to sacrifice the member for, for Dixon. They, they, they care not about her own personal position because it was clarified this morning, but instead they were prepared to trample on her standing, confuse the issue and muddy the waters, all for the purposes of attacking the Minister for Employment Services. And you also were to be treated in the same fashion as the member for Dixon, cannon fodder for their political opportunism and their political objectives, because it should have been good enough for the opposition, the minister's explanation and your acquiescing of it this morning. But of course, it was never going to be good enough because they had a political agenda that they were going to see whatever, whatever the cost, whatever the cost to the dignity of the parliament. Yours has not been infringed or compromised in any way. I can't say the same about the parliament, 
but the Speaker rose above it. You properly and faithfully adhered to standing orders. You showed extraordinarily, extraordinary cool and calmness and patience uh, under constant provocation for more than one hour. There were dozens of interventions directed your way by way of points of order, questions and insults. Make no mistake, Mr Speaker, nor have you, but with good grace you have, you have decided to ignore or overlook the personal barbs thrown your way. So, Mr Speaker, if anyone is to emerge from uh, this heated debate and conflict this morning, it is you. Mr Speaker, to continue the, the, um, the events of today, um, you f properly fulfilled your duty as a speaker, which is to determine whether words need to be withdrawn. You did so. You took the minister's word, as you do for all members. You were not affording the Minister for Employment Services any special treatment nor favouritism. You, 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 you dealt with him in the same way you do all other members, but you had secured his withdrawal anyway. It, this, is, this will still not be acknowledged by the opposition that the Speaker obtained the, the uh, Minister's withdrawal and clarification in any event, so that all the nonsense and attack that has followed, culminating in, in this phony no-confidence motion, were uh, uh, totally unnecessary. Now, in the divisions that followed, a vote was tied. You had the right to, 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 um, to rely on a casting vote, on, on the dissent against yourself, again showing the highest personal and professional standards you did not give a vote in your own cause. It would have been the easiest thing for you to simply vote to strike down the malicious and contrived uh, motion of dissent by the, uh, moved by the opposition. You, you did not do so. Instead, instead, you relied on your own judgment in that you believed your ruling was correct. And indeed, it was a correct ruling originally. Now, speakers must make such decisions, and it's not for oppositions or governments to complain because the decision, if fairly and properly reached by the Speaker, goes against them. And that's what it is. The, the Labor Party will never accept the umpire's decision. Never will. So the simple fact is, Mr Speaker, you are now the target of the opposition because they seek to attack the Minister for Employment Services and, and the government at large. And never forget, all of, this, all of this could have been curtailed if the opposition had agreed to the minister's suspension of standing orders to allow the member for Dixon to state her case. It's as simple as that. And this is a debating forum. They, they sought to, they did not want to let her. I'm sure the member for Dixon, not that I dare speak for her, but most members of this parliament would have welcomed the opportunity. She, she, she has been boiling with frustration, understandably, and wanted her opportunity, the dispatch box, to put her case and to set the record straight as she sees it. Yet she was prevented from doing so from 9.30 this morning until midday. Two and a half hours, the member for Dixon had to cool her heels when she, when because of the Labor Party. They ruthlessly exploited the member for Dixon's position so they could attack the Minister for Employment Services. Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker in the end, you had to resolve this matter after what um, you may well have considered a misjudgment or error in not allowing a four-minute bell, uh, division bells to ring by, allow, by calling for a, a fresh division. Now, that's, that's simply that's simply common sense. Where, where there was, if there were, with respect, Mr Speaker, a mistake made in the length of the division bells, which excluded a large number of members from participating, as is their rightful responsibility, in the division, you call for another division. Why, why Mr Deputy Speaker, would the Labor Party object to a democratic vote in the House of Representatives? Mr Deputy Speaker, your action your action was courageous. 
the, the easy thing for you to have done was, would have been to vote with the noes against the motion of dissent against your ruling. And the simple fact is you, uphold, you upheld the best traditions of that chair in taking the decision you did, which was to put it back to the members of this House. And there's no escaping our responsibility to decide these matters. As the Speaker has said on a number of occasions and his predecessors, the, the conduct and behaviour of this House is in the hands of the members itself. So it was a brave decision, Mr Speaker, which, which to any fair or balanced member of the House has only enhanced your standing as, chair, as, as Speaker of the Parliament. Mr Speaker, who, who really in this chamber would believes in this no confidence motion? Who really believes in it? The opposition don't believe in it. We have seen a number of your predecessors who, who behaved in an undisguised partisan way, who trampled on individual rights, and, and there are very few in recent memory, Mr Speaker, who, has, who have brought the same sense of fair play and nonpartisanship to the chair in the way you have. But I hasten to say I don't, I don't name anyone in particular. But we all know that not all speakers have thrown aside their political bias, and the too, and the too many, and there have, there are reputed to have been speakers in the past with close relationship to the leaders of their parties, uh, to the point where some might have accused them of doing their party's bidding. But I don't want to be deflected, Mr. Speaker, from the issue at hand, which is a motion of no confidence in you. So the simple fact Chief is, Mr. Opposition Mr. Whip. So the, the Chief the, Opposition <laughs> Whip is already under award. Every time a minister, and often with backbenchers, rises to his or her, her feet, there are family insults coming from that side. There are the most, there are the most personalised attacks every day, and we. We don't complain. We accept that it's part of the culture and part of the moral corruption of the Labor Party. And then, and then they think they can, in an institutional sense, impose their warped values on the parliament. And when we won't tolerate that. It's one thing for you to engage in your personalised in um, fantasies, it's another thing to tear down the parliament's traditions by way of a com completely unjustified, completely unnecessary motion of no confidence in the speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, you have acted in the rightful way all through this. Your track record in your two years in the chair has been one that you should be not personally proud of, not that you seek any acclaim or any congratulations because you have brought a degree of balance and fairness to the conduct of this House that most, if not all, of your predecessors would envy. And it is a sad occasion that the Labor Party, for the basis of political purposes, seeks to draw you into what is a parliamentary debate, fierce as it may be. That is unjustified, it is uncalled for and has potential ramifications for the parliament as a whole whoever may occupy the government benches or the Speaker's chair. Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, the government and in, the, in their hearts, if not their consciences, the entire opposition reject this motion of no confidence. Member for Batman will resume his seat. The Minister of Forest and Conservation. Speaker, during the address just concluded, the Chief Government Whip made substantial reflections on the chair and I ask he withdraw. He was not a participant in the debate. Mr. The Speaker, I may happily withdraw any imputation that I made against the chair or any other member in this House. Okay. And it's I a pity the, the Minister government government doesn't would... either. Why did you do it? Member for Batman. Mr. Speaker, the, the government obviously thinks so much of you and your position. They have had you defended today by two rorters and a spiv. You demand more respect than that, Mr. Speaker. Member for Batman. Where is the Prime Minister, the Mr. Speaker? Batman. Why isn't he here defending the, the you, member, pulling that bully boy the, into line? The Member for Batman knows that as much tolerance as I have exercised in the chair, the remarks he made would not be acceptable by any speaker at any time. Uh, Mr. Speaker. No, the Member for Batman has the call. Mr. Speaker. 
The member for Batman has the call. Out of absolute respect for you and your position, I unconditionally withdraw those remarks. I only wish others the applied for the same respect as to you. Yeah, yeah. That's right. The question is that the House has no confidence in the Speaker. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. Is a division required? Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that the House has no confidence in the Speaker. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Hinkler. Tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong. Tell us for the noes.
Clellan and Lee, Horn and Snowden, Kerr and the two Fergusons, Jacko and Price, and Price, Lawrence and Evans. Side Bottom and Gillard, Burn and McFarlane, Cliverset and Moose, Yorick and Eric Ellis, Tribuno and Rudd, Zara and Corcoran, Cox and Danby. Thompson and Mellon, <coughs> Roxon and Wilkie, Burke and Livermore, Moore and Adams, Gibbons and Alvin Emerson, Latham and Emerson, Griffin and Paul, Jenkins and Morris, Edward. The result of the division is ayes 60, no 78. The question is therefore negative. Would members please quickly and quietly resume their seats? Clark has the call.
Member for Prospect. I'm sorry to do that to you, Mr Speaker, but I seek the call because I didn't wish to do it during the debate that has just occurred. But understanding Order 78, during intervention at 9.55 this morning, when I made a remark that the Leader of the House was directing the Speaker, the member for Sturt said, and I quote, Janice, you have been hanging around with the League of Rights for too long. I completely want that withdrawn. I do not like my name even mentioned with that fascist group, and I the think it for, should be withdrawn member in the House. Has indicated where she was misrepresented. I ask the I think it is entirely reasonable for the member for Prospect to be indignant about that association. I ask the member for Sturt to withdraw it. Mr. Speaker, the uh, comment you have been hanging around with the League of Rights too long was designed to make a commentary on her Sturt, paranoia, member, her member paranoia for Sturt about the use of the microphones. Member for Sturt will but I withdraw, withdraw in that to you, statement Mr. and resume his seat. No member for Sturt will withdraw without qualification. Member for Sturt, withdraw the statement, Mr. Speaker. Member for Sturt. Member for Lilly. Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the member for Lilly claim to have been misrepresented? Yes, I do, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, a report in today's Courier Mail suggests that when I was the Queensland ALP campaign director for the 1989 Merthyr by-election campaign, I agreed to pay for a printer's cost of the how to vote cards of an independent candidate to secure a preference deal which favoured the ALP candidate in that election. Mr Speaker, I deny absolutely that I offered any form of inducement in return for preferences. The facts as I recall, Mr Speaker, are these. I recall a meeting with the independent gay law reform candidate Ms Wilde to discuss the then State Labor opposition's attitude to gay law reform. In 1989, there was no prospect of a gay law Lilly reform candidate directing preferences to the then Conservatives. Given this context, Mr Speaker, our discussion centred on the prospect of gay law reform under a future Labor government. So I offered no inducement of any sort to anyone at the meeting to direct preferences to the ALP. Mr Speaker, I note today's QMR report su suggests Mr Summerfield, Ms Wilde's campaign manager, believed that given Labor's attitude to gay law reform, there was little question about Ms Wilde's preferences being directed to Labor. Mr Speaker, I've asked the Queensland branch of the Australian Labor Party to conduct an urgent search of its record of that by-election campaign to ascertain whether or not any printers' costs were paid. I state for the record that I've acted with complete proprietary in this matter. I believe that the timing of this unsubstantiated Member allegation over ten years after the by-election took place and other allegations from a range of political Lilly sources in recent days Mr. Speaker, are malicious and can Member only be Lilly designed to spare my name. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The clerk. Government business, notice number one, pig industry bill. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. With the greatest of pleasure, I present the Pig Industry Bill 2000. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act relating to the pig industry. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Mr Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. The Pig Industry Bill 2000 provides for the Australian Pork Corporation and the Pig Research and Development Corporation to be wound up and for an industry-owned company to undertake the industry marketing and promotion and R&D functions. In addition, the industry company will be responsible for the strategic planning and industry policy development functions, previously the responsibility of the Pork Council of Australia, the industry's grower representative body. These new arrangements will allow a more coordinated and commercial approach to the development of industry policy and delivery of services. Importantly, it will ensure for the first time that industry levy payers have direct influence and involvement in their industry body, ensuring their levies are applied to best effect. The progressive opening of the domestic market to pork imports in recent years has put pressure on the industry to become more internationally competitive and to develop niche export markets. The industry now sees that, it, that if it is to succeed in the face of stiff international competition, its industry structure must be as competitive as its producers to enable it to meet evolving market challenges. The restructuring proposal is an industry initiative and comes to the government following extensive consultation with an unprecedented high level of industry support. The industry has already established and incorporated its new industry services company, a company limited by guarantee and operating under the corporation's law. The company is known as Australian Pork Limited. This Pork Industry Bill 2000 enables the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries to declare Australian Pork Limited as the industry services body. 
The minister may enter into a contract with the industry services body detailing the arrangements under which it will manage and administer industry levies collected by the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth will continue to match R&D funds provided by the pork industry up to 0.5 per cent of the gross value of production as applies to other rural industries. In 1999-2000, the government's matching contribution for pork industry R&D was $3.6 million. The integration of the policy development and strategic planning functions with the marketing and R&D services will provide the opportunity for full exploitation of synergies between these activities. Under the arrangements, all levy payers will be eligible to become registered members of APL and therefore will be able to have a direct input into the management and application of their statutory levies. Registered levy payers will be able to exert their influence through voting rights, appointment of board members and input to the company's policy development and planning activities. The bill provides for the transfer of assets and liabilities of the two statutory corporations to the industry-owned company. The detail of these arrangements will be included in the contract which will impose certain obligations and accountability requirements on the industry services body. In addition, details of the new industry services body's accountability arrangements to its members and to the Commonwealth will be outlined in its company constitution. While the model allows the industry to have a greater say in the management of, of its affairs, there will also be increased responsibilities. The distancing of government's direct involvement means the industry accepts responsibility for its activities and appreciates there is no automatic resource to government assistance when the going gets tough. In short, more than ever before, the industry will be responsible for planning its own future, strategically seeking priority outcomes and management of risk. The package contains a number of accountability arrangements which will be detailed in the comp company constitution and the contract with the Commonwealth. These are comprehensive planning and reporting requirements with copies of plans and reports made available to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, regular performance reviews to assess the company's efficiency and effectiveness in meeting planned priorities, for the chair of the industry company to meet with the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry or his nominated delegate on a regular basis to discuss industry issues and government priorities for R&D, and a requirement for a mix of producer and specialist skills-based directors on the board of the company, including a specialist in corporate governance. If the company changes its constitution in a way considered unacceptable by government, if it becomes insolvent or fails to comply with the legislation or contract, the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry has the ability to temporarily suspend or terminate the payment of statutory levies to the company or rescind his declaration of APL being the industry services body. The net assets to be transferred to APL are valued at around $8 million and primarily comprise reserves of statutory levies held by the statutory authorities on behalf of levy payers for marketing and R&D programs. In addition, the bill provides for recognition of accrued entitlements of employees of the statutory authorities who are transferring to the industry services body. These entitlements relate to annual and long service leave, maternity leave, sick leave, continuity of service and other employment conditions. Mr Deputy Speaker, there are a number of strengths associated with this new industry structure. These are to provide an appropriate vehicle to promote a through-chain demand-driven commercial focus for the provision of industry services, which will facilitate the building of strong linkages from producer to consumer. Uh, it will improve the industry's competitive against imports. It will underpin the industry's achievements to date and in the latter stages of implementation of the Commonwealth's $24 million industry restructuring strategy and specifically to promote international competitiveness and export development. It will remove duplication and ambiguity about responsibilities between the three industry organisations which cause confusion for industry, government and trading partners. It will enable the industry organisation to be more flexible and responsible to the changing operating environment and priorities of members. And it will establish a single, unified, professional and balanced board with the opportunity and capability to strategically develop and implement industry service arrangements. The bill paves the way forward for the pork industry to look to the future with a more commercially driven, 
internationally focused and flexible approach. It will now have the capability to respond quickly, effectively and efficiently to emerging industry challenges. Ultimately, this will mean consumers' high expectations of quality Australian pork being consistently satisfied. I commend the industry on how it's responded to recent challenges. Everyone knows that there have been very difficult times for the pork industry over recent years. The turnaround in the industry has been quite spectacular, and I hope that that prosperity can continue into the future. I believe that the industry leadership has shown uh, re remarkable courage and determination to set the industry's path for the future in a manner which, can, which gives the, the industry the opportunity to achieve its, its potential. In particular, can I acknowledge the contribution of Ron Pollard, uh, the president of the industry organisation, who has driven uh, this legislation to reach this stage, has secured the, the overwhelming, virtually the unanimous support of the industry for this package of legislation. Uh, I pay tribute to the, the work of the industry in reaching a stage where it is now uh, putting in place for the future a modern and progressive structure to underpin its future. The industry's unity in bringing this proposal to government is an example of a maturing industry looking to secure its future in the global market. It provides me with a great pleasure to be working with the pork industry in implementing these arrangements, and I'm particularly impressed with the level of consultation both throughout the industry and with all stakeholders and with the government. This bill and the framework that hangs from it creates a turning point for the management of industry affairs and for the potential for industry growth and development. It will establish a solid foundation for the industry to continue to challenge and secure global opportunities in the pork market. Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, I commend the legislation to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Reid. Uh, Mr Deputy Acting Speaker, I uh, move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made an order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government Business Notice Number 2, Communications and the Arts Legislation Amendment Bill. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Information Technology and the Arts, I present the Communications and Arts Legislation Amendment Bill 2000. Mark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend legislation relating to communications and the arts and for related purposes. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I uh, move that this bill be now read a second time. The Communications and the Arts Legislation Amendment Bill 2000 will make a series of minor amendments to four pieces of legislation which relate to aspects of the communications and the arts portfolio. The bill makes amendments to the Public Lending Right Act of 1985 that provides the legislative framework for the Public Lending Right Scheme. The Public Lending Right Scheme is a cultural program that makes payments to eligible Australian creators and publishers in recognition that income is lost from the free multiple use of their books in public lending libraries. The Public Lending Rights Scheme also has a broader cultural objective whereby the existence of the scheme encourages the creation of books by Australians and the publication of books in Australia. A recent evaluation of the Public Lending Rights Scheme found the scheme to be efficient and effective However, it recommended strengthening the objectives of the scheme and streamlining and updating some operational procedures of the program. This bill puts, puts, this bill puts these recommendations into effect by incorporating a statement of objectives into the Public Lending Right Act of 1985 and making small minor changes to the processes for making final payments following the death of a creator. It also clarifies that a category of prescribed persons defined in the Act is intended to apply to those who make an intellectual contribution to the creation of a book. The amendments to the Telecommunications Act of 1997 in this, book, in this bill will provide immunity to carriers and carriage service providers in situations where they comply with a senior police officer's request 
to suspend the supply of a carriage service in an emergency situation or where they are complying with the designated disaster plan. It is important that carriers and carriage service providers are not subject to litigation as a direct result of compliance in either situation. There is some concern that the absence of immunity might result in them choosing not to cooperate with law enforcement agencies in emergency situations. This bill, through amendments to the Trade Practices Act of 1974, will increase the effectiveness and efficiency of the Australian Competition Consumer Commission, the ACCC, both in tackling cases of anti-competitive behaviour by telecommunications companies and in resolving access disputes through the arbitration process. The amendments to the Trade Practices Act of 1974 enable the ACCC to more immediately provide advice to telecommunications companies on remedial action they could take to cease any anti-competitive behaviour. The bill also introduces measures to allow the nominated member to exercise the procedural powers in an access arbitration rather than the whole commission. Procedural powers do not include the ability to make, vary or revoke determinations or give draft determinations. It thereby improves the efficiency of the arbitration process. The Deputy Speaker, these, uh, there are a number of other minor consequential amendments included in the bill which update the previous the uh, sorry, which update various sections which refer to the Telecommunications Act of 1997 to reference to the Telecommunications Consumer Protection and Service Standards Act of 1999. The bill also updates a reference to the Australian company number to the new Australian business number in the Telecommunications Consumer Protection and Services Standards Act of 1999. And I present a copy of the explanatory memorandum. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Batman. Mr Speaker, I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Government Business Notice No. 3, Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment, Application of Criminal Code Bill. The Honourable Minister. I present the Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Application of Criminal Code Bill 2000. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act relating to the application of the Criminal Code to certain offences and for related purposes. The Honourable the Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I um, move that this bill be now read a second time. This bill advances the government's program to harmonise offence creating and related provisions in Commonwealth legislation with the Criminal Code. The Criminal Code will codify the most serious offences against Commonwealth law and establish a cohesive set of general principles of criminal, excuse me, criminal responsibility. The purpose of this bill is to apply the Criminal Code to all offence creating and related provisions in acts falling within the Veterans Affairs portfolio and to make all necessary amendments to these provisions to ensure compliance and consistency with the Criminal Code's general principles. While the majority of offences and legislation in the Veterans Affairs portfolio will operate as they always have, without amendment, there are some that will require adjustment. Amongst the most significant amendments is the express application of strict liability or absolute liability to some offence-creating provisions. Under the Criminal Code, an offence must specifically identify strict liability or absolute liability as the case may be, or the prosecution will be required to prove fault in relation to each element of the offence. This is necessary to ensure that the strict or absolute liability nature of some provisions is not lost in the transition to the application of the Criminal Code's general principles. If relevant offences are not adjusted in this manner, many will become more difficult for the prosecution to prove and therefore reduce the protection which was originally intended by the Parliament to be provided by the offence. The bill will similarly improve the efficiency and fair prosecution of offences by clarifying the physical elements of offences and amending inappropriate fault elements. 
This harmonisation of offence creating and related offences in Veterans Affairs legislation with the Criminal Code is an important step in the government's program of legislative reform that will achieve greater consistency and cohesion in Commonwealth criminal law. And I present a copy uh, of the explanatory memorandum to the House. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Batman. Yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Government business. Notice number four, roads to recovery bill. The Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, uh, I present a copy of the Roads to Recovery Bill 2000, duly signed, just inside these days, I understand. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to provide funding to supplement expenditure on roads. The Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much. I move that this bill be now read a second time. I have great pleasure in introducing the Roads to Recovery Bill 2000. Yeah. This bill uh, appropriates a total of $1.2 billion over five financial years for grants to local government for the purpose of construction, upgrading and maintenance of local roads. And, uh, it is indeed fitting that on the eve of Australia celebrating its centenary of federation, we have placed firmly on the agenda the task of rebuilding the transport network which is so essential to our economic and social well-being. The Roads to Recovery program will greatly strengthen the grassroots of our road system and, in so doing, create job opportunities for a great many Australians. For too long, local roads have been Australia's forgotten roads. The government's Roads to Recovery program changes this. The bill demonstrates that the government is serious about the renewal of local roads and recognises that they are an essential element of the economic and social infrastructure of Australia's communities, rural, regional and metropolitan. The government is aware that councils, particularly those in rural and regional Australia, are faced with significant problems of maintaining local roads from within existing funds. The condition of local roads was a key issue discussed at the Regional Australia Summit. It was a problem raised frequently with the Prime Minister during his fact-finding tour of Regional Australia this year. It's an issue raised with me, I have to say, uh, in all honesty, on a daily basis. The, rural, the Moree Rural Roads Congress in March 2000 also highlighted the need for additional funding for road and bridge infrastructure in rural and regional areas. The meeting that I was at, the member for Batman was not, coming as he does from suburban Melbourne. Oh, mugger road. No, uh, Order. <coughs> mugger road from Order. Yeah. Uh, approximately pretty good from the tit for tatter over here, you know. He revealed his true colours and the nature of his character the other day. Order. <coughs> Approximately $850 million of the funding will be allocated to councils in rural and regional Australia and around $350 million to councils in greater metropolitan areas, including urban fringe local government areas that have extensive rural road networks. Uh, the uh, funds appropriated by this bill are in their entirety additional to the local roads funding already provided by the Commonwealth and represent a 75 per cent increase in the current level of those grants. And the program, Mr Acting Speaker, will commence immediately. The government is concerned that this substantial injection of funds is not dissipated. The bill ensures that funding is tied to ensure that every dollar is spent on local roads. Local government bodies must also provide the minister with a proposal for the expenditure of their grant, and there will be a requirement for appropriate audit arrangements. Additionally, the Prime Minister has written to all premiers and chief ministers seeking their assurance that they will not reduce their own expenditure on local roads. And today I indicate that the government strongly believes that the states and territories must go further. They must commit to matching the Commonwealth's historic local road funding program. They must not just pay lip service to the needs of local government authorities across the nation. And the government urges the opposition to support it in this call. I really can't see for the life of me why the opposition would not, in these circumstances, join us, join us in our call to match us with this historic program. So I urge the uh, Parliament to pass this uh, bill without. He can't help the poor old class warfare. He can't help his class warfare. Order, Just order. Can't the member for Batman will cease interjecting. The I urge the Parliament to pass the bill quickly and without delay, so that the funds can be paid directly and quickly to local councils as soon as administrative arrangements are in place. This will mean roadworks can start uh, as soon as possible in the new year and on priorities nominated by councils which is good news for local communities and for local industry. Yeah, yeah. 
The government has been listening to rural and regional Australia, to local communities and to local industry. They've made a co cogent case for improved funding for local roads as a long-term investment in the future of this country. The economic and social importance of local roads is increasing with the expansion and emergence of new rural industries with higher transport demands, including, I must say, higher mass limits and with frequent lack of transport alternatives. Local roads are an essential feeder to other parts of the transport system and between rural, regional and urban areas. They're vital to the sustainability and recovery of rural and regional Australia. Access to education, health, shops, amenities as well as markets overwhelmingly depends on local roads. And like capillaries that, follow, that carry blood throughout a healthy body, our roads are the essential network that must be sustained if we are to ensure the health and vitality of our local communities and industries. A substantial proportion Mr. Anking Speaker, of the local road network was constructed in the 1950s and 60s. It's reached the end of its economic life, resulting in deteriorating levels of service in the face of increasing demand and the need for higher road standards. The capacity of many rural and regional local councils to meet increasing road needs is also limited and often compounded by declining population and a falling rating base. The local roads funding of the Roads to Recovery program will help address these needs and concerns. Councils will now have the capacity to improve access to social amenities, to improve safety on local roads and to address infrastructure impediments impacting on industry development, such as upgrading substandard roads and bridges. In keeping with the Coalition's social power policy of empowerment and partnering, it will be directed at devising local solutions to a national problem. The three spheres of government represent the same electors and should, not serve them, and should serve them rather, not on the basis of some assumed hierarchy of importance, but rather who is capable of best delivering services for people. Local government will be a key player in developing priorities and service delivery under this program. We're tackling a national challenge with a local solution, and we acknowledge the intimacy of interaction citizens have with their local council when it comes to local service delivery. It is estimated, I think importantly to, to be noted, that the program will create directly up to 5,000 new jobs in rural and regional Australia, as well as many other jobs from an industry expansion as a result of improved road access. The federal government is signalling its intent to end the tyranny of distance in Australia and to develop an integrated transport system. This involves greater connectivity between places of manufacture and agribusiness to markets, inland ports, railheads and the sea highways so vital to our export income. Roads to Recovery also supports broad Commonwealth policy objectives such as the Supermarket to Asia strategy and its Regional Solutions program. The underlying principles of the Roads to Recovery program is development of a redefined network of rural roads that will spearhead a regional economic growth recovery and create better transport synergies. We must do this if Australia is to make a quantum leap in planning, building and maintaining roads that will serve the nation beyond 2020 and not just rely on an existing network that might not be adequate to future requirements. Given their lifespan of 20 to 30 years, the roads we plan and build now must take account of the infrastructure needs of industries that may themselves only be in their infancy. In the Roads to Recovery program, the government has recognised that the historical methodology for allocating funding between states and territories contains inherent anomalies. Therefore, we have rectified this by establishing a fair allocation based on historical precedents, length of local roads and population. Allocations between councils within each state are strictly in accordance with the formula adopted by the state grants commissions established and applied under the previous government. Any claims that suggest allocations to council have been manipulated to favour the electorates of government members are therefore completely scurrilous. <clears throat> um, well, you ought to attempt to understand uh, how it's been done. Uh, I suppose Order. it is inevitable. I suppose it's inevitable, however, that when confronted with a sound, economically and socially responsible program of benefit to local communities, the only avenue of criticism left will be to make petty jibes about allocations. The explanatory memorandum includes the full listing of local councils and their allocation under the program. The minister will have only the power to vary allocations within a state where there are variations to council boundaries. The Roads to Recovery program has been made possible by the federal government's sound economic management. Our stronger budgetary positions allow, allow the government to return a dividend to the whole community through this substantial investment 
in local roads infrastructure. This program is good news for local communities, for local councils, for motorists, for local industries. It's good news for Australia. Farmer organisations, local government authorities, representative organisations, rural communities, industry groups and road transport operators have welcomed this government's far-sighted initiative. I commend the bill to the House. Is leave granted to continue the debate? Leave is granted, leave Mr Deputy granted. Speaker. Uh, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Batman. Mr Deputy Speaker, in rising to speak to the Roads to Recovery Bill 2000, The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, <clears throat> I now call the Honourable Member for Batman. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. In rising to speak to the Rose to Recovery Bill 2000, I would indicate that the, at the conclusion of my discussion today, I intend moving a second reading amendment. That second reading amendment, whilst welcoming the additional road funding, clearly raises one of the most important issues in the Australian community at the moment. That issue goes to the fact that the coalition government broke its election promise going to the issue of the impact of GST on petrol prices, and that as a result of that clear promise that has been broken by the Prime Minister and all associated with the coalition government, it's no longer just a question of additional road funding, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's also a question of whether or not ordinary Australians can afford to buy the petrol to enable them to travel those roads around Australia. And I must say that's an exceptionally important issue, Mr Deputy Speaker, when you consider that next year is the International Year of the Volunteer. And when I look around Australia on a regular basis, a lot of people in semi-retirement or retirement who live from week to week actually put their hand in their pocket and purchase petrol to enable them to carry out community services such, for meal, such as Meals on Wheels or alternatively picking up some of our elderly citizens on a voluntary basis to actually take them to community events. For those people, Mr Deputy Speaker, and a lot of other people who live from week to week, who, unlike the Prime Minister, actually put their hand in their pocket each week to actually purchase petrol, it is really, yes, a requirement for reasonable roads in Australia, but more importantly, as the member for McEwen knows, now a real debate about whether or not they can actually purchase petrol. So on that very basis, I am about, in discussing this bill, ensuring that the member for McEwen and others on the coalition side actually have an opportunity, in accord with what they are saying in their electorates at the moment, to actually vote for relief with respect to petrol prices and the impact of the GST on petrol prices. It is no longer acceptable, Order. Mr Deputy Speaker, Order. to actually say one thing in your electorate and then do something entirely Order. different when Order. you catch the Remember white car McEwen. on the plane to Canberra. That's what it's really about, Mr Deputy Speaker. Just not a, a debate about roads to recovery. Order. It's the, also the a vote about integrity and honesty seat. in government. Member McEwen, I note, is speaking next in this debate. I suggest she holds her remarks until then. The Honourable Member for Batman. Thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I understand why members such as the member for McEwen are rather tense and, I suppose, a bit sensitive about this issue, because this debate really brings to a head the debate not only about Rose but whether or not they are going to be honest in their electorates and actually, when they come to Canberra, vote with their feet and actually put up their hands in support of a proposal which is about giving genuine relief to ordinary Australians and electorates such as McEwen for a reduction in the price of petrol through taking the GST spike out of the potential increase in petrol from the 1st of February next year due to the application of the GST. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is for that very reason that Labor actually has many concerns about what many in the Australian community regard as an unfair, shabby legislative effort intended to meet those needs. The opposition shares with all taxpayers a contempt for seeing politicians bestow taxpayers' money like it was their own to give. The amendment before the House that I will move today condemns the government for that very approach, a lack of honesty and integrity in government. They are condemned for failing to compensate motorists for higher fuel prices as a result of the GST in spite of their promises, something that the member for McEwen actually speaks about in her electorate when she comes to Canberra in this House 
she fails to put her hand up in spite of the fact she says one thing in her electorate and does another thing in Canberra. Mr Deputy Speaker, they are condemned for having no national strategy for infrastructure development, leaving major transport and other infrastructure projects and opportunities untapped or not determined in a fair and transparent way. They are condemned for a program that does not respect the infrastructure priorities of local councils and communities. They have pushed the money out into one transport mode, one infrastructure type in a one-size-fits-all approach to fixing infrastructure needs. They are condemned for five years of neglect of regional infrastructure and development. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, they are condemned Yes, they stand condemned for lack of transparency in the identification of road funding priorities under this bill. That is the nature of the second reading amendment to this House. And I also challenge, in accord with what the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport said today, that decisions on road funding should be left to local councils. We have evidence of members on the other side already ringing local councils and seeking to intimidate and direct them about what should be their local road funding priorities. Nathan. The truth of the matter, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that local council has a capacity, free of political interference from Canberra, to actually determine their local government priorities. Mr Deputy Speaker, in addressing these issues, I say at the outset, this bill smells like pork. If this package is as fair, equitable, generous and flawless as inferred by the minister, why has its presentation and preparation to this House and the community been so sloppy, slapdash and deceptive? I tell you why, Mr Deputy Speaker, because that is part and, part and parcel of the hallmark of the operation of this government, as evidenced by the unfortunate debate in this House today and the unfortunate attack by the government on the integrity and the honesty of the Speaker during this morning's proceedings. Mr Deputy Speaker, I inform the House that this bill had its first public viewing less than 24 hours ago. It was only late yesterday, as, an approach, as a result of an approach by myself as the Shadow Minister the previous day, in a letter to the Minister for Transport to try and expedite, expedite properly public consideration of these matters, that the Minister's office actually granted my office an opportunity for a briefing on the bill. And the problem was that it was only late yesterday, despite my request and the so-called urgency with respect to this bill, that the department and minister were able to provide a copy of the bill to the opposition and a briefing. But the truth was also that the substance of that bill at that very time was still being scribbled out less than 24 hours ago. At the same meeting, we were told of today's timetable and soon found out that much of the detail was being held back or not revealed. The government also revealed at the last minute that every single council in Western Australia and South Australia, despite what it trumpeted earlier in this week, was now receiving what? Was now receiving less funding than announced by the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister on Monday of this week. Mr Deputy Speaker, it was only after 10 p.m. last night that we received the explanatory memorandum from the minister for an important bill which is supposed to distribute $1.6 billion, not of the government's money but taxpayers' money, in a transparent way, what sort of shamble is operating on the other side of the House at this very point in time. We are told that councils will receive funding quarterly in advance, but that the minister will have absolute discretion over when, the four year, when in the four years the funding is allocated. We know what that smacks of. You know what you're told and promote us, and we'll bring forward your funding in a highly political way. Talk about pork barrelling. It's basically a threat. If you know what you're told, we'll bring your funding forward. That's also reflected in the fact that the very letter advising members of parliament local councils of the proposed road funding demanded that local council funding be actually diminished, reduced by a requirement that local councils pay for elaborate signs to promote the government. 
I would have thought that every available dollar and cent should be spent on infrastructure around Australia if roads are so important, rather than this government waste taxpayers' money by demanding in their letters advising members of parliament and local councils that they had to waste money promoting the government. Where are their priorities? Where are their priorities on roads? Where are their priorities on railways and bridges and port developments? Where are their priorities when it comes to actually fulfilling a very deliberate election promise that the price of petrol would not increase as a result of the application of the GST? And that's what's also central to the debate this, this morning, not just road funding, but whether or not ordinary Australians beyond Curabilly House, where the occupant never puts his hand in his, petrol, in, his, in his pocket for petrol, are required to actually pay for petrol on a regular basis. Mr Deputy Speaker, in other words, when I refer to the nature of quarterly payments in advance, I suggest that the minister is about timing his announcements to suit the political preferences of the government actually using taxpayers' money in a political way. And you and I know, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this government is known for ensuring total political discretion on major infrastructure projects, a bit like, for example, the time for the Sydney orbital and the speed rail may be. The government says that we can't complain about how funding has been allocated between electorates because it's a Labor formula. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, that was another blatant lie from this government. Without this bill and departmental briefing, it was impossible to determine how they applied the old formula to get the result they did. At the briefing last night in my office, they confirmed that the formula had changed. The allocation of money between the states is a totally new formula designed in the minister's office. They could not tell us at the briefing last night how that new formula was designed or modelled, other than to say that it is something to do with historical precedent, population and road, law, road length. Well, I suggest to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, those factors had nothing to do with it. It was designed to rot the Australian political system to suit the political expediency of the coalition government and especially the National Party. There was no information on how these factors were considered, rated, scaled or measured. So much for transparency, honesty and integrity in government. I ask the government, therefore, right now, Mr Deputy Speaker, to put up or shut up on the question of the formula. They should today release the formula, tell the House and the Australian people the truth on the question of the development and application of the formula. I asked them for that last night when they sought to ram this bill through the House and they couldn't answer that question. Well, they have now had further time to consider that fundamental question. Come in the House this afternoon and answer the question. Remove any doubt in the Australian electors' mind that this is not only a political fix, it's also potentially a political rot to suit the needs of the coalition backbench. Mr Deputy Speaker. That's what it's about. It's about integrity in government. And they could not tell you, as I've said, and answer that question. Mr Deputy Speaker, what have they got to hide? If it's not pork I can smell, then frankly it is a rat. The minister says that any accusations that this package favours coalition members or seats is outrageous. But when you look at it, let's look at the facts. Everyone of the 17 seats that receive $25 million or more, that's every one of the 17 seats, belongs to coalition or government members. We already have the Roads of National Party Importance program. That, that's what it's about, a program that is not known for its transparency. But now we have also the Roads for National Party Recovery. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Howard government cries foul when the people in question, sorry, when the people question the word of the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. But now everyone will be questioning the honesty of the Howard government. Because the 17 top electorates under this package 
are all government electorates. No wonder the Howard government refuses to publicly release the formula for public scrutiny. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, how quick was the Prime Minister to come out and say this is not a pork barrelling exercise? In fact, the Deputy Prime Minister came out and said, and I quote, this will not favour coalition seats. That is a quote. This will not favour coalition seats. Well, now, this desperate Howard Anderson government, as the Minister for Community Services likes to describe it, has been exposed for what it is. It is a government that is simply not trusted by people in regional Australia. The truth is that the government stubbornly claims to have no money to provide relief for motorists at the petrol pump and then announces a local roads program. They have continued to bag the money from the higher fuel prices and the GST, ordinary Australians' hard-earned dollars. Now they are selectively sending some of the money back. But as our leader, Kim Beasley, has said on a number of occasions of late, and I quote, and maybe the member McEwen ought to explain this to her electorate, what is the point of having good roads if you can't afford to drive on them? Mr Deputy Speaker. I go to the cartoon in the Northern Territory News, a newspaper I don't often get the chance to quote in this House. I believe the NT News this week had a great cartoon on Tuesday. They had two people driving along a road. and I know the Northern Territory roads because I've worked in the Northern Territory extens extensively over a long period. And one said to the other, it's great. Now we can get to places where petrol is really expensive. So that's what it's really about in some of those rural, remote areas of Australia. Now we can get to places where petrol is really expensive, not at Kirribilli, but at places like Catherine, Borroloola, Gove, Groot Island, Rabbit's Flat, where it's really expensive. Mr Deputy Speaker, those drivers were probably a bit too hopeful about how much further they could get because of the road package. Because the NT, as the member for the Northern Territory will explain later today, gets a raw deal when it comes to the application of this so-called formula developed in the minister's office. I think the drivers might have heard the rhetoric of the package and not seen the detail as we have. The contempt this government has for the electorate is now showing through. They thought they could stare down people's demands for petrol relief. They thought they could stare down, for example, the National Farmers Federation. But the national president of the National Farmers Federation clearly said this week the roads package doesn't set the, settle the problem with respect to the broken promise and the application of the GST to petrol prices. They obviously haven't heard the concerns all around Australia, including the electorate of Menzies, not just the member for McEwen's electorate. They thought they knew best. They could only see the solutions as an either-or situation. But it's now clear they've made the wrong call. The West Australian newspaper summed it up on Tuesday when it said, and I quote, if Mr Howard hopes that Australians will accept this program as a political trade-off of cheaper fuel, he has underestimated the level of anger about fuel prices. I've also seen the reaction of the Bundaberg president of the Queensland cane harvest. It's quoted in the news mail of Bundaberg yesterday, Mrs Sandra Walk, when she said, and I quote, Harvesters would not accept the funding as a trade-off for rising fuel prices. We can survive on bad roads, but we're not going to survive on the current fuel prices. Motoring and farming groups are not giving up either. The National President Ian Donges of the Farmers' Federation has already said in Canberra in welcoming the road package, and I quote, it was not going to change their view on petrol prices. That's a separate issue and we will continue to talk about it. The government must realise, therefore, that these concerns are not coming from inner city or out of metropolitan areas. These serious reservations and riders about the scope of this major government announcement. Remember, we are talking about a new $1.6 billion of taxpayers' money announced in one hit. These reservations have not come from the inner city or outer metro areas. They have come from the rural and regional heartland. The biggest beneficiaries of the program are the ones still not happy. I suppose they're the ones that a member of the coalition government actually described as whingers 
only a matter of a week and a half ago. Farmers in regional Australia described as whingers by a front bench of the coalition government. I am waiting for the member for McEwen to actually attack that person who unnecessarily and without any proper right attacked our hard-working farming community and described them as whingers. Yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, they are from rural and regional heartland. And the problem is that the Minister for Transport does not even listen when he hears people in the country areas he tries to claim as his own. The reaction to this package has shown just how out of touch he is. Perhaps that comes from living in Upper Deakin or Red Hill too long, whichever yappy inner city suburb he resides in. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I suggest he's been living there for too long, and I now understand because of the pressure on his own electorate why he's actually moving back to his electorate because he fears the electoral backlash at the forthcoming federal election. Having neglected living standards, infrastructure and services in regional Australia for the past five years, people won't be conned. The slapdash way this bill has been presented is further evidence that the minister did not take care with the decision. The first copy of the bill only surfaced last night. Not the real detail and not the answers to obvious questions. And now he wants to bung it through, if not today, on Monday, the first sitting day of next week. I believe this is indicative of how the minister responded to community calls for some leadership and transport infrastructure strategies, and how he responded to the call for some backbone on fixing the Prime Minister's broken promise on petrol. He has panicked, gone weak at the knees and rushed and offered a knee-jerk response to part of the problem, only part of the problem. Let's go to the issue of the infrastructure strategy. Everyone recognises that our local roads need attention. Nobody disputes that on either side of the House. Local road funding, as we all know, has been a key issue for a long, to long time. But people, I suppose, are actually entitled to ask this afternoon, why has it taken until the year before the next election for the Howard government to act? I think people are entitled to be a little bit suspicious. After all, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Howard government, for all of the past five years, has told, told local councils that local roads were not the Commonwealth's responsibility. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a package that falls well short of the long-term infrastructure plan that regional Australia has been crying out for. They are serious infrastructure needs facing our nation. These are hard issues that we must sort through, such as how we work in partnership with the private sector and how we work with the local communities to give them a voice, a greater voice, in their future. But we know that that takes leadership, commitment and strength. It takes a fresh approach for how we plan for and develop our infrastructure. In the same way, we need to plan and develop our transport in this country. It is time that the minister did more than talk about national integrated transport planning. He has had long enough to deliver. We have heard nothing on how our railways can maximise their potential to ease the burden on the roads. Projects like the dedicated freight line through Sydney. That is a project that has money, that, that has money allocated, but where is it? Oh, the minister will try to blame the New South Wales government for that again, I suppose. It is the responsibility of government through strong, thoughtful leadership to bring these projects forward and to get them underway now, not just sit back and wait for the right political opportunity. This government has to face up to leadership questions and the challenge of leadership, bring the respective parties together in partnerships, drawing on the expertise of government, industry and communities. Labor therefore announced last Friday a National Infrastructure Advisory Council an obvious and achievable structure to share that leadership. Labor's Infrastructure Council will advise the Labor government on strategic planning needs, data deficiencies, strategies to coordinate within, within and between governments, and how we move forward on public-private partnerships. Unfortunately, I note, the Deputy Prime Minister has rejected it. He says the parties won't be able to reach agreement. Frankly, the role of leadership is to bring people together. It is not good enough to say we can't handle the tough issues of infrastructure planning coordination. We have avoided them for too long. Everyone in the infrastructure community, local government regional backbenchers agree with Labor and the Infrastructure Council. The Deputy Prime Minister is on his own. 
There are a number of elements to infrastructure policy as to opposed to an election policy. That is the distinction the Howard government is yet to learn. One of these must be increased government investment. And the only thing we can welcome about this package is the recognition of that, even if it has been totally neglected for five years. But everyone in this place knows that the infrastructure challenge is about more than investment. There is little dispute that infrastructure is critical to the development of our cities and our regions, and we know that many of our regions are lagging significantly. Infrastructure creates jobs, enhances business competitiveness and contributes directly to our quality of life as we access new opportunities, services and markets more rapidly than before. Mr Deputy Speaker, there are important issues before the House. We all know that, but the problem is the government is selective in actually working out what it is prepared to attend to. And the Australian taxpayer demands that we spend our infrastructure money honestly. That's the message from a range of organisations. But without an overarching policy framework and ad hoc announcements, will continue to be swamped by the broader effects of the market. I then go on, Mr Deputy Speaker, to actually suggest that the time has actually come to, for the government to actually make some hard decisions, not just on questions of local road funding and petrol prices, but also on such important matters as the Scoresby Bypass in Melbourne, where the Victorian government has actually offered to enter into a road of national significance to try and assist in the development, and also the development of the Western Sydney Orbital. The Prime Minister, I suggest, seems to claim that he knows all about this. He suggests he knows the money is in the budget for the Western Sydney Orbital. He's been telling us all. But he hasn't told us why construction hasn't commenced. He hasn't told us how long his transport minister has been sitting on the feasibility study. The study is done. The money is in the budget, but the first side hasn't been turned. The Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport should have taken his tie off and turned some dirt on the road relating to either Scoresby or the Western Sydney Orbital, rather than his cheap stunt at Canberra Airport earlier this week in announcing the roads to recovery package. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, maybe this government is relying too much on their finance minister for strategic infrastructure advice. I wouldn't. It's a bit of form or a record for getting a project wrong when it comes to private partnerships. Just go to Sydney at the moment and try and get on the train from Mascot Airport to CBD and have a think about the waste of public money because he got it run wrong. Mr Deputy Speaker, at last year's regional summit we had the Prime Minister proclaiming his support for nation building by promising the Alice Springs Darwin Railway without any talk of an infrastructure strategy. Well, one thing is clear from all of this. Our infrastructure investments are being driven by short-term politics not by any long-term plan. A renewed commitment to infrastructure is a key priority identified by last year's regional summit. But the summit delegates also stressed that it's just not about a few announcements on the Alice to Darwin or on local roads. It's about the needs for an integrated, developed national strategy. That's important in the infrastructure community and it's important to the public at large. It also requires that we be transparent in setting and meeting our priorities so as to maintain public support for infrastructure investment because people have had enough of pork barrelling and political decisions and the waste of taxpayers' money, as happens on all too many government policies at the moment. It requires stronger planning and coordination and more transparent planning and regulatory processes. Labor's infrastructure agenda will be driven by good economics, effective governments and our belief that all Australians should have the opportunity to participate in the economic and social life of our nation. It's about governing for all Australians, not some Australians, based on the Howard government's Sydney-centric approach, which emanates from Kirribilli. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is time that we made these hard decisions. Thirteen months ago, the government invited people from across regional Australia to Canberra for a regional summit. It was promised that a report would be produced in October 2000, but it hasn't turned up. The government also promised a whole-of-government approach. It hasn't turned up. All we see is an ad hoc announcement at the when the political heat was on. Having neglected living standards, infrastructure and services in regional Australia for the past five years, I know from the feedback this week that people won't be conned by this package. 
And that doesn't say that expenditure on local roads is important, but people have seen through this quick political fix to take pressure off on another front. Mr. Dip, Mr. Speaker, Labor will not deny this bill a second reading because we support money going to rural roads. But I tell you what, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no way we support it as a solution to Australia's infrastructure needs. There is no way accepted as a solution to Australia's transport needs. And Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no way on earth that we see this as an alternative to petrol excise relief, and neither will the Australian public. So on that note, Mr Deputy Speaker, I seek to move a second reading amendment standing in my name. That's about, yes, welcoming the additional road expenditure, but calling on this government to actually front up and take as a fundamental approach action to remove the effect of the GST from the fuel excise index, ex indexation adjustment in February 2001. And I ask the member from McEwen to actually put Order. up her hand the on this occasion time and do expired. what in Canberra she took. Order. Order. I formally move for a second reading amendment and look for honest Order. The Honourable Member for Batman will resume his seat. Is the amendment seconded? The Honourable Member I for Patterson. Amendment and reserve my right to speak. <laughs> the original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the Honourable Member for Batman has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. For the, almost the past half hour, we've been listening to the member for Batman, and I can say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I was listening very carefully to what the member for Batman was having to say, and in that entire half hour, I did not hear one positive response from him to probably the largest and best road funding package for local roads right throughout this country that we have seen in decades. Possibly it's the largest road funding package ever. The member for Batman, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I wrote down, and I'm pretty sure that I wrote down very carefully exactly what he said. He referred to this legislation, which is $1.6 billion for road funding, $1.2 billion of that going to local roads right across our country, and he referred to that as unfair, shabby legislative effort. He then went on to say that this was pork barrelling, that there were more coalition Order. seats receiving Order. funding than Labor Party seats. Well, the fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are more of us representing very large areas of regional Australia. He also said that nothing had been done for rail. He very carefully chooses to omit the diesel fuel rebate. He, said, he asked, where are the government's priority on roads? Well, he had half an hour in which to concentrate on that, Mr Deputy Speaker, because this legislation, this roads to recovery legislation, which represents a 75 per cent increase by the Commonwealth to, road, to local road funding, that's where the priority is. The government is actually showing that. And Mr Deputy Speaker, we've got 148 members of this House representing every community across our nation. And I'm sure that each and every one of the 148 of us who represent all of those communities have at some stage received representation about the state of local roads in our electorates. Presumably there may be an exception to that because the member for Batman doesn't seem to know much about the need for local roads and how excellent a package this is for local road funding. Now, many of the representations that we've all received have come from people concerned about the safety of a local road, concerned, for example, that the road, uh, one of their local roads is so bad that a local school bus, for example, can't travel down it. Just recently, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was at the Ruffey Primary School in my electorate, and parents with children at that school were concerned that Boat Hole Road, a crucial link in the school bus route, 
was unsafe for the school bus to travel on. And this is just one small example, but a very important example, of how the current state of local roads affects the daily lives of people. I'm going to refer to some other examples a little bit later on, if I have time, Mr Deputy Speaker. But that example is an important reason of just why this $1.6 billion Roads to Recovery funding program is so important, not just to my electorate of McEwen, but right across our whole nation. And this $1.6 billion funding is vitally important both for social and economic reasons. ABS data shows that the average age of Australian roads has increased from 16.3 years in 1983-84 to 18.6 years in 1995-96 and growing older. And I might add that during that period those opposite did ne never produce a package of road funding like this one to deal with the problems of, of, of the ageing road infrastructure. There is, of course, an, and these figures that I've given, Mr. Deputy Speaker, are of course an average, and I, like most members of this House, can readily identify many, many roads that are much older than, than the average and are, in fact, at the very end of their lifespan. They have been allowed to age and deteriorate because there has been a massive underinvestment in local roads for at least the past decade, largely because the states have abrogated their responsibility and because local governments simply hadn't had access to the level of funding needed to maintain the vast network of local roads and to keep them in good repair. This has had serious implications for communities because it's roads that link people with goods and services for work, for the everyday essentials, for health, for education and for social and recreational purposes. In the report of the Standing Committee on Primary Industries and Regional Services on Rural and Regional Infrastructure, which I chaired, Evidence was provided that poor roads increase the running cost of vehicles, lengthen travel time, influence the quality of goods being transported over them, usually to our ports and airports, restrict access by tourists and, for those of us in regional areas, increasingly tourism is a very important and, and growing industry, and it's these local roads where in, which, in fact, are impinging on the, um, the development of tourism in many areas, um, and reducing access, of course, for local community to supplies and services, and just so many of them are just simply unsafe. I must mention here, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the report uh, which I just mentioned made recommendations to government of the need to increase funding for roads. So as well as speaking here in this debate as the representative of my electorate of McEwen, I'm also pleased with this road funding package on behalf of my committee. And the benefits of road funding to generate employment in regions and assisting in the growth of industry indeed are substantial. And I want to refer, in fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the report that I just spoke about. Um, and I will quote from the report, where, because a number of studies, in fact, have been conducted over recent years, both here in Australia and overseas, and they have all established a very clear connection between judiciously targeted investment in roads and economic development. And in its submission, the Australian Automobile Association summarised some of the findings from these studies. They said there is a significant positive relationship between investment in road and other infrastructure and the private sector output. For every 1 per cent increase in investment in road infrastructure, there is a, a, occurs at the same time a corresponding private sector um, output, um, which increases. It, their study also said an additional $1 billion invested in roads would yield a long-run annual increase in GDP, ranging from $810 million for urban arterials to $270 million for rural arterials and $110 million for local roads. 
The economic stimulation that this level of investment would produce would lead to a growth in, in employment of between 2,400 jobs for local roads and 19,000 jobs for urban arterials. The Automobile Association also pointed out that the returns from investing in roads are higher than those for most other types of economic and social infrastructure. Um, this means, Mr Deputy Speaker, in real terms, that new jobs will be created in my electorate throughout the shires of Delatite, Murrindindi, Mitchell, Strathbogie, Yarra Ranges, Whittlesea, Hume and Nilambic. Conversely, Mr Deputy Speaker, it has also been documented that the, that the benefits of industry and employment growth are lost without spending on road infrastructure. And I want to give you just a quick example from my own electorate. Um, and the Shire of Delatite made a submission to our committee's inquiry where it was talking about the expanding timber industry. An industry analyst estimate that in the absence of adequate road maintenance in just this one shire of Delatite, transport costs in the timber industry will rise by up to 20 per cent. And as 50 per cent of the cost of timber is made up of transport costs, a rise in costs of this magnitude will reduce the competitiveness of existing participants in the industry and reduce incentive to make further investments in the industry. And that, of course, we're talking about jobs, Mr Deputy Speaker. This legislation of providing $1.2 billion for local roads will ensure that these benefits um, for uh, industry and employment are captured, but are captured importantly for our local region. Um, I realise that I've um, got um, very little time left in this debate in, in order to give, let everyone have a say, Mr Deputy Speaker, so I'll um, just mention very briefly two areas, uh, the Tolmy Bridge up in the Delatite Shire and, Bar and the um, uh, Kerwin's Bridge in the Shire of um, Strathbogie, where the, the lack of investment in road infrastructure there has actually meant that communities, um, people living in these communities, have extremely poor access. Um, the, the road conditions are hazardous. It poses an emergency risk in, in, in many cases. And I want to say, in stark contrast to um, the reaction that we heard here by the member for Batman, um, I have contacted every one of my shires, and I can tell you they're all absolutely ecstatic about this. Um, this morning I did a radio interview up in Alexandra and spoke to the CEO of the Shire of Murrindindi, who can't wait for the money to flow. So when the member for Batman says, what is the need for the urgency to get this legislation through the parliament? Well, the answer to that question, Mr Deputy Speaker, is we want to get the funding through to local government as quickly as possible so that they can start on this massive job of repairing and bringing these local roads up to scratch. I would love to talk in this debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, for much, much longer, but I, I know that my time has run out, so I will simply say, in conclusion, I thoroughly commend this legislation on behalf of all of the people I represent in my electorate of McEwen. I commend it to the House. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. I call the honourable member for Patterson. And thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And actually, the member for McEwen has identified what I consider one of the problems with this legislation when she talks about both time and the fact that she has very, time, very little time to speak on it because this piece of legislation, I believe, shows one of the misfortunate aspects of this chamber, and that is that it is an adversarial chamber where it's government and opposition, whereas everyone in this chamber believes that more money needs to be spent on roads. Everyone. And I know that uh, you and I, Mr Deputy Speaker, in a former government, both advocated that more money should be spent on the Pacific Highway and we were quite uh, ecstatic when it did happen, and we're very proud of the fact that it is being constructed today. But despite what has been stated by senators and some former members of this House, I have never, or no, I certainly have not, rejected the proposal of funding for roads in Australia 
under the Roads to Recovery program, nor would I. Having served as a Deputy Shire President on a small country shire and then a shire president of Port Stephens, one of the fastest growing areas in Australia, I know only too well how difficult it is to get sufficient funding to build the roads that are needed by Australia's expanding uh, society. However, what I have done and what I will continue to do is to question the priorities of this government and the fact that this government sees that this is the only way to spend the bonus windfall that they have received from being the highest taxing fuel government in Australia's history. And I say that, I say that quite advisedly because I know that when this government came to power in 1996, the excise on petrol was 34.183 cents. It rose, it rose to 44.8 cents on the 30th of June this year and immediately with the advent of the GST the Treasurer dropped it back 6.7 cents to its 38.1 cents a litre that it is now. It is still higher than when they came to power, plus of course the GST, and this is the only response this government can give to the people of Australia that have had to put up with deteriorating road conditions and increasing fuel prices and increasing fuel taxes. Actually, anyone who saw the front page of the Daily Telegraph, uh, the Sydney Daily Telegraph, on Tuesday of this week, that, that, saw, that saw the Prime Minister standing there, the lollipop man with the stop-go sign, that epitomised what this government has done to road funding in five years. In five years, they have slashed the funding for regional roads. They have slashed the funding for the Pacific Highway. And, of course, the program that they delight to tell us about is the Black Spot Funding Program. They love to tell us that because it allows the Deputy Prime Minister to come into my electorate on the odd occasion, as he did last April, and announce 277,000 for a black spot. Of course, that was done in April. The funding was uh, released by the budget in May. And have we seen the road fixed? The answer is no. The answer is no. And I'd invite him to come back. And I'd also remind him what happened at that day. I'd also remind him that what happened on that day was that I challenged him. I challenged him to match the state government for funding for one specific road. And, and he said, I'd love to be in a position to if only the funding was there. Can well, I Deputy Prime that? Minister, under this program, the funding is there. The funding is there, but you still haven't responded to the challenge because there is not enough money. There is not enough money in this program for the local government areas concerned to pay the $62 million to reconstruct the Buckets Way. Can I and interrupt at that point the member for I Patterson? I will look forward to continuing my comments to continue after question time. Thank you. Just a little later. For the information of the House, and in response to a variety of inquiries on the matter, I wish to clarify the circumstances in which I recommitted a vote to the House this morning. I wish to stress to the House that in the series of divisions that occurred during the morning, it was proper that a number of them were one-minute divisions. The division in question was called under the one-minute provision, but given that there was intervening debate, ought to have been called under the four-minute provision, a matter later noted by the member for Dobell. The division did not result in a majority either way, and I was not prepared to exercise my casting vote in favour of my own ruling. As the question of the time for the ringing of the bells had been raised, and there was the possibility of confusion. Under Standing Order 208, I decided to submit the question once again in division in order to determine the will of the House. Yes. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Dixon. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Employment Services. Minister, can you confirm that your department told Senate estimates last Thursday that it offers a $6 million bonus to Centrelink if they can exceed a minimum quota 
on breaching the unemployed. Minister, why did you hide this $6 million breaching bonus from the Australian public? And will you now remove the breaching bonus as well as the quota which requires, and I quote, that 60 per cent of job network breach notifications are applied? The Minister for Employment Services. Mr Speaker, uh, as of the current financial year, Centrelink is able uh, to get an extra $5 million from my department if it meets all of 12 key performance indicators. There are 12 key performance indicators. Ten of them relate strictly to service to job seekers. Uh, two of them relate to breaching. The two key performance indicators relating to breaching are designed to ensure a, that Centrelink and Job Network members have a common understanding of what's reasonable behaviour, and b, that Centrelink won't breach anyone uh, without following due process and ensuring that natural justice applies. Now, let me point out, Mr. Speaker, that um, Centrelink is able to not meet the breaching KPIs and still get more money, or it could meet the breaching KPIs and not get and not get more money. So uh, the simple fact is, Mr. Speaker, that Henry yet again there are, there are no targets. There are no targets. The number of breaches is not is the not set Dixon. is not set by the government. It is set by job seeker behaviour. And what this government is on about is ensuring that people obey the rules. And what the opposition obviously seem to want is the old days where almost any excuse would do. The honourable member for Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister advise the House on the progress with drug diversion agreements with the states and territories? Prime Minister. Mr um, Speaker, I thank uh, the member for Mitchell for this question. It gives me an opportunity to report to the House on the considerable progress that has been made since the COAG meeting in April of last year to adopt a national approach to illicit drug diversion. Diversion means, Mr Speaker, that drug users can either commit to treatment and rehabilitation or take the consequences of their action in the criminal justice system. And when uh, this national approach to diversion was announced by the government, it received widespread support in the Australian community. We uh, allocated $220 million to this initiative, including funds for treatment, education, law enforcement and research. In November of last year, I launched a detailed national diversion policy framework following its endorsement by all state and territory governments. And the approach is built on a partnership between governments, community organisations, health professionals and local communities. It is a very good example of the social coalition at work. In December of 1999, the Minister for Health and Aid Services and the Tasmanian Premier jointly launched the first diversion agreement. In May of this year, I announced a Commonwealth New South Wales diversion agreement with the New South Wales Premier, and I launched a similar agreement with the Victorian Premier in August of this year. And the Commonwealth expects to launch an agreement with Western Australia in a matter of days and to conclude agreements very shortly with both South Australia and Queensland. Mr Speaker, can I record my immense gratitude at the bipartisan approach that has been adopted by state governments working in partnership with the federal government to try and make significant inroads into this dreadful social scourge of drug abuse? And can I say in passing, Mr Speaker, that the national drug statistics released yesterday contained the very pleasing news that there has been a significant drop in heroin overdose deaths in New South Wales to a figure of 296 in 1999-2000 from 491 the year before. Now, Mr Speaker, that may only be um, um, some kind of statistical interruption to a pattern that has caused a lot of concern over years. We all hope it's not. I take the opportunity of congratulating all concerned in that, both those working for New South Wales agencies and also the Commonwealth. 
One of the dangers of this debate, Mr Speaker, is there, for there to be a sense of hopelessness that nothing can be done and that everything that has been tried to date is a failure and is of no use. That is a mistake. There is a wide area of agreement in the community on what ought to be done to tackle the problem. The areas of disagreement on such issues as, as heroin trials and heroin injecting rooms, although they are significant, they mask the fact that in most areas there is enthusiastic cooperation across the political divide between all people concerned in trying to bring about a reduction in drug abuse in the community. I don't think it is a cause that um, any of us should resile from. We should continue the campaign, and there are some signs, Mr Speaker, that in some areas that campaign is beginning to bear fruit. Certain the diversion programs, Mr Speaker, are a good illustration of that, and I thank the premiers of the states of various political complexions for their cooperation in the public interest in tackling this very serious problem. Yeah. Yeah. Member for Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment Services. Minister, in question time on Tuesday and again in your previous answer to me, you said breaches are not driven by government policy, they are driven by the behaviour of job seekers. Can the minister, by that logic, explain the 250 per cent increase in job seeker misbehaviour since 1997? And isn't the truth, Minister, that the 250 per cent increase in fines levied against the unemployed is explained by your behaviour of demanding a quota of fines on the unemployed for Centrelink to fill? Yeah. Minister for Employment Services. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, there have been a significant increase in the number of breaches, no doubt about that, and the reason for that is that this government is serious about enforcing the rules. This, this government believes that the social security rules should be upheld. The reason, the reason, the reason for the big increase uh, since the years when Labor was in government is not our harshness, it's your slackness. It was the slackness of the Labor government uh, and, and, the, and the appropriate and the appropriate rigor that this government has put into place, which explains the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Member for Parramatta. Yeah. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Could the Treasurer outline to the House the outlook for the current account deficit in 2000 2001 following the release today of the outcomes of the September quarter? by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Parramatta for his question. I can inform the uh, House that the September quarter current account figures showed a significant improvement in Australia's current account position, yeah, yeah. registering a deficit of uh, 5.5 billion, Mr Speaker, uh, or only around 3.4 per cent of GDP. As I've previously informed the House, uh, the September figures are uh, boosted, of course, by the Olympics. But what they showed is that the volume of exports grew 3.8 per cent in the September quarter. Elaborately transformed manufactured exports rose 5.1 per cent in the quarter, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, and rural commodities exports rose 5.6 per cent in the quarter. Services exports rose 14.4 per cent in the quarter. So this shows a return to strong growth in uh, exports uh, to a round trend following two years below trend coming out of the Asian financial economic crisis. Uh, notwithstanding those uh, strong uh, growth in uh, exports of 3.8 per cent in the September quarter, the volume of imports grew only slightly at 0.4 per cent. As a result of this, Mr. Speaker, uh, net exports will contribute 0.7 percentage points to GDP growth in the September quarter when we get it. Today's uh, outcome is a significant improvement in Australia's uh, current account. Uh, the uh, government uh, is forecasting a significant decline in the current account through the year to 4.25 per cent from the 5.4 per cent which was recorded last year. 
and most importantly, net exports will make a contribution of about one percentage points to Australia's GDP growth. Now, I think, Mr. Speaker, um, we should not get complacent about the uh, current account deficit, and it's something that uh, we must keep a very firm policy handle on. One of the reasons why it's important to run budget surpluses, Mr. Speaker, to build up savings. Can you imagine where Australia would be today if we hadn't have paid off $50 billion of Labor's debt? Which, Mr. Speaker, would have just gone on to the debt figures and would have made uh, things that much worse, Mr. Speaker. But the government, uh, of course, uh, can say that since it was elected, it turned away from Labor's wanton fiscal irresponsibility of $10.3 billion deficits and $80 billion rack ups of debt over five budgets and has made a positive contribution. And I think now that uh, the government was successful in that, uh, people can give it credit. I, uh, I wouldn't normally mention him as, a, as an economic adviser, Mr. Speaker, but uh, I was rather taken by the comments uh, on the Graham Richardson show uh, uh, made by, uh, by the man himself, Mr. Uh, Graham Richardson, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, he referred to yesterday's trade figures, which of course are not in the September quarter. They will go into the December quarter. Uh, he said uh, it's very good news. Uh, it was a bit political. I won't read that out. But uh, oh well, he said it was very good news for John Howard. And since you asked me, pretty bad news for Kim Beazley. <laughs> I mean, some mothers do have him. Oh, he just comes Treasure. in every time. The old member for Hutton. I was going to Come spare to your leader, but since you insisted, Graham Robertson, Graham Richardson said pretty bad news for. Kim Beasley. Member for Dudley. Or maybe he wanted me to read that letter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I tell you, Malcolm Farr's been getting some good telephone Treasurer, calls. We'll come to the question, Mr. Speaker. The old advisers over there uh, who are isolating him from bad news, uh, Mr. Speaker. I suppose uh, Chris from Warramanga is one of those advisers, Mr. Speaker. Anyway, to come back to uh, Graham Richardson, you did get that admission out of me that it was bad news for uh, Kim Beasley. This is what Graham Richardson said uh, of Mr Howard. He promised us some sort of economic revival, and looking at the figures, it's happening. You can make your own judgment as to how much to do with it he, how much to do with it he is having, but one thing's for sure. This is the best trade result Australia had in decades, and I mean decades. It's unequivocally good. Graham Richardson, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Treasurer. Deputy Leader of the Opposition will wait a moment. Member for the Trobe. <laughs> Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to, also to the Treasurer, and it refers to foreign debt, the figures of which also came out today. Do you recall promising when you launched the debt truck? that cutting the nation's foreign debt would be your first priority. Isn't it true that foreign debt today hit a record $294 billion, up 52 per cent since you became the Treasurer? Isn't this $15,480 for every man, woman and child, according to your own preferred measure? And hasn't credit card debt increased 137 per cent Deputy over the, the same period? Is hasn't argument. household debt increased 69 per cent? And don't Australians now owe more than they earn? Deputy Haven't you presided over question. a massive blowout in the debt burden facing Australian families? Treasurer. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I must say uh, it's uh, an element of confusion. He starts off with a question about foreign debt and ends up with credit card debt, Mr Speaker. He went, uh, he went on to a completely, a completely uh, different subject. I mean, you want to ask a question about foreign debt, you ask a question about foreign debt. You want to ask a question about credit card debt, which is a separate subject. We're happy, we're answer, we're happy to answer that too, Mr Speaker. But I think it's important, uh, if I come to the question of foreign debt, to um, put some uh, facts on the table. Uh, uh, the first, of course, Mr. Speaker, is that Australia's foreign debt, uh, when the government came to office, was 38.7 per cent of GDP, 
and is now 46 per cent. In other words, Mr. Speaker, uh, it has stabilised over 40 per cent. But, Mr. Speaker, the uh, deputy Mr. leader of the opposition Mr. has Speaker, asked his question, and the treasurer has the call. Some mothers do have them, so I think we ought to put it into context. When we came to <laughs> when we came to office, foreign debt was 38.7 per cent of GDP, which, uh, admittedly, Mr. Speaker, is too high. Mr. Speaker, um, in uh, 1983, in 1983. When Labor came to office, foreign debt as a percentage of GDP was 14 per cent. Over those 13 years, the foreign debt as a proportion of GDP went from 14 per cent to 38 per cent. And, Mr Speaker, just to put the number on it, because the member for Melbourne doesn't seem to be able to work out, under the Labor Party, the increase of foreign debt to GDP was 668 per cent. 668 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as, as I said, Mr. Speaker, uh, under the coalition, it increased 24.7 per cent. So 24.7 compared to 668.8 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I said at the time, and I'll say it now, that probably the most irresponsible period of Australian economic management was from 1983 to 1996. Um, not only, of course, was Australia plunged into awful recession, budgets in deficit, a build-up of $80 billion worth of debt, but if you want to look at it in terms of foreign debt as a percentage of GDP, it increased by 668 0.8 per cent, Mr. Speaker. So the good news is that we've arrested the acceleration of increase in foreign debt, which was started by the Australian Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. The second good point the uh, has the is call. that the debt servicing ratio, Mr. Speaker, has fallen and is now at one of its uh, lowest lowest levels ever. The uh, debt servicing ratio. The amount of exports required to pay the interest on net foreign debt is now 9.8 per cent. So the percentage of your exports which you are required to pay in relation to foreign debt is 9.8 per cent, comparing with its peak under the Labor Party of 20 per cent in the September quarter of 1990. And you recall, uh, Mr Speaker, that the Labor Party boasted that it would produce a recession as a consequence of its mismanagement in 1990. But, Mr Speaker, the last point I want to make about foreign debt, of course, is that uh, this government can make this claim, which is that it has not added a dollar to foreign debt, because this government has not borrowed a dollar since it came to office. In fact, having paid back $50 billion of Labor Party debt, what we've meant is that whatever it is now, it would have been at least $50 for billion at least $50 billion higher had the Labor Party still been in office. And, Mr Speaker, that would be the case, even, even leaving aside the fact that they would still have been running deficit budgets right into 2000-2001. Mr Speaker, the Labor Party may not be able to acknowledge it, but as Graham Richardson said, even Graham Richardson, Mr Speaker, there, ideological mentor, the man that taught them all of their tricks, the man, the man that knew even more about electoral matters than the member for Lilly himself, Mr Speaker. Unequivocally good news, he said, the best trade result Australia had in decades, and I mean decades. The Honourable Member for Macquarie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Would the Deputy Prime Minister advise the House of the social benefits associated with the federal government's $1.2 billion Roads to Recovery program? Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And, uh, member for Macmillan. Um, yeah, the, uh, the Prime Minister asked whether I've got time to outline the social benefits, and I haven't really, but I'll make a bit of a go at it and cover some of them. 
Mr. Speaker, I attended the, uh, the first National Ro Local Roads Congress in Moree uh, uh, earlier this year. And that was a landmark event in highlighting the importance of local roads to economies, but not just to economies, uh, but also to uh, local, uh, in terms of local social uh, benefits. And it brought together some of the best thinkers on road infrastructure in this country. Uh, I should note, of course, that uh, in that uh, uh, circumstance, I didn't see the member for Batman there. But, Mr. Speaker, the Congress revealed that rural roads support the social fabric of rural communities and regions and the efficiency of local roads makes a very significant contribution, and I think this is important, to education and health standards in rural communities. And interestingly, Mr Speaker, a survey conducted by the Country Women's Association of Australia, the CWA, in conjunction, in conjunction with the Office of the Status of Women found that where women were asked their priorities for government spending in rural areas, 69 per cent believed that roads should be the priority, a quite surprising figure, indeed uh, one that would not normally have been expected to have been the case. But the reason given was that improved rural roads were most important to women of all ages, in places of all sizes, whether in remote localities or large country towns, because, as they explained, uh, there is an intrinsic relationship between such things as good roads and a good education. Indeed, the inadequacy of rural roads is a disadvantage to attracting teachers to rural areas. It reduces attendance at schools, in some cases quite dramatically. It forces parents to send children to boarding school at an early age, and it forces families to relocate to larger centres in the interest of their children's education. And Mr Speaker, an Australian Local Government Association survey into the effects on school attendance of Australian children due to poor weather access in wet weather showed that one third, one third of the nation's rural and regional council areas are, are affected. And surprisingly, and I'd have to say of some concern as well, the survey also demonstrated that in around a third of our rural councils, school buses still operate on roads that are closed to heavy traffic during and following wet weather. So, Mr Speaker, there can be no doubt that poor roads contribute to a reduction in educational opportunities at a time when those educational opportunities are more important than ever to all Australian children, and particularly those in some of the more remote parts of the country. In the survey, 25 per cent of councils indicated that poor road access had serious implications for the delivery of health services. Councils indicated that, on average, there were five instances each year where it was not possible to get a patient to a hospital by road in the event of an emergency. So, Mr Speaker, these, uh, these points touch on this uh, very real issue of the social benefits provided by rural roads to health, to education, to the normal running of a decent uh, social life and interaction with people in your community. In that circumstance, I have to say that it is just impossible to fathom the Leader of the Opposition's belief. It really is that the federal government's $1.2 billion injection into local roads is unnecessary or trivial. Can I remember for Bowman? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Is the minister aware of allegations involving the alleged multiple sexual abuse of a 15-year-old boy and that's not the 12-year-old boy, inside Woomera, who was so distressed and traumatised by the abuse that he would burn holes into himself. Are you further aware that the boy is claimed to have developed trust in one of the centre's nurses, agreeing to speak about the abuse with centre manager Mr Meekins, on the proviso that she would accompany him? Are you further aware that Mr Meekins prevented the nurse from attending the meeting and effectively stopped the boy's story from being told? Minister. In light of the growing flood of allegations being presented and the obvious reluctance of witnesses to come forward, why won't you establish a full judicial inquiry into the mismanagement of the Woomera Detention Centre? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Mr Speaker, I am aware of the allegation. Um, the allegation was investigated thoroughly by the South Australian Department of Family and Youth Services. Um, they interviewed all of the parties involved. 
um, undertook a thorough investigation um, and found that uh, no further action was required, no charges to be brought. Um, and uh, um, it seems to me um, that uh, what the member is doing is impugning the professionalism of the authorities who have the capacity to make a judgment in the relation to these has matters. The, call. the minister has the call. Minister. Um, the minister has the call. I said yesterday, in relation to uh, the matters that were raised by the honourable member for Bowman, uh, that in relation to each and every one of the issues that I assume he will continue to raise, there are appropriate authorities for those matters to be raised with, where thorough and proper and professional investigations can be uh, can be brought. And, and what? And, and, what, and what is particularly relevant in relation to the matter that has now been raised, it is obviously predicated upon advice uh, from the party that he referred to specifically, one of the nurses. Um, and nurses have a quite clear legal obligation in relation to what they should do. And uh, no, I'm concerned. I am member concerned. For member I am concerned that people who, under state law, have a moral and a legal responsibility to report those matters seem to be pressing those buttons now, rather than reporting them at a time, rather than reporting them at a time when reasonable steps could be taken if they believed the child was at risk to provide that protection. Member for Jagger Jagger. Member for the Northern Territory. Member for Cowper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Would the Minister advise the House how the New South Wales Mid North Coast will benefit from the $1.2 billion roads to recovery program to upgrade the nation's local roads network? Is the Minister aware of enthusiastic support for this program, especially from the electorate of Cowper and the Shires Association of New South Wales? Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. He, of course, is the person who pushed so very hard for the Pacific Highway. I, 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 sort of, I, I seem to recall that the, I seem to recall a $3 billion program. In fact, it's the biggest, uh, Member for the biggest Patterson. exercise that uh, governments in this country have been engaged in in infrastructure since the Snowy Mountain scheme. And I seem to remember that the, the area that you're asking about is the Central Coast, represented in part by the member for Patterson, who wasn't very enthusiastic in his support for the Pacific Highway. He really didn't support it at all. But, Mr Speaker, it's no wonder that in this case people on the mid-north coast have been very keen and very keen to support, uh, uh, the, uh, to support the package. I mean, Port Stephens around $2 million, member Hastings for Reed. over $4 million. The member for Reed. You've had the Labor Mayor for Hastings saying uh, that uh, the road funding package will have tremendous economic spin-offs for our region. It will help to boost, he said, economic growth and employment opportunities in the Hastings. Not a bad endorsement, Mr Speaker. And then the Greater Taree City Council, um, well over $4 million. The response from the Mayor there, Councillor Mick Tucker. It is absolutely marvellous news for the needs of our local roads network, he said. Adding that uh, Council had already set aside an additional $1.6 million in this year's budget for roads and bridges. So he said we've got a major roads program underway. And then there's the Great Lakes uh, Council. They're receiving uh, $2.3 million. Mayor John, Ch John Chadburn was very happy, not only with the funding, but with the fact that the payment will be coming direct from the Commonwealth. He thought that was a very good idea because he had a bit of a concern about the sticky fingers of state governments sort of getting in the way. Uh, I don't think he was referring to Queensland, but he certainly had that concern. And Mr. Speaker, uh, but Mr. Speaker, I have to say that uh, I have another quote in relation to this, oh. and this is, my <laughs> this is a favourite of mine, and I'll read it to you. Roads are one of the most important issues in regional Australia today, and in an area like Great Lakes, 
which has a burgeoning population and tourism as a mainstay of its local economy, local economy the state of roads is not important, not significant, paramount. paramount. And do you know who said that? It was the member for Patterson. It was a member for Patterson. It was being. It wants more money. He's just confirmed. It he wants more money. More money. More money. Order. Yeah. Now, as the Minister member for Patterson, the Great Lakes advocate in September the 20th, recognising the, the importance of local roads, calling on the federal government to allocate more money. Now, of course, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly what we've done. We agree with him on this one. He's right. You know, they're not just boondoggles. They actually need attention. But unfortunately for the member for Patterson, there's a problem. Member There's for a Patterson. problem. But, but, <laughs> he digs himself in deeper. He really does. I mean, it, because he's the got a problem. Member for Patterson. I the member for Patterson's Minister, got a problem, Minister and that is quite remarks. clearly that the leader the of the chair. opposition says these works are trivial and unnecessary. So the member for Patterson saying local roads are more are important than order to get more funding. He, he gets more, it from the Commonwealth trivia. government, but his own leader won't acknowledge that they're important. He still regards them as unnecessary. And uh, for that matter, the member for Batman doesn't have much impact either. He was actually with the member for Patterson when the member, pa member for Patterson said we ought to be spending more money because it's paramount importance. He was with him, but it obviously hasn't yet registered that this is an important issue with the leader for the opposition. Because I want to uh, quote something he said uh, the other day as well. Because uh, Ian Mickle, the president of the Western Australian Municipal Association, he was a call at a Radio State 6 PR back on Tuesday, and he called to welcome the federal government's $1.2 billion roads to recovery local road funding package, but he wasn't too impressed with the chief boondoggle opposite. He had this to say. Uh, Here in Esperance, we've been arguing for more road funding from the feds for a long, long time. And he went on to say, it was rather interesting, and I'm particularly concerned, we haven't been able to tie in the federal opposition to this issue. Uh, because with a four-year program and just a year to go to a federal election, it is absolutely essential that we get a clear commitment from the Labor Party that this program will be ongoing. Otherwise, it's not worth much stirs at all. And Mr Beasley, when he was in Esperance last week, I tackled him on this and wait for it. And three times I brought him back to the question of the commitment of his party if they were elected to the government committing to these rural roads funds. And he didn't. He didn't. He just kept he just talked well he does do a lot of talking. <laughs> he just talked away from the subject. Didn't give me a response at all. And I know he's still making statements about fuel prices. He's not talking about road funding at all. I think road funding is absolutely essential to us in Esperance. Esperance happens, of course, to be in the leader of the opposition's home state. So Mr Speaker, three times uh, I've been there, several times. Now, Mr Speaker, the leader of the opposition was asked to commit his party to supporting this package three times. And three times he turned down the opportunity. He refused to commit himself. I wonder just how the member for Patterson feels about that. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, do you stand by your claim that you never promised the price of ordinary beer, draft beer, would increase by only 1.9 per cent as a result of the GST? Are you aware that 850,000 Australians have signed a petition circulating in Australia's hotels and clubs saying you did make that promise and that you broke it? Are you aware that this is the biggest petition ever presented to Parliament? And, Prime Minister, why won't you keep your promise on ordinary beer? Prime Minister. This matter has been the subject of numerous questions in the past, and I have no reason to resile from anything I've said in answer to questions in the past. Uh, of course people um, uh, offered the opportunity to sign a petition for cheaper beer would do so. I mean, that's a perfectly Leader of the opposition is thoroughly characteristically question. Australian thing to do, Mr Speaker. I'd be perfectly Deputy astonished Leader if they the hadn't signed the petition. Has asked his question. Member for Kuyong. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Would the Minister inform the House about support from parents' organisations for the government's schools funding legislation? How do these views contrast with alternative strategies? Minister for Education, Training and Youth Affairs.
Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Kuyong for his question. Parents are speaking out now, Mr. Speaker, loudly and clearly about their support for the government's $22 billion school funding package. Unfortunately, the leader of the opposition doesn't want to listen to these parents. The New South Wales Parents Council, representing over 332,000 children attending non-government schools in New South Wales, have written, I believe, a letter to all members in which they say, and I quote, we urge you to support the immediate passage of the bill without amendment. And the Parents' Council goes on to say, the funding mechanism established by the legislation has been three years in development. ALP opposition and Democrat members and senators showed little interest in the scheme during that period, and parents are now extremely concerned that the progress of the debate on this legislation puts the Commonwealth funding for school education, both government and non-government, at risk for 2001. And, Mr Speaker, the South Australian Independent Schools Board says, and I quote, the winners will be parents and families now able to better choose the education that best suits their children. And they go on to point out the regional dividend. 30 South Australian regional and rural schools from Sedona to Mount Gambier will benefit. Mr Speaker, parents and parents' organisations are being treated with contempt, contempt by the Labor Party and the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition is playing games with the lives of families and preventing schools planning properly for next year. And every day that he delays signals his contempt for Australian parents. Uh, in a famous example of Beasley speak, which is becoming very popular on the back bench of the Labor Party, Mr Speaker, he says he doesn't, he doesn't want to shoot the hostages, but he certainly doesn't mind roughing up the hostages a little bit. He doesn't mind making life difficult for them. As I've said in the House on many occasions, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has form, has form in this area. His strategy, his strategy at the last election, which we remember, engineered by uh, Pizzullo and, and Ang Lee, as the team was then, cost him his shadow minister, who now sits up there like a vulture on the back bench, uh, hanging, up, hanging around, just waiting to see what happens. And, and we, we, we remember what he said at the last uh, election campaign about the Labor Party and Mr. Kim Beasley's education policy. And this is what the member for Werriwa said. Mike Pizzullo, chief policy adviser, and John Angley, who wrote, worked for Kim as finance minister and had no involvement in the education area, rewrote the bloody thing. That was the member for Werriwa's term. So they stuffed it up. And the same advisers have done it again with schools policy again. The, 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 the Daily Telegraph summed it up very well this morning, Mr Speaker. It said, save the hostages, Kim, and shoot the brains trust. The, 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 the Leader of the Opposition should stop treating Australian parents with contempt and get on and pass the bill. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Paterson. The Member for Paterson has the call. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question without notice is to the Prime Minister. Have you seen this email circulated to all MPs in all parties describing a petition circulated in the Murray electorate, quote, protesting against the excessive fuel tax and describing the support of local member Dr Sharman Stone. And I quote, Dr Stone indicated to us the great value she placed upon these petitions in supporting her challenge to the Prime Minister and, and Treasurer for a reduction in the, the price member of for fuel. Patterson will come to his question. Oh, I am, Mr Speaker. Dr Stone stated she was a regular contact with the Treasurer member for regarding will this come issue. To his question. Prime Minister, if your own backbench is trying to save their skins by campaigning against your petrol tax in their electorates, why should struggling Australian motorists believe your promises? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it, um, I get a lot of emails and I see a lot of material pass across my desk. I've I got to say I haven't seen that one, Mr Speaker. I haven't seen that one, but uh, let me let me simply say that um, uh, let, let me the let Prime me Minister say has to the uh, call. To the honourable member for Paterson that um, when the um, member for Dobell, uh, the Prime when, Minister uh, the, has to call. Member the, for Dobell, when the government um, uh, an announcement uh, in relation to road funding was uh, was briefed, or was foreshadowed to the joint party rooms. Uh, Earlier this week, Mr. Speaker, I can I can assure you that um, 
the reaction was a um, um, little short of, um, uh, how shall we put it, rapturous in terms of, uh, a little short of rapturous, Mr. Speaker, in terms of, um, in terms of the, um, the, the welcome, the welcome that's been extended by all of my colleagues to something that people in, in rural, regional Australia and the cities, I mean, the, the take-out this week of the road funding announcement, Mr Speaker, is the complete fool the opposition leader has made of himself on the subject. He, he, he has, I mean, his great line, Mr Speaker, his great line was, was that this was going to be totally skewed towards rural electorates. As soon as we talked about road funding, without any sort of thought as to how the government might do it, he raced in immediately, Mr Speaker, and he said, oh, this is going to be entirely for National Party electorates. It's going to be entirely for rural electorate. The reality, Mr Speaker, is that this money is being distributed in accordance with a Labor Party formula, Mr Speaker. It is being distributed in accordance with the formula established by state grants commissions in the early 1990s when the Keating government was in office here in Canberra, Mr Speaker. So once the state gets the money, it is then distributed, not in accordance with who holds the electorate, but in accordance, Mr. Speaker, with a formula worked out, a formula worked out by state grants commission, and that has left uh, the the leader of the opposition, who regards road funding as trivial and unnecessary, that has left the leader of the opposition in an absolutely ridiculous position. There's not a member opposite who doesn't want this road funding for their electorate, Mr. Speaker. There isn't a council anywhere in Australia who's not grateful to this federal government. We are providing a 75 per cent increase, Mr Speaker. We are providing a 75 per cent increase. And might I, might I observe, Mr Speaker, that next week— Member for Patterson. Next week, Mr Speaker, there will be the, uh, the annual meeting of the Local Government Association of Australia, Mr Speaker, here in Canberra. And uh, not surprisingly, Mr Speaker, I have received an invitation to address that gathering, Mr Speaker, and not surprisingly, I have accepted the invitation, Mr. Speaker, and I'll have something to say at that gathering about this government's record on road funding, a record of which we are immensely proud. Mem Member for Patterson. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to table the email that uh, the Prime Minister has not yet well, opened and read. The, is leave granted? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Deakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business. Would the Minister outline what the federal government is doing to help workers who have lost their jobs because of their employers' insolvency, leaving some of their entitlements unpaid? Is the Minister aware of any alternative proposals in this area? The Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business, Leader of the House. Uh, I thank the member for Deakin uh, for his uh, question. Mr Speaker, it is timely as uh, the House uh, uh, draws to a close for this year just to look back on the introduction uh, of a significant extension of the safety net for the benefit of Australian workers. And I thank uh, the member for his question because uh, he and members on our side of the House have been strong supporters of putting in place a scheme to ensure that when workers were find themselves out of a job and without their entitlements, people on this side of the House were prepared to support a scheme that gave them assistance in their hour of need. And Mr Speaker, of course, we also amended the corporations law uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deal with people who have been in breach of the corporations law. But in terms of practical help, the fact is that when you lose your job and you don't get your entitlements, rather than to have to wait uh, on the uh, possible chance of some recovery two or three years down the track, it is very important, Mr. Speaker, that uh, as quick as it can be achieved, that support is provided to workers in that situation. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm pleased to say to the House that uh, uh, we have, uh, since the introduction of the scheme, in respect of insolvency starting on 1 January this year, uh, 1,125 employees have been helped, and they've been helped in uh, the circumstances of 70 insolvencies. And, Mr Speaker, in uh, the most recent case, for example, uh, which was uh, Victoria Knitting Mills Proprietary Limited uh, in uh, New South Wales, 
19 employees were helped uh, with uh, $70,000 uh, to go towards uh, their entitlements. Mr. Speaker, if the New South Wales State Labor government had supported those employees and likewise matched us on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis, those employees would be getting nearly 80 per cent of their entitlements. That is real assistance uh, when people need it. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, I'm asked, are there any alternative policies? The fact is that the Labor Party has not only opposed this policy, they have opposed supporting workers in their hour of need, and furthermore, they've used uh, what little political influence they have to encourage the state governments not to support it because it was a coalition idea. You know, this is uh, for, the, for the basest possible political motives. You have turned your backs against workers in their hour of need. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm asked, are there any alternative Member policies? Dixon. There is no alternative policy. No alternative policy. Uh, the, pol the, the things that you've said, to the extent that they're coherent, would cost a packet, have no international precedent. Leader would, of the would opposition. impose costs on good businesses to Leader pay for of bad the opposition. businesses. The minister has and, the call. And even the ACTU, Mr. Speaker, uh, has instead called on the Labor Party to support the scheme that is in operation. It is the only national scheme. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as we go to Christmas, it is a national disgrace that the Labor Party turn their backs on workers when they need a bit of help. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, I conclude by saying also. Uh, this scheme has not happened by chance. It, of course, has happened uh, because for 13 years, when the Labor Party was in office, they never lifted a finger to help workers in this situation. And it took a Howard-led government to ensure workers were helped. And I conclude by also noting, Mr. Speaker, uh, I do want to pay uh, a tribute uh, to the people within my own department who have worked very hard to make this scheme a reality and who I know are dedicated. Uh, to ensuring that we help workers when they need. It's about time the Labor Party stood up and had to uh, counter themselves when it comes to helping workers. Member for Batman. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My question without notice is to, Mr. Speaker, my question without notice is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Minister, isn't it a fact that a briefing last night by your office and department to my staff, it was confirmed that the formula for allocating road funding to recovery between states is not the same as the current formula? Minister, given that you claim your road funding package is not biased towards coalition seats, why do you refuse to publicly disclose the new formula for the allocation of road funding? Good question. The minute, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the member for Batman has asked a question. As far as I know, the question was not asked of the member for Melbourne. And for that reason, I'm recognising the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Transport and Regional Services. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I thank the honourable member for his question. He's been railing on about it in this place and trying to sort of make a mountain out of a molehill. Look, uh, as the Prime Minister has made quite plain, in terms, of, um, in terms of allocations between councils within each state, let me come to that aspect of it first, within each state, they are strictly in accordance with the formula adopted by the state's grants commission. All right? uh, the state grants commissions established and applied under the previous government. And for that reason, as I said earlier, and as I said in my speech earlier in introducing this uh, a very landmark reform and initiative that any claims to suggest that allocations to councils have been manipulated to favour the electorates of government members are completely scurrilous. They're the same as the outcomes would have been under your formula. It is your formula. It is your approach. And the only other comment I've got to make, Mr Speaker, is that in relation to the historical methodology for allocating road funding, local road funding between state and territories. Uh, there, is, uh, there was uh, an Minister. approach. This, this is the answer. Deputy Prime Minister, resume his seat. Member for Batman. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the question went to between states, not between councils in a given state. The, the, Batman, the member for Batman is aware that uh, the obligation that the chair has is to ensure that the answer is relevant to the question, and the answer is entirely relevant. 
Minister. And this is the member who was in here casting dispersions on my Minister educational Minister background this morning. Uh, just coming to it. Just coming to it. You know, look. They're obviously Deputy not Leader interested of the opposition the and the member for Melbourne. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Transport and Regional Services, has the call. The historical methodology for allocating between states and territories threw up a couple of not major but significant anomalies that we felt needed to be acknowledged. The key one, to my way of thinking, was that even on the most superficial glance, South Australia was being done in the eye in terms of what we thought were important, population yeah. and road distances. Now, um, you know, in terms of the claim that the member for Batman has been running around this place, I just make the observation, so far as I know, there are no members uh, uh, of my party in South Australia. I'll just make that on the way through in terms of what he's been saying. That's dead but, right. Uh, <laughs> But, but I do just make the point that in recognition, <laughs> yeah, we'll have a go at it if you like. We'll, we'll see if we can do something about it. <laughs> but I think it would be appropriate. It would be appropriate at this stage for at least the speaker to interject and say that it would be helpful if the minister were to come to the question. Oh, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, we looked, the, the allocation is based on historical precedence, in other words, uh, the long-term approach that has been adopted, but which uh, the, member, the minister responsible for local government uh, has been uh, uh, indicating some concerns in relation to particularly South Australia, but historical precedence and the entirely legitimate form of considerations of the length of local roads and population. I just think it is scurrilous and absolutely without foundation. But perhaps most significantly, without credibility, to claim that this package is uh, a pork barrel any more than that it is, uh, it is uh, you know, a boondoggle. But, uh, Mr Speaker, you know, I think there's no doubt about it. It takes one to know one. Now, the local governments to whom this is directed, of course, have instantly recognised this is a very valuable program and one that they want. When it comes to knowing uh, the ALP's capacity to look after people uh, wherever they live in Australia, it certainly takes one to know one. And uh, Since I'm talking about South Australia, down there they have a thing called the Country Labor Association. South Australians presumably know about it. Never heard of it. Oh, well, that's a pity, because uh, uh, their highly regarded uh, uh, chief, Bill Hender, Bill Hender, has just resigned. And he resigned because he said of the ALP, the machine does not like policies which have competent, practical solutions. <laughs> He went on to say, when I resigned as president of the Country Labor Association, they had every opportunity to ask me why, but not one of them bothered. Country representatives know why. He went on to say, that, and I'm just quoting in part, uh, well, it takes one to know one. Uh, People who think they can get a better deal for Labor, he said, are in for a shock. And he went on, he claimed that Labor, he said, uh, was full of city centrics, but he corrected himself. No, he said, not even that. They're so full the of their own self-interest, the I don't think they're interested in the city either. Well, Member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Would the Minister advise what the government is doing to minimise and ultimately eliminate private health insurance medical gaps? Would the Minister also inform the House of any alternative policies to assist Australians who have private health insurance. Minister for Health and Aged Care. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. When we came to government, there were no gap cover schemes available or operating in Australia. And the gap, along with price, is one of the two biggest disincentives people have to private health insurance. We've been able to address price with the 30 per cent rebate and having two years where health fund premium increases have been very low. I have just received some very good news from the Private Health Insurance Administrative Council. We have never before kept figures on gaps. I have asked FIAC to do so, and they have given me their first report. And in the September quarter, nearly two million medical services were provided in hospital at no gap whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That is 60 per cent of all in-hospital services around Australia were on a no gap basis in the September quarter. About 12 months ago, the best estimate we can have is less than 10 per cent of in-hospital services are in no gap. In the June quarter, around 50 per cent. So this number is going up exponentially. 
In Victoria, Western Australia and South Australia, 70 per cent of in-hospital services are on a no-gap basis. No state has less than half its hospital services on a no-gap basis. Queensland and South Australia doubled the amount of no-gap services in just one quarter. Sorry, Queensland and Tasmania doubled in uh, just one quarter. We estimate that uh, it will plateau at about 70 per cent of services on a no-gap basis before the recent changes to gap cover schemes that passed through the parliament in August come into place. Those uh, will start to show in the March and June quarters next year, and we believe that we can uh, approach 80 per cent of all hospital services in Australia with no gaps whatsoever. The good news, Mr Speaker, is this has come at no cost to premiums. 70 per cent, sorry, funds representing 70 per cent of all members in Australia have already advised me they will not be applying for premium increases next year. That is, there will be at least zero for 70 per cent of members covered, and I hope the final number will be much closer to 100 per cent. So this new gap cover scheme that provides 60 per cent coverage across Australia as of uh, last quarter is at no increased premiums whatsoever. The Honourable Member asked me if there were any alternate policies to uh, assist Australians who have private health insurance. We, of course, are still waiting for this, Mr Speaker. We have had 31 press releases against the 30 per cent rebate from the opposition, not one in favour. We are happy to be judged by a record. The Honourable Member for Batman. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Minister, I refer to the road funding formula you use under the Roads to Recovery program. Minister, can you explain to the people of Tasmania why Tasmania receives only 3.3 per cent of the allocation under Roads to Recovery, whereas they receive 5.5 per cent under identified Member, local road grants? Not ask the question. Minister for Forests and Conservation was not asked for an opinion. Member for Shortland. Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Because, Mr Speaker, we took proper account of road distance, population, historical factors, and and, uh, and, uh, and Mr Speaker, uh, uh, we'll also be explaining Member to the good Grindler. people of Tasmania that it was we who delivered it, while the Leader of the Opposition doesn't believe they should get anything more for their local roads. Member for Wannan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Employment Services. And I ask the Minister, is he aware of recent conflicting public statements concerning the Work for the Dole program? What is the government's response to these statements? Minister for Employment Services. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Wannan for his question. I note that unemployment in his area has fallen from 14.1 per cent when the member for Hotham was the relevant minister. Uh, it's now 7.5 per cent, which is obviously far too high, but it's a lot better than it was in the bad old days uh, of the Labor Deputy Party's Leader government. Opposition. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, on Monday, uh, the member for Dixon said, uh, and, uh, and I quote, Labor has stated it will not abolish work for the dull. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, Labor's said it, but it hasn't meant it. It said it, but it hasn't meant it. Uh, in February, the member for Dixon said, and I quote, there are a lot of things, like work for the dull, which actually could be reformed to make sure that they provide proper training. In May, she said, uh, we do support some equivalent of the work for the dull scheme, but the current system is severely flawed. In June, she said, probably we would change the name. And Mr Speaker, on Tuesday of this week, a day after saying that she would keep the program, she says, and I quote, if the same money had been spent on training and proper work placement programs, Many millions could have been saved. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member for Dixon, she wants to change the structure of the program. She wants to change the name of the program, and she wants to redirect the funding elsewhere. In other words, she wants to abolish the program. It's a different name. It's a different structure. 
and there's no funding for it. So it will not exist. It will not exist yeah, under Labor. Of, now, Mr Speaker, of, uh, Manager of Mr. Speaker, if, uh, if, I've, has the if I've got things wrong, Mr Speaker, if yeah. I've misunderstood uh, that much wronged, the much wronged member for Dixon, if I've misunderstood her, perhaps Mr Speaker, perhaps Mr Speaker, she could call a press conference this afternoon, a full press conference, and clear things up. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Prime, Deputy Prime Minister, are you aware that, the, that your media documentation allocates full road funding for the City of Brisbane, 29 million, as new funding for the seat of Oxley? Oh, Minister, is this the same 29 million that your media documentation claims as new funding for the seat of Ryan? Minister, is this the same 29 million that your media documentation claims as the new funding for the seat of Brisbane? Minister, is this the same 29 million that your media documentation claims as new funding for each of 11 Brisbane seats? Minister, why are you misleading the people of Bowman, Brisbane, Dixon, Fadden, Griffith, Lilly, Morton, Oxley, Petrie, Rankin and Ryan by telling them they're all getting the same 29 million? <laughs> When the House has come to order, Minister, Minister for Primary Industry, Member for Hindmarsh, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, we have not misrepresented the size of the package. It's a $1.2 billion package, which you won't commit yourselves to, and to which, and to which we note to this point in time not one of you has actually joined us in insisting that your friends in the state governments of places like Tasmania actually match what we're doing for them. Now, Mr Speaker, we have listed, we have documented <laughs> not relevant. The, the, how can that, Mr Speaker, how can that possibly the, the, be not relevant? Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Leader of the Opposition Relevance, has a point Mr. of Speaker, order. Yes, relevance. He's been asked a question as to why his government has allocated the same twenty nine million in its propaganda for every one of the, of the Brisbane the opposition seats, will resume his and he seat. will not address it. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. I noted the question. The Deputy Prime Minister had been on his feet for a matter of 20 seconds. He had been talking about the question of road funding, and that was relevant to the question asked. I call the Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, there is no trickery in this at all. The fact is, the fact is that we have listed every local government area in the country. Uh, many of them do indeed overlap federal uh, electric boundaries. Well, what is Member so amazing for about that? I mean, surely, you know, everyone knows that they have local government areas. The are member left. for Charlton. Now, we have not, unlike you, unlike and unlike what some of the state ministers have suggested, we do. We haven't got the into the business of, of telling local governments where they will spend that money. That it must be allocated within the boundaries of such and such a federal electorate. We haven't gone down that road. But now, Mr. Speaker, quite simply, every member, including those opposite has a list. I haven't noticed any of them sending it back. None of them want to sort of deny the money. Have a simple list pointing to the councils the for, member which, for Charlton. which fall within their electorates, or in the case of councils which uh, overlap with other electorates, pointing to the, the sums of money that each of those councils will receive direct from the Commonwealth Government. And uh, I would have thought that was perfectly easy to disaggregate. Perfectly easy for responsible members everywhere to accurately reflect in this very widely and very well received uh, program. Mr. Speaker, it is, of the course, uh, Mr. Speaker, it remains the fact that the ALP leader has refused to endorse the package, to commit himself to it. He still believes this is a boondoggle and unnecessary. And in addition to that, they have done nothing to join us in what I would have thought would have been a spirit of. Uh, 
of, of common sense, of a commitment to economic and social reform, and calling on the state governments to match what we are doing. General Member for Menzies. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Financial Services and Regulation. Would the Minister advise the House of the consequences of the failure of the states to agree to referring corporations' law responsibility to the Commonwealth? What effect will this have on the progress of the government's corporate law reform program? And thirdly, what are the consequences for business confidence? The Minister for Financial Services and Regulation. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Menzies, who uh, certainly, as a very competent lawyer, uh, had a, would have a keen interest in this matter. Um, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the corporations' law, the Commonwealth has the same objectives today as it did when an agreement was made with the states in 1990. We want Australia's one million companies to have one rule of law, whether they be in Bendigo or Bathurst. We want Australia's millions of company employees to have the same protection under company law, whether they are based in Fremantle or Fairfield. We want Australian industries like building and construction, transport and storage, tourism and health to have the same single law apply for companies across Australia. And when it comes to Australia's seven million shareholders, we want them to have the same information in the same prospectus with the same investment returns, whether they live in Launceston or Fitzroy Crossing. And Mr Speaker, we ask why are the states determined to now put in place a new corporations law scheme that could end up with six different laws applying across Australia. Why are they prepared to do it? Mr Speaker, the states with their current proposal want the ability to cherry pick any new corporate law scheme to suit their individual purposes. And Mr Speaker, at a time when trillions of investment dollars move into companies around the world each day, we have Premier Beatty wanting the 90,000 companies in Queensland to face investment uncertainty as a result of some political stunts. In Victoria, where the member for Menzies is based, Premier Brax wants 174,000 companies there to worry more about political stunts on industrial relations than to worry about the certainty of incorporation or the cost of issuing different prospectuses with different laws right around Australia. Mr Speaker, the Commonwealth has bent over backwards to try and accommodate the states and their concerns in relation to the referral of powers. We have put in place every practical, workable safeguard they have needed to protect the intention of the referral. We have gone further in the corporations' agreement to protect the states' rights than ever before and the time has come for common sense to prevail. We stand ready, the Commonwealth stands ready, to continue to negotiate with the states in good faith. But ultimately, if the states are not willing to trade, then we are left with no option but to implement our own laws based on our own powers. Mr Speaker, 100 years ago, the states couldn't agree on a railway gauge across Australia. Today, the corporations law is as significant. It is vital that we have one system for one nation. Hear, hear. The Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Deputy Prime Minister, do you recall denying that your road package favours government members? Minister, can you confirm that there are 17 seats that receive funding of $25 million or more? Minister, is it not the case that every one of those 17 seats is held by the government? Is it also not a fact that the Northern Territory is bigger than all but one Member of them and Capricornia bigger than most of them? Member for Minister, Herbert. how can you stand by your statement that this package does not favour coalition seats? Oh. Oh. Member for Eden Monero. 
Member for Boothby. When the House has come to order, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, um, the fact is, as I said, the distribution uh, within the states is based on the State Grants Commission's formula. Who, who was it that operated that exactly as it is now for decades? They did. The, the ALP. The, ALP the Leader did. of the Opposition has asked his Mr. question. Speaker. The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Now, Mr Speaker, there's no unfairness in this. As I've quite clearly indicated, uh, both our approach and that of the State's Grants uh, Commission plainly seek to weight appropriately population and rate base. Now, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that, of course, those opposite don't hold a lot of the, large, the larger seats in this country where you have a small population base. Uh, and very large areas and long road distances, you don't hold much of that country across the nation. I, mean, I don't think it's very hard to find the reasons why. I mean, our good old friend Bill member Henderson the Northern, sort of identified the member them pretty for the well. Territory. Deputy Prime Minister, the member for McEwen. Leader of the Opposition. I take a point of order on relevance, Mr Speaker. Oh. He is clearly moving away from answering this specific question. The Northern Territory has a larger the population of the than any other seat. seat. And the Leader the of the Opposition will resume his seat by any measure. The Deputy Prime Minister was being relevant to the question asked. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I really didn't have much to add, except that you know, it is very obvious that the Leader of the Opposition has still not got the message that local roads in this country need attention. There are economic and social reasons for giving them attention. Uh, the member for Patterson understands that, but he hasn't been able to convince his leader. Now, we don't know whether he's not been able to convince Martin Ferguson, the member for Batman, of the case or whether the fact is that he has been able to convince the member for Batman that he hasn't been able to convince the Leader of the Opposition. Deputy well, Prime but, Minister, but, but the fact remains Deputy that, Prime Minister that our good no old mate— assistance from the Minister for Arts and Centenary of Federation. Our good old mate Bill Hender, uh, you know, I mean, he really had the nail on this one as well when he said, I'm getting awfully sick of the self-named Labor machine. It's shooting the messenger Deputy rather Prime Minister than accepting the message. To come to the question. Has the Deputy Prime Minister concluded his answer? Member for Page. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, representing the Minister for the Environment. Would the Minister outline to the House the benefits of the government's alternative energy bill, a renewable energy bill? bill sorry. Is the Minister aware of proposals to build co generation electricity plants in rural towns like Condong on the north coast of New South Wales? What are the implications for jobs, small businesses and the environment? In regional towns, if the bill is not passed, the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question because it draws attention to the government's very important renewable energy bill. But I'm sorry to say that Labor and Democrat senators are seeking to block this important legislation which has the potential to create between five and 10,000 jobs, many of them in regional Australia, and to result in investments of two to three billion dollars in renewable energy plants. Now, these, these plants will particularly benefit regional communities because that's where the jobs will be created. A lot of them will be dependent, and one in the northern rivers of New South Wales, one in my own electorate, uh, will use largely uh, sugarcane bagasse, but obviously uh, that is not available 12 months of the year because uh, of, of seasonal factors. And so they need to get some alternative feedstock. 
and uh, in many instances that alternative feedstock will need to be sawmill waste or some other residue. Now it seems it's this unwillingness for sawmill waste to be used but in these renewable energy plants that's causing a problem for Labor and the Democrats. They would prefer to see this waste burnt or, or lost altogether than to be used in any kind of a constructive way. Now it would be a tragedy if this important legislation, this pro-environment legislation, this legislation that's about uh, recycling and renewable energy was to be blocked by Labor and the Democrats. And, there's been, and there are a lot of concern in communities like my own in the Northern Rivers that uh, this particular pr this proposal uh, could be lost. In fact, there was a delegation uh, from the sugar industry uh, in the parliament uh, a few days ago. In my own electorate, in a couple of days, more than 2,000 signatures were collected demanding that Labor and Democrats support this, uh, support this legislation, and, uh, and, and I certainly join, that, uh, join those calls. But I'm not the only one who thinks it should be passed, and I'm sure the Honourable Member Page would also be interested to know that in the Mirabra newspaper yesterday, listen Canberra, we want the plant, the Labor candidate for Mirabra is, is quoted demanding that uh, Labor and Democrat senators not put the cogeneration plant and local jobs in, gen in, in jeopardy when voting next on the renewable energy right. bill. So many people in the Labor Party want this passed as well. And I asked the member for Patterson what's his approach to this issue because one of these plants, is, as he pointed out earlier, is proposed for his electorate as well. Is he prepared to sacrifice those regional jobs over some silly deal about green preferences? Now, we've heard a fair bit about Labor Party's preferences deals lately. This is a deal about green preferences that's prepared to sacrifice country jobs. They should get onto it, pass this bill, and allow this, this tremendous investment to proceed in regional Australia. Mr. Speaker, I ask Prime a Minister. further question to be placed in the notice paper. Treasurer. Speaker, I seek leave to add to an answer. Treasurer uh, may proceed. Mr. Speaker, um, in percentage terms, the growth in uh, net foreign debt between March 83 and March 1996 was 668%, and from March 1996 to September 2000, 52%. As a proportion of GDP, the growth between March 83 and March 1996 was 176% and between March 96 to September 2020 per cent. Mr Speaker, uh, in relation to the current account, I should uh, inform to the House that as a percentage of GDP, for the first time in nearly 30 years, Australia now has a smaller current account deficit than the United States yeah, yeah. in percentage terms. Mr Speaker, uh, this is a point which has been made uh, in the uh, BT uh, uh, report, which has been put out today by Chris Caton, who, after making the observation that for Member for the Melbourne. first time in uh, 30 years, Australia's current account— Member for Melbourne is warm. For, uh, Chris Caton, who pointed out for the first time in nigh on 30 years as percentage of GDP, Australia's current account is smaller than the, that of the United States also went on to say this. This is Chris Caton, Mr Speaker. I just want to add this to my answer. An ex-Prime Minister told me that the trade accounts will work further towards balance over the next year. That's what Mr Caton put uh, in his uh, report today, and I'm happy to make that available, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Member for Indi. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I seek leave to uh, make a personal explanation on the Does grounds that I— Does the Member that I... for Indi claim to have been misrepresented? I, I do, sir. So in an, I may proceed. Thank you, sir. In an article in The Age today headed Road Fund Claims Are Dishonest ALP, references made to me and my electorate and some other members and the announcements made by me and others on the uh, $1.2 billion Roads to Recovery program. Uh, I believe that the article uh, uh, provides an inference that uh, uh, the statements made by me as local member for Indi were inaccurate and didn't correctly state the amounts uh, granted. In fact, the art, my news release carefully stated the amounts granted. It was $23 million. Member for Indi has indicated Victoria. where he was misrepresented. Yes, sir. And um, mm. the, the uh, article does go on and say that some members were careful to correctly state it, and by inference and omission, 
omitting my name there, they therefore Member for misrepresented Inbyes my position. Member where he was misrepresented. Member for Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I wish to make a personal explanation. Is the member for Murray claimed to have been misrepresented? Most grievously. The member Mr. for Speaker. Murray may proceed. Mr Speaker, in question time today, the member for Patterson referred to an email he received from three people from the electorate of Murray. The member claimed this email was evidence of my not supporting our government's response to fuel prices. Mr Speaker, what the member failed to mention was that the email included a petition directed against me precisely because I am very actively and publicly supporting and explaining this government's policy. In fact, Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Member for Murray has the call. I'm well and truly on the public record. In fact, my, all my local media will illustrate that Member point. Member for Murray has indicated where she has been misrepresented. Thank you. Member for McEwen. Uh, Mr Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. The member for McEwen claimed to have been misrepresented. I do indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. Today, in the, uh, in the same article that the member for Indi referred to, the article by Annabel Crabb, I have been misrepresented on two counts. One in relation to the, the inference about the 26 million road funding that uh, uh, was made available across the shires in my electorate. I went to great detail, Mr Speaker, to say that my electorate had access to that funding. It is also indicated that I have ten— The member for McEwen has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I will— Thank you, Mr Speaker. It has also, in this article, indicated that I have ten councils. In fact, I have eight, and I can tell you that all eight think that this funding package the is member fantastic. Member McEwen has indicated where she has been misrepresented. The member for Burke is only being denied the call by the antics of some on my left. Member for Hunter might confer on the other side of that aisle. Member for Burke. Mr Speaker, yesterday uh, after question time I took a point of order and in the, uh, in the discussions that ensued when you were faced with a number of points of order you didn't actually rule on the, or, or comment on the point of order I raised with you. It's in relation to Standing Order 78 which states that when the attention of the speaker is drawn to words used, he or she shall determine whether or not they are offensive or disorderly. I pointed out yesterday that in my experience in the House, whenever a member had uh, asked the speaker to take action because the member found a particular term offensive, it had been my long-standing experience that the speaker always required the offender to withdraw as a courtesy to the member. The events that have taken place today give me to wonder whether or not you have actually now moved in your interpretation of that practice by the Speaker, and that's the question that I'm asking you. When I responded yesterday, I, um, from memory I was responding to both members for Newcastle and Burke, but if I didn't respond accurately to the member for Burke's, inquiry, I'm happy to indicate to him that there has been no change in my attitude or approach. If I consider, a, obviously, if I consider a term is by precedent unparliamentary, then there seems to be a sort of instant judgment from the member for Lyons, so that no matter whether one has completed a statement or not, he is determined whether guilty or innocent, regardless of the completion of the statement. So that if a term is unparliamentary, clearly there is an obligation on anyone who uses that term to withdraw it. If a term causes offence, it's up, for the, up to the occupier of the chair to determine whether or not it's appropriate that that, chair, that term should be withdrawn, depending on the nature of the term. That is not a new rule. You'll find that my predecessors made similar rulings, and I'm happy to check the rulings and come back to the member for Burke, but to answer his question as briefly as I can, Obviously, I require all unparliamentary terms to be withdrawn, and as is often the case during my stewardship of this chair, I have asked members who have used terms that are not unparliamentary 
but that I've been deemed to be undesirable to simply exercise a little more uh, restraint. Member for, Member for Burke. Can I make a, uh, a further request of you in respect of that, and I appreciate the fact that you're going to come back to me on it, just to, uh, I guess, refine what it is I'm, I'm specifically asking. The, the practice in the past, and, and as, has, as happened in this situation yesterday, uh, as you explained and everybody accepted, the, uh, you actually misinterpreted the comments that were made and therefore weren't in a position at that point to determine whether they were offensive or not. The situation that occurred was that the member, in this case uh, the member for Dixon, was offended and drew your attention to the fact that she was offended and asked for the words to be withdrawn. It's been my experience that in that situation the Speaker has always asked the offender to do that. And that's what I'm specifically asking. Are you now moving away from that common practice that, in a situation like that, the Speaker generally insists that the words be withdrawn? I um, refer the member for Burke to his statement generally, and that is, of course, if a member finds words offensive, I would require they be withdrawn. In the instance he cites, as every member in the House is aware, and as the public ought to be aware, the minister had, who had made those particular remarks when they were brought to, when I became aware of the possible inference in those remarks, the minister was no longer in the chamber, and it was for that reason that I required him to return this morning. I didn't necessarily require him to withdraw the remarks. I would draw the attention of all members of the House to the hand of this morning's comments by that minister. Uh, and I will come back to the member for Burke because it is not my intent that anything that causes as much offence as that occurred to the member for, as that caused the member for Dixon should remain on the record. The member for Braddon. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I wonder if you would consider uh, introducing digital clocks uh, into the chamber to assist members and staff to clearly and quickly determine the time. Such clocks exist in the main committee and are much easier to read than the clocks in this chamber. It's not. I understand the member for Braddon's inquiry, and I will, in fact, respond to him when I have an opportunity. Member for Braddon, I'd. In my experience as, a, as a, an occupier of one of the seats in this House, I did not find the present arrangement at all inconvenient. I am therefore not inclined to facilitate a change, but if he were to raise the matter with the Procedure Committee and they were to make such a, such a recommendation, I would consider it. I present the Auditor General's audit reports for 2000-2001, number 18, Performance Audit, Reform of Service Delivery of Business Assistance Programs, Department of Industry, Science and Resources, and number 20, Performance Audit, Second Tranche Sale of Telstra Shares. The Leader of the House. Move that the reports be printed. The question is that the reports be printed. All those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, papers are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. De full details of these papers will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. I move that the House take note of papers numbers uh, one, two, three and four. The Manager of Opposition Business. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. The adjourned debate be made in order of the day. For a future sitting, all those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No ministerial statements. I received a letter from the honourable member for Bowman proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the continuing failure of the government to establish a judicial inquiry into the growing revelations concerning Australia's immigration reception processing centres. I call upon those members who approve the proposed discussion 
to rise in their places. The honourable member for Bowman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is not an issue about politics. It's not an issue about point scoring, as no doubt the Minister for Immigration would like it to make people think. This goes to the very question as to whether Minister Ruddock has the capacity to manage his portfolio. Let us put aside the Minister's inaction and his blinkered attitude to date on the numerous allegations that have been made with respect to the alleged incidents at the Woomera Detention Centre. On this occasion, I would implore the Minister to put aside his pride, to put aside his blind adherence to bureaucratic processes and start to think seriously about the numerous allegations that are surfacing with respect to the incidents at the Woomera Detention Centre on a day-to-day -day basis. These people who are making these allegations, Minister, uh, are brave, credible people who obviously feel so strongly about what has happened that they are prepared to put their credibility on the line and if you are to believe some of them, I am told possibly even exposing themselves to possible retribution. I am aware that there are many others who are prepared to come forward and tell similar stories if it were not for the confidentiality clauses in terms of their employment and because they are concerned in terms of what could happen to them. The Minister for Immigration defends these allegations by saying that they are, there are avenues available for people with complaints. He says that they should report matters to the police or to the Department of Family and Youth Services in, in Adelaide. Now, if he really thinks that, and he again said that today here in this House, then he's living in fairyland. If this minister was one allegation, I can understand your view. Of course, then, go to the appropriate place where you can complain. If it was two allegations, again, go to one of these state instrumentalities or some other organisation. Even if it was three, I put it to you that maybe your answer would be appropriate. But, Minister, at this point in time, we are now at a point where there seems to be allegations of systemic abuses at the Woomera Detention Centre. People are frightened of retribution and are not making reports. And given what we are hearing about the culture at Woomera, is it any wonder that they are frightened to make these reports? To date, the opposition, believing that the minister has erred badly in his handling of these issues, has, if you like, pursued these matters in the parliament. For instance, he's having to be dragged into kicking and screaming to establish a limited inquiry with very limited terms of reference. He only acted, indeed, when the media broke the story. And even then, it was eight months after a document, evidently an incident report, was made, and he found out about it supposedly eight months later. And I believe him that he found out eight months later. But I say to the minister, someone has let you down badly. Because the fact is, is that you made this decision, if you like, to have this limited terms of inquiry only after you were forced into it by the fact that the media reported the, rape, the alleged rape of a 12-year-old boy. Then having found that document, having been made aware of that document, you then decided that you would call for a limited inquiry. We also are led to believe during the course of the week that the minister had not received a letter that was sent by Mary Lindsay by fax to Mr Smith, the, the uh, uh, director of the Department of Immigration in, in Adelaide, dated the 18th of April. And in that letter, she specifically made the assertion that she had heard that there had been some problems with respect to a young boy. Now, again, I accept that the minister uh, had not seen that letter until that particular day. That is the day that I tabled it in this House, a couple of days ago. But, Minister, what was the result of that inadvertence? What was the result of whoever it was, <coughs> either the department or one of your own offices in your, in your uh, own uh, uh, office, somebody did not give you that information. Somebody either covered up this particular incident report or for some reason didn't give it to you. What was the result of that? It wasn't just one of those matters where you can say, oh, well, these things happen. 
The result is that a 12-year-old boy was left in the environment and the custody of the person and in that environment where he was being sexually abused for another eight months. I mean, this is what we're talking about here. This is why I started off my MPI by saying this is not about whether I'm having a go at the minister or the minister's having, you know, trying to protect somebody. The fact is, this is about real people. In fact, this is about a little child of 12 years old. The result of this inaction, of this inadvertence, of this cover-up, call it what you will, has been that this young kid has been left in the hands of the person who allegedly raped him for an extra eight months. I'm not blaming you, Minister, for that, not personally. But I'm saying that something is terribly wrong, something is terribly wrong and needs to be looked at. Indeed, I think those of you that are involved in any sense in, say, family law or in problems between husbands and wives will know that if any allegations at all are made to a judge that one or other of the parties is somehow molesting one of the children, immediately the benefit of the doubt is given to the welfare of that child. And what happens is that that person is taken away, the child is taken away and put in some sort of custody. You don't take risks. So in other words, I would presume that if that incident report at the time had been made known to the South Australian police and to the authorities, then most probably they would not have given the benefit of the doubt and they would have probably put that young, young child in, in, uh, in protective custody, where I understand that he was taken last uh, Monday week. So, Mr, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, even after all, all of these, even after the minister is aware of all these facts, reading about it in the newspapers on a day-to-day -day basis, even after this the minister calls some sort of a press briefing and extols the virtues and heaps praise on Australasian correctional management and says that they are doing a wonderful job under the circumstances. In fact, journalists rang me to say, you've got no idea how effusive the minister was in heaping praise on Australian correctional management. Now, the fact is, is that why are these people all coming out? We'll pursue these issues at a later time, Minister. But for now, what is in issue is the minister's, through you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the minister's ability to handle the situation. He must, if he has any idea of doing the right thing, set up an inquiry with full powers, including compulsion and protection of witnesses. Even though the results of that inquiry may be embarrassing to you, to other people, and perhaps to your government, it's the right thing to do. Now, that's not just the opposition calling for this. It's not the opposition. It is a lot of people out there in the community. And I just want to read uh, into the record just a few of the editorials that I've seen today. One from the advertiser. The minister laughs. The minister laughs. This is not a laughing matter, minister. I'm trying to be informed as far as you're concerned, but this is what these editorials say. This is the Adelaide Advertiser today, Thursday, the 30th of November. And it's headed, the fair go should apply at Woomera. The allegations about criminal behaviour at the Woomera Detention Centre, where illegal migrants are held, are deeply disturbing, but their veracity is yet to be tested. This is Australia, and the most excited complainant deserves a fair hearing. When the accusations are in effect about rape and brutality, posturing and half-measure responses are simply inadequate. The basic approach of Federal Immigration Minister Philip Ruddick marks him as a follower, not a leader in this matter. And it goes on. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I say to the Minister, be a leader on this issue. If you don't think that there is anything to worry about, what are you frightened of? Why are you giving such uh, this inquiry that you've set up, this investigation, such limited terms of reference without any real powers? Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I now go to the Sydney Morning Herald of today. That's today, the editorial, Thursday the 30th. And it says, inefficient inquiry. Even before it begins, the inquiry prompted by allegations of child abuse in the Woomera Immigration Detention Centre is flawed. The terms of reference announced by the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs, Mr Ruddick, are too narrow. But that goes on to talk about questions of bias, which I don't particularly want to, uh, want to read. Mr Flood's inquiry, goes on, will also be fatally flawed by its limited powers. 
It will not, it seems, have the power to compel witnesses to appear and answer questions, and most important, to protect them. Already potential witnesses have reportedly said that they would not appear before the inquiry out of fear of possible retribution. The announced terms of reference are narrow, confined to the processes for identifying, dealing with, reporting on and following up allegations, instances or situations where there is reasonable suspicion of child abuse in immigration detention centres. The inquiry will look at the manner in which these processes were followed in cases during the past year. The editorial goes on to say, but Mr Flood has not been asked to determine whether the serious allegations of criminal behaviour at the Woomera Detention Centre of rape and sexual abuse of a 12-year-old boy and sexual abuse of women have substance. It is imperative to establish these fundamental questions, especially in view of the persistent suggestions that the allegations are baseless or arise from confused complainants from the boy or confused complaints from the boy and the young women concerned that are really the result of being traumatised by other factors such as harrowing experiences uh, of, or, 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 uh, or, otherwise, or uh, being traumatised by other factors uh, and, and in relation to their journey to Australia. In the terms of reference, the case currently under investigation by the South Australian Family and Youth Service is mentioned. This appears to have been the case of the 12-year-old boy. And it goes on. And it says the public must have confidence in the operation of the Woomera Centre run by the Australian Correctional Centre Management. The public needs reassurance that the policy of privatising such a function as immigration detention is working and the principle of detaining asylum seekers is sound. For that, a wider and more powerful inquiry is needed. Anything less will simply store up trouble for the government, as well, of course, an incomplete inquiry may also leave it risk the health and well-being of people in custody for whom the government ultimately is responsible. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Sydney Morning Herald's article is spot on, mainly because it's talking about the people. And I'm talking here about the possibility of the problems that we have with underage children. There's little doubt now that there is a major crisis in the management of Australia's immigration detention centres, and in particular the Woomera Centre by the Australasian Correctional Management. ACM contracts, for instance, stipulate the provision of clothing, yet the company went to St Vincent de Paul seeking free garments, disadvantaging both the charity's needy clients as well as the detainees. I won't have the time today, but there is a very good article in today's advertiser, which actually, by, by political reporter Susie O'Brien, I think it was yesterday, yesterday's advertiser, the company, manager, the company managing the Woomera Detention Centre approached charity groups last year for free clothing for detainees, and it goes on. Whereas we understand at the end it says, but Mr Raddick, Mr Raddick acknowledged it was contracted to provide complete service, including food, clothing and shelter. So we have a situation here where these people are going with the begging bowl to places like St Vincent de Paul, trying to get free clothes, which they're getting paid for by this government, and this government says they're fantastic. I mean, it just beggars belief that this minister is that gullible that he would actually believe that. ACM's failure to provide properly trained medical staff to treat detainees. We saw yesterday lead story on the ABC News where a nurse who worked at the centre said that, that psychiatric uh, uh, nurses or someone who supposedly was a psychiatric nurse but didn't have the appropriate qualifications were giving out um, poison S4 uh, prescription drugs, administering them. I mean, it is just unbelievable, Minister, that you say that there is nothing wrong. Now, I want to make this point before I close. I know that there's not a lot of sympathy out there in the Australian community for people that jump queues, that come here unlawfully. I know that. And I know now that for some time this minister has believed that by being able, by demonising a lot of these people, by sort of giving them these temporary protection visas, not giving them any services, etc., that that might have been popular out in the Australian community. And I mean, yeah, he may well have been right at that time. But I put it to you, Minister, I put it to you through you, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Australian public has a heart. They do not like to read reports about young children being abused. They do not like to see human beings being treated in this way. And now that you have the opportunity to renegotiate your contract with Australian, Australasian Correctional Management, I put it to you that you, you should look seriously at their performance. And I put it to you that these people that are making these complaints have a right to have their 
grievances aired before a full judicial inquiry with all the powers available to them to compel witnesses and to protect witnesses. And if you don't do that, Minister, you are failing Order. in your obligation the as Minister Member's for Immigration. Has expired. I call the Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, um, I would hope that honourable members who are so enthusiastic about these matters might wait to hear some more balanced discussion. It's a pity to see so many of them scurrying out so quickly. Um, let me. They want one side of the story. Um, can I just deal with the uh, issue of agendas? Uh, I, I've been thinking very seriously about why these issues are raised in the way in which they are and why the opposition is pursuing them in the way in which they are. Uh, the opposition makes it clear that they see mandatory detention as an important public policy. And I think the reason that this shadow minister takes that view is that he believes that it would be electorally unpopular were he to do anything else. I don't know that it's in his heart uh, to uh, keep before him uh, the reasons why these policies are pursued, the reasons why these policies are pursued are to ensure that there is a system of integrity in relation to the way in which people enter Australia and stay here, um, and to ensure that we are able to look after the most needy people in relation to uh, uh, our refugee and humanitarian program. Um, why? The Shadow Minister made it clear the other day in answer to an interjection. Um, his agenda is to unwind the privatisation, as he sees it, of the, uh, of the detention system. And uh, he made it very clear that was what his agenda is. And uh, he asks why other people um, should have any other agenda. Uh, I don't want to speculate as to what all the agendas might be. But when I know there are something like 63 nurses who have been at Woomera and uh, one or two people are pursuing matters and have pursued them over a long period of time, I ask myself whether they do have any other agenda. Um, and have they, have they sought other positions and been disappointed? Have they sought other positions and been disappointed? Um, are there issues um, of the sort of character that we see so often in the, uh, in the, in the industrial movement? Uh, where people believe that if you pursue a matter in this way, um, you can get a particular outcome. Now, um, let me. Well, I think the evidence will be seen um, in terms of the uh, nature of the allegations that are being made, and I'll deal with those in detail in a moment. The shadow minister said I'd been dragged, kicking and screaming, in relation to uh, the establishment of the uh, flood review. Look, the reason um, that I established the flood review was because. Um, on the day before, in fact the evening before I made the announcement, um, I learnt that there was a document which should have been before Family and Community Services and which they said was germane uh, to their inquiries um, and which uh, uh, was not before them at that time. And I certainly believe the, uh, uh, the procedures deficient and in need of examination. And that's why the inquiry, that's why the inquiry um, has, been, has been launched. But if you look at the substantial issues that have been raised, and, uh, and, and because I think it's important to characterise the allegations that have been made uh, to date, um, in terms of all of the statements in the press that I've read, all of the statements from the member opposite. The first, well, he says there are a lot more to come. Well, look, if it's a drip, 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 and you've got allegations and information before you that relates to the safety of individuals and is of a substantial character and you haven't put it before the police or the relevant authorities and you're holding it up for a drip, 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 that would be the most highly irresponsible and I think the most callous approach that any member of this parliament could take. And it demonstrates that what you're about is a political agenda. That's what it's about. Drip, drip, drip. That's what he said. That's what he said. He knows. He knows. Drip, drip, drip. Well, let's look at the substance. Let's look at the substance. Well, don't take up my time. The Honourable Minister will resume his seat. The Minister for I, I, I seek him to withdraw those statements about callous. I seek him to withdraw that because the reality is that the statement I have made is on the basis of the people are coming to me every day and giving me new information.
Ora! But that a member for Burke, let it be quite clear that the decision as to whether anything is offensive rests with the chair. And on this occasion, I do not require the minister to withdraw. The minister has the call. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I wanted to deal with the substance, the allegations that are in the public arena. First, in relation to a young boy, 12 years old. <coughs> the allegation, raped by his father and sold to other detainees for cigarettes. An allegation relating to the boy was referred to the South Australian Police, who investigated the matter and found no basis upon which charges could be laid, nor to remove the boy into care. It was also referred to the uh, South Australian Family and Youth Services Department, which conducted a joint investigation with the South Australian Police. Again, uh, the outcome was no charges. The matter was reopened two weeks ago, yeah, and the investigation money. remains current. And qu quite frankly, it is the only matter that is presently under investigation. Um, and while I don't know the result of that inquiry, um, I suggest that it would be far better for the honourable member to wait until it is available. Because let me say, if the inquiry does show that the initial decisions were right, um, you haven't got a feather to fly with. Now, in relation to the, in relation to, no, order. No, the member for Bayman has had no, his chance. No, the minister the inquiry will ignore by the, the Department of Family the and Youth Services, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, by competent officers, well trained, um, who are taking a great deal of care in relation to this matter. Now, the 15-year-old male being mutually or being sexually abused. The matter was referred to the South Australian Police and FAES, who found no basis for charges, and they are the appropriate authorities. They are the appropriate authorities. A, re a report of a young girl being sexually abused in April. The matter was investigated by police, who found no basis for charges. Police and FAES are the appropriate authorities. An allegation that young girls were being engaged in a brothel. No names, dates or any information has been offered to authorities to investigate it. That a nurse was raped by an ACM officer, not, not, on, not on site, but presumably in Woomera. Well, no report or complaint was made to the police by the alleged victim. Uh, but according to the, uh, uh, the member for uh, Bowman, uh, colleagues knew of the attack. Well, the police are the appropriate authority to deal with it. Now, let, let's deal with some of the other statements that have been picked up. Because this, 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 this gives you this gives you this gives you this gives you the genesis of the sorts of complaints that we're dealing with. Food. You remember the speech two days ago? Babies were fed rice and cabbage and were treated in hospital for malnourishment. That's, that, well, you said they are the allegations. That's right. Now let's deal with the allegations in relation to that matter. No child has been admitted to Woomera Hospital or to the other hospitals suffering malnutrition. That is the uh, uh, yes. No children have been admitted to Woomera or Oxley Downs, Roxbury Downs, Roxbury Downs for gross malnourishment ostensibly as a result of poor quality food provided. But as I was there yesterday, and I'm supposed to have been vigorously defending ACM, let me say, let me put before him what I would have put if he'd asked me a question on the matter. The menus, the menus, the handwritten menus for the period of um, 1st uh, January 2000, which detail the sorts of meals that people get at breakfast, cereal, toast, milk, uh, tea, jam, infant. Well, you can go through and you can deal with it in relation to infants. Infants get infants' food, or they're on the mother's breast, or they get bottled food. No, they give them the appropriate food. But let me just say, if you go through, there are the menus, uh, and, and not only do they have a menu for, uh, for for November, but also the menu for Ramadan, which I table. I mean, there there is enormous sensitivity in the way in which these issues are dealt with. Then there are the statements about unqualified nurses treating patients. Well, 63 nurses have been employed at Woomera, 52 have been confirmed as registered in South Australia, and checks are being made on the balance. When they advertise, they ask for registered nurses. And in relation to those that come forward, some of them are interstate. And there is a short interregnum before people get their qualifications um, transferred to the relevant state in which they are working in. But unregistered nurses can still perform medical tasks providing they don't con uh, contravene uh, the registration requirements. Then there is the intimidation of contracted staff wanting to report child abuse. Now, many staff have both a legal and a moral obligation to report. There is no option. And uh, reports, to the, to, reports to the 
Family and Youth Services Department, their abuse line, and the pamphlet is here, which I table, makes it very clear that people who report to that line are anonymous. That is, the person reporting is not revealed to the accused. And, and, and so that information is quite clear. I mean, if people are claiming sexual abuse, why didn't they report it? And why have they left it, as the honourable member says, for eight months? If these are, if these are professional people making their, their their judgments in relation to this, these matters, they have a lawful responsibility to bring that information forward. And eight months, eight months down the track, eight months down the track, you know, the judgment you want to put on me, you're saying, is totally unreasonable to ask of anybody else. Order. The honourable minister will resume his seat. The member for Bowman has exhausted his deposit of goodwill from the chair. From now on, he will be silent, or he will leave the chamber. The minister has the call. Well, let me just deal with the uh, final matter, Mr Deputy Speaker. Information withheld or removed from files. I mean, that is the one matter that I think uh, Mr Flood would be able to deal with. And if it involves uh, particularly medical mal malpractice, um, those are issues that can be reported to relevant health authorities, uh, others like the Ombudsman and the like. Now, I make these points because if you look at the evidence, if you look at the evidence, if you look at the evidence and you go through it, um, there, have been, there have been reports, they have been investigated, um, and, uh, and let me make it very clear. I mean, I am not trying to protect anybody in relation to this. If, if people who have a responsibility for dealing with these matters, um, the police, family and youth services believe charges should be brought, whether they're against detainees or others, those charges will be brought, as they were in Curtin, as they were in Curtin, in, um, in, in Western Australia. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I want to uh, call. deal with, in the uh, time that remains, um, with some allegations that were again repeated today, on which the eight months was based. That is the letter from Mary Lindsay, because there is some information that has come to me from the head of the uh, firm. McPherson and Kelly, um, that employed her um, when they were in, uh, when they were in, when she was in in, in Woomera, um, and and she is one of the principals uh, uh, in terms of informing their member opposite. And I'll just read from the letter because the letter, un understand understandably, um, is the letter understandably deals with the issues that are germane to this very question. Um, he said, I think it's relevant for you to know that Ms Lindsay was contracted by my firm between the 4th of April and the 12th of April to assist us with Task Force 32 at Woomera. That was the first and last occasion in which we used her services. I was present at Woomera during the processing of this task force, and although Ms Lindsay had complaints about the inability of detainees to communicate with their families, she did not then or at any time mention to me any concern about sexual or other abuse of children in the centre. I understand that Ms Lindsay took it upon herself to speak to the DEMA manager at the centre on an occasion about improving the facilities for detainees to communicate with their families. She contacted me after the task force and informed me it was intention to write to you about these concerns. I wrote to you at the time disassociating my firm from any comments she may have made concerning the conditions of Woomera on the basis that she was not authorised by my firm to make comments that had not been first cleared by me. To the best of my knowledge, Ms Lindsay did not raise any concerns about maltreatment of children with any other members of the team which handled Task Force 32. Had she done so, we would have immediately taken the matter up with Deem, a manager at the centre. Until the current allegations arose in the media, none of us at McPherson and Kelly had received any information from detainees or from any other source about child abuse at Woomera or any other immigration detention centre. I note that the letter allegedly written by Ms Lindsay claims that she heard about the alleged sexual abuse last Friday, which Mr Shacker calculated was the 14th of April. This was two days after Ms Lindsay's return to Adelaide, and consequently the source of this information is to be questioned. She also apparently noted that other reps at the camps had genuine concerns about children being sexually abused, yet on bringing these to concerns and those of heads of firms, they've been advised not to get involved. As I mentioned, no such report was made to me at any time. I also note. Um, with interest that Ms Lindsay's claims to have expressed her grave concerns to the head of ACM at Woomera when she heard about a similar case involving a young boy. In my opinion, it is not likely she spoke to the ACM officer or anybody else about such matter, given that she did not mention it to me and admits that she did not become aware of the matter until the 14th of April when she was back in Adelaide. Now, look, I mention those matters because um, it goes to the credibility of the sources that the member wants. Now, 
There are motives involved in this. The member has admitted it. He has a motive. And why does he want this sort of inquiry? Because he wants to parade a whole host of unsubstantiated allegations in the public arena for the purpose of discrediting a whole lot of professional people, a whole lot of professional people whose, whose careers and futures depend upon them carrying out um, their obligations professionally and appropriately. Order. The Honourable Minister's time has expired. <coughs> Before I call the next speaker in the discussion, I noted during the minister's address that he tabled several documents which, which he should have sought leave. I understand he implied that he should seek leave. Is leave granted? Absolutely. I thought the member for Bowman would be cooperative. I call the honourable member for Fowler. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak on this matter of public importance concerning the government's failure to establish a judicial inquiry into the revelations concerning the immigration reception centres around the country. Mr Deputy Speaker, behind the issue that the House is considering today is one very important concern. It is a concern that I am sure that the Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs does not take lightly, nor should he. The minister proudly wears his Amnesty International badge, a badge whose symbol is barbed wire. Yet, at any given time, he is responsible for the well-being of thousands of people who have been deprived of their liberty, people who have not committed a crime, people who have been forced by circumstances that few of us here could even begin to understand, people who have sought shelter from oppression people who have sought sanctuary in Australia, and we should not forget over 90 per cent, over 90 per cent of whom will become permanent residents in Australia. The minister has a responsibility to those people. He has a responsibility for their well-being. He has a responsibility for their safety, and he has a responsibility to ensure that they are treated fairly in having their case heard before the tribunals. The fact that he wears the badge of Amnesty International makes those responsibilities personal as well as legal responsibilities. When you deprive a person of their liberty, when you lock them away behind barbed wire, you take away their ability to help themselves. You take away their rights to access help and you make them totally dependent on you for their care. You can't pass the buck. If something happens to them while they are in your care, you are responsible. That has to be the principle under which the Department of Immigration and Multicultural Affairs operates. And you have to be open about it. You have to be accountable. You have to be accountable to the parliament and to the people of Australia. And because the people you are dealing with are not citizens of Australia, you have to be accountable. You have to, Minister, be accountable to the international bodies. Accountability, Mr Deputy Speaker, means being open. It means allowing the people of Australia and the world access to what is going on behind the barbed wire of detention centres. Accountability is not something you can contract out with a commercial inconfidence clause. It is not something that you can hand over to a public relations firm. These are the snivelling excuses that a coward, a coward hides behind. And when it comes to being accountable, you can't get away with a whitewash investigation. In Australia, the standard for accountability is a judicial inquiry. Only the judici judiciary has the credibility to conduct an inquiry into matters which may involve the serious breaches alleged to have occurred. Anything less will be seen as a whitewash. If that happens, then Australia's immigration policy practices will be rightly seen as a sham, as a sham minister by the international community. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, any investigation of alleged incidents must be seen against a backdrop of the develop development of detention centres, or to give them their quaint little, their quaint title, immigration reception processing centres. It is true that such centres have been a reality of immigration policies throughout the term of many successive governments. But this government and this minister have taken the development of detention centres way beyond anything we have seen in this country before. 
And why is it that we now have thousands of people detained in the most remote parts of Australia, thousands of kilometres from the tribunals which will hear their case, far from the legal representatives who will argue their case, far from the cities, Minister, far Minister. from the cities in which 90 per cent of them will eventually settle? It's part of a deliberate policy designed to pander to a racist minority in the Australian electorate. In a government driven by opinion polls, the comments coming out of the focus groups provides the basis for this government's policy. And this minister, despite his claims to the principles of Amnesty International, is the willing servant of the government in implementing this policy. Now, I'm sure members will be familiar with the solution proposed by some citizens to deal with people seeking refuge in Australia. There are those who would send out the Navy to sink the boats and drown their occupants before they reach our shores. The minister does not go that far, but this government's policies are the nearest thing. They are the nearest thing. When it comes to people arriving in Australia without the required authority, this policy makes life so difficult and uncomfortable that it is a deterrent to anyone considering it. Having visited a number of detention centres, including those in Port Headland, along with the member for Hindmarsh and in Broome, at Curtin and Darwin and at Villawood, I would have to say they would be best described as deterrent centres rather than detention centres. So while the great majority of people detained in those centres have committed no crime, while they have not been sentenced as punishment, the government has to use the centres as a deterrent to those who would seek to come to Australia. While the department put together videos showing, now we all remember the videos that the department put together, showing sharks, crocodiles, snakes and spiders, the real deterrent it hopes is that word will get back to the countries from which asylum seekers come, uh, which describes the detention centres as horror camps. If that was what the minister intended then, for some he may have succeeded. As anyone who has spoken to refugees who know that they have to put up with such much worse. Many have already risked their lives in unsafe and uncrowded boats to get here. So just how far will the minister go to deter asylum seekers? What horrors can he dream up that will cause asylum seekers to avoid Australia? Given the sort of responses he must get from his opinion polling, he probably thinks he can get away with anything. But I wonder if those same Australians would see things differently if they or a member of their family were to be treated by a foreign government in the same way that they would, would treat asylum seekers. Some years ago, Mr Deputy Speaker, I had the misfortune uh, to have my passport and travel documents stolen while I was overseas. I can tell you that it can be quite frightening trying to convince officials that you are a tourist. Fortunately, I was able to get my passport back and continue on my journey. I was grateful that the people I dealt with were helpful, but I can imagine the difficulty I might have faced if it was for some uh, people in the world that wouldn't have allowed it. Those thoughts crossed my mind. Listen to this, Minister. Those thoughts crossed my mind when I visited a detention centre recently. I noticed. Listen to this. I noticed a young woman about the same age as my daughter who had arrived in Australia by air, by air, not by boat, by air, without documents. When I saw the conditions in which she was being detained, and the member for High March saw them as well, I couldn't help but think that if this was happening to the daughter of an Australian citizen, there would be a great outcry against this uncivilised treatment of one of our own. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, this really is the whole point of this debate. While we set out to deter asylum seekers, we create conditions which are totally unacceptable in a civilised world. For some, Order. this is justified, but that justification amounts to nothing less than racism. We are prepared to treat others in ways that we would condemn if they were suffered by one of our own. Mr Deputy Speaker, to avoid such accusations, we must make it clear to Australians and the world that, we, that when we deprive people of their liberty, we do so only on reasonable grounds and that, having detained them, we apply the highest standards of care. To show that we are accountable, 
We need to have our system open, open to credible investigation. No cover-ups, Minister. No public relations firms putting the big spin on events. We need to examine any allegations openly. In short, Mr Deputy Speaker, we need to have a judicial inquiry into these events in our immigration reception processing centres. And in the short time that I have, Mr Deputy Speaker, I say to the Minister for in, uh, Immigration, I say to you as a mother, to a father, to a grandfather, what that 12-year-old boy had to put up with. I'm telling you, no child of mine or yours, you wouldn't like to see that happen. So please, on behalf of, uh, of this uh, government, allow a full, a full judicial inquiry. The Oh, order. The Honourable Member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And before I address some of the allegations by the Shadow Minister, some of the shameful allegations, I should like to refer to the speech by the member for Fowler, who, did I hear it right, just condemned the facilities that she said she'd visited? Yet I have in front of me a report signed off by the member of Fowler, which says um, the committee, which I believe she was a member of, believes that Australia's detention administration is appropriate and professional. It is currently handling the demands of unprecedented numbers of arrivals. Well, is there a minority report from the member for Fowler disagree? Is there one dissenting voice from the member of Fowler? No, there is not. And what about another page? page paragraph 1210. Overall, the committee believed the facilities provided were adequate, that the cultural sensitivities of detainees were being accommodated. The committee was convinced that Australia was taking seriously its responsibilities for those in its care, whether or not they were expected to gain visas. What a humbug she is. The committee was aware that some facilities and services made available to detainees represented a desire. I notice the member doesn't want to hear the words she signed off onto and has left the chamber. A shame that she should so now in the line of political expediency, deny her own words in this report, a report she signed off onto and which said everything at the centres is fine. But now, to back up this shadow minister at this table, the shadow minister who shamelessly has brought forth totally and utterly unsubstantiated allegations, and he sits there and brings this country into disrepute on the basis of nothing that has been proved. And if you went in the community right now, you Order. would hear beliefs in the community Order. The Honourable based members for solely and on Blair. what this shameless shadow minister has done for purely political reasons. Have a look Order. at this speech that he made in this House. This hypocritical, incredibly dangerous minister. What were the charges he made? He said this government is guilty of fostering a culture of mistreatment of detainees, that asylum seekers are treated worse than the most dangerous criminals in jail. This is what he is saying to the people in this community. But worse than that, this shadow minister made specific, specific allegations in this parliament against the, the detention centres. He made an allegation about a 15-year-old boy. He raised that question again today, an allegation that a 15-year-old boy had been sexually mistreated and raped. And yet that in, has already been investigated by the South Australian police and by FAES, and they said there was no reason for action. He has raised a case that has been investigated and thrown out. What else has he raised? He has raised the story of the 12-year-old boy. That has already been investigated, but as the minister said, it has been returned to FaZe and South Australian police to reinvestigate it, having already been investigated by FaZe and SAPOL. 
Then there was the allegation that a brothel had been run. That was an allegation by the minister Order. with absolute no minister evidence and, and no proof has come up. Order. But let us now take the minister's own words. He said, no baby food at Woomera until July this year. If young infants were not breastfeeding, they were given cabbage and rice. Many would not eat because it was horrible. Shall we actually have a look at what, the, uh, what is actually happening? Yeah. Babies yeah. are either breastfed or bottle fed. When infants commence on solids, they are provided with typical baby food, as they are in the Australian community, such as rice cereal, stewed fruits and custards. I am also informed by the department who I rang and got the information for, the same way the shadow minister could have got the information if he wanted real information and just didn't want to come in here and raise these false allegations. And the department says to me that the Woomera has carried canned baby food and infant formula since it was established, and it was noteworthy that of the 12 nurses on staff four or five had special nursing qualifications. So what other allegations did this shameful man make, this shameful shadow minister? He said, we had to admit some very young Order. The children into the Order. The Honourable Member for will resume her seat. Order. The Honourable Member for Bowman. I find, I find the remarks of shameful offensive. And she has repeated it two or three times. I know she doesn't know what she's talking about, Order. but at least she can the play the issue, not Order. the man. The Honourable Member for Bowman will resume his seat. Order. The Honourable Member for Cook. To, to progress this discussion, I would ask the Honourable Member for Highmarsh to withdraw that remark. There was no remark against the minister. There were shameful allegations, Order. and they are, Mr Deputy Order. Speaker. So Order. to progress Order. this debate, in your words, I withdraw. The Honourable Member for Hindmarsh. Thank you. That, uh, the second one, that some young children in, admitted into Roxby Down Hospital because of gross malnourishment. They were officially admitted for anaemia. He says they were officially admitted for anaemia. Well, the truth is no such admittance has ever happened. This is a shameful base allegation by this minister. And he talks about what has happened here as if somehow this government has changed a process that was set in train by the Labor government. And may I uh, just quote uh, the member for Fowler referred to Port Hedland, the setting up of Port Hedland and Curtin so far away from everywhere. Who set them up, Minister? Oh, Wasn't it the Labor Party? that? The Labor Party set up Fort Headland and Curtin. So much for the member for Fowler. Let's, let's have a look, shall we? Let's have a look, shall we, at some of the headlines that go back. Let's have a look at March 92, when the headline said. Order, 180 the Cambodian refugees at a holding part camp at Port Endland in North West Australia have begun a protest and hunger strike. A couple of days later, the Chinese detained at Port Hedland have been conducting what immigration officials say is a hunger strike. The hunger strike follows a similar campaign by 240 Cambodians. And perhaps I could read Order, this the one. The members for Oxley and the honourable members on the for Blair are not February, assisting. The honourable member the for vote. Listen, Minister, because this happened under your government. Shadow Minister, listen. This was your government. The four boat people looked pale and downcast as they talked of their shattered dreams. Under Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, I have lived for three years, eight months, and twenty days. Here, I have lived for almost three years. Both places are the same. Same article. Villawood detention compound is a hot, barren place. Among the hundred Cambodians inside, there have been several suicide attempts in the last couple of years. And further on, a welfare officer who worked at Villawood 
was sacked two months ago after sending officials in the Immigration Department a paper criticising the policy of keeping boat people locked away for years waiting for their case to be resolved. He claimed it's a slow and mental torture in the case of many Cambodians the Immigration Department has achieved where Pol Pot failed to break their resolve. And a group of, on the 21st of June, a group of boat people complained to the United Nations over the policy. And on the 16th of August, the federal government admitted in the High Court that it is unlawfully detained a Cambodian teenager seeking refugee status, and the Department of Immigration conceded that the 14-year-old Cambodian boy was held unlawfully for more than two years. So much for this member's hypocrisy, and let us face it, what this is is a distraction from what is happening in his own seat of Queensland and, Mr. and what he knows Order. About, Order. about those the things that are rotting in the seat time which has he expired. should be answering for. Order. Order. The honourable member for. Order. The order. Order. You haven't got the call yet. The honourable member for Bowman. Deputy Speaker, I find the remark of the honourable member for wherever uh, to the to, for Hind Marsh to be absolutely offensive. She's just accused me of rotting my seat. I find that very offensive, and I want it to be withdrawn. Well, whatever it was, I find it very offensive. <laughs> One or the other, they were still very, very offensive, and I ask for them to be Order. withdrawn. Order the honourable. <laughs> Order the honourable member for Bowman will resume his seat. Order. Order. Can we settle this? Can we settle this? Order. If the honourable member for um, Hindmarsh has, in fact, Accused, made an, uh, accused um, the honourable member for Bowman of uh, allegedly, uh, in some way, rorting something to do with his seat. I would be forced to ask her to withdraw. I apologise that really that I was distracted and did not exa hear exactly what was said. And uh, by the way that was presented by the honourable member for Bowman, it's made my job a little bit more difficult. But I would ask the honourable high member for Hindmarsh if. She did make some form of accusation that would require a motion of the, of the House that she should withdraw it. I would ask what it is that I said, but in respect to you, Mr Speaker, I would not want to say anything in this House that was unparliamentary, and I certainly wouldn't want to be one to make allegations that cannot be substantiated in this area. Order. I have answered in respect to the Speaker. I withdraw anything that would bring Order. disrepute I, to this place. I thank the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh. The honourable member for the chief, oh, the chief government whip. I move that the business of the day be called on, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker. Order. The honourable member for call on a point of order. Uh, this motion from the uh, chief government whip is the second time in which there's been an attempt to prevent an independent member. Order. Uh, there is from no. There is from no uh, from uh, contributing to an MPI. The honourable member for Corwell will resume his seat. The honourable member will resume his seat. There is no point of order. The question before the House is that the business of the day be brought forward, called on. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Honourable Member for Pearce. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the 11th, 12th and 13th reports for 2000 of the committee relating to the construction of mixed residential dwellings at Block 87, Section 24 Stirling ACT, the ABC Perth Accommodation Project East Perth WA and the Reserve Bank of Australia proposed head office building works and move that the reports be printed. The question is that the reports be printed. All those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. For Pierce. Mr Speaker, I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with pet reports. Is leave granted? I don't remember for Reid. The honourable member for Reid is leave granted. 
Leave his ground, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable for Pearce. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of the Parliament Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's 11th, 12th, and 13th reports for 2000. Uh, the, uh, the first report is Defence Housing Authority Stirling ACT, um, and it's on the construction of mixed residential dwellings at Block 87, Section 24, Stirling ACT. The committee has recommended that the proposed development proceed. The proposed development, estimated to cost $11.5 million, will compromise 50 detached and semi-detached dwellings. The project is needed to partially meet overall defence needs for additional Defence Housing Authority dwellings in Canberra and to meet the imminent expansion of the Australian Defence College. Defence intends to co-locate its three single-service command and staff colleges at the Australian Defence College. While the committee supports the proposed development, the inquiry raised a number of process-related issues that need to be addressed. The inquiry highlighted a number of deficiencies in the liaison process between the Department of Defence and the Defence Housing Authority, particularly in relation to the Australian Defence College. The committee has recommended that, at the earliest opportunity, the Department of Defence make DHA a party to all discussions which may impact on Australian Defence Force personnel housing requirements. The committee received evidence challenging the sincerity and the ad adequacy of the consultation process engaged in by Defence Housing Authority. The committee is strongly of the view that it is essential for all Commonwealth agencies sponsoring public works to consult with the wider community. Such involvement gives legitimacy to a proposed public work. And in relation to the Stirling project, I simply note that it would have been better if DHA's community consultation process had been more transparent. The second report, Mr Speaker, is in relation to Kerry Street, Darwin, and members may recall that the committee in its tenth report did not approve the development by Defence Housing Authority of 90 apartments in Darwin. The committee recommended that Defence Housing Authority report to the committee when it had complied with all the recommendations contained in its report. The committee has received a response from the Minister for Veterans Affairs and the Minister um, assisting the Minister for Defence on its recommendations and advice as to Defence Housing Authority planned actions. The committee has resolved that DHA proceed with the issue and evaluation of tenders and obtain an update, updated market appraisal. That the committee accept DHA's response in respect to recommendation six and that the construction of the proposed work not proceed until the committee's recommendations, with the exception of recommendation six, have been met. I will report again to members in relation to this matter. The committee welcomes DHA's responses to its recommendations and trusts that in relation to future projects the inquiry will serve to assist DHA achieve improved levels of transparency and accountability. The third report is the ABC Perth. The second report, or this report I have tabled relates to the development of new accommodation for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in Perth. The proposed development is estimated to cost $25.7 million and it will replace the ABC's existing facilities, which it has occupied for more than 40 years. The proposed facility will comprise a two-level office and technical zone with undercover parking, an acoustic zone, an area for technical workshops and stores, a communication tower and parking for radio and television outside broadcast vehicles. The committee found existing facilities to be poorly configured, inflexible and outmoded. In many instances, substandard buildings resulted in dysfunctional, inflexible and potentially dangerous facilities. The committee is of the view that the new facilities will allow for improved operational efficiencies and enhance ABC's capabilities. The committee has concluded that the project should proceed. Moreover, we see that the construction of the proposed facilities represents value for money. The facilities offer the potential to provide long-term benefits to the ABC and its current and potential clients. The ABC's existing facilities not only accommodate the ABC but also the West Australian Symphony Orchestra, more commonly referred to as WASO. Unfortunately, the site for the new development does not include accommodation for WASO. The future location of the orchestra proved to be the most contentious issue of this inquiry. While the committee was of the view that it would be physically possible for the ABC to include accommodation for WASO in the proposed development, it found that this would significantly impact on the way the site functioned as an ABC facility. Also, the ABC would suffer a significant financial penalty for WASO to have been considered in the final preferred development option. The committee examined this matter in some detail. 
we found that there had been an ad hoc consultation by the ABC prior to formally advising Wasso that it intended to sell the current premises and relocate. We also found a lack of credibility in the rationale for the level of assistance that the ABC had factored into project cost estimates and financial analysis to assist with the fit-out of alternative Wasso accommodation. The committee welcomed advice from the West Australian Government that there is a compelling argument for a tripartite agreement whereby the University of Western Australia, the Federal Government and the West Australian Government contribute to the relocation of Wasso. The committee is of the view that the treatment of the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra represents a precedent in relation to the level of funding for re relocation of ABC orchestras generally. Accordingly, the committee has recommended that the West Australian Symphony Orchestra receive from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation relocation funding commensurate with that received by the Tasmanian order, Symphony order, Orchestra Minister. Minister. and that the federal, state and relevant local governments consider funding options for the permanent housing of the West Australian Symphony Orchestra in the proposed Music Access Centre in an arrangement with the University of Western Australia on land to be provided by the University of Western Australia. And the final report, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is Reserve Bank of Australia, Martin Place, Sydney. The third report, um, this report that I have tabled, uh, relates to a proposed work at the head office building of the Reserve Bank of Australia at 65 Martin Place, Sydney. The Reserve Bank wishes to reconfigure its head office building and free up 7,000 square metres of underutilised floor space for commercial lease. This equates to six floors of standard commercial office space. The project is the result of a steady decline in staff located at the head office since the early 1980s, which is due to the use of improved technology and organisational changes. The cost of the project is estimated at $21.5 million. Revenue generated from tenants will be approximately $3.5 million a year. Resulting profits will return to consolidated revenue. The committee welcomes the commitment of the Reserve Bank to this entrepreneurial project. The committee looks forward to examining other building proposals that display similar initiative. And Mr Deputy Speaker, the Public Works Committee has consistently paid attention to heritage and environmental issues. They must be, continue to be given priority of concern in any works proposal submitted to the committee. They can never be just an afterthought. Features of cultural and historical significance attached to major public buildings should be, as far as practicable, preserved and bequeathed to future generations. The Reserve Bank building forms a part of Martin Place Heritage Precinct that is included on the register of the National Estate. The committee also understands that the building is described on the Central Sydney Heritage Local Environment Plan as being of historical importance for its ability to exemplify a post-war cultural shift within the banking industry. Some of the features of interest raised by the National Trust of Australia in the City of Sydney are a squash court, bank staff cafeteria and a shooting range. And while we were sympathetic to the preservation of heritage items, the committee was not convinced how features such as the bank squash court warranted preservation. However, the committee has recommended that before this work proceeds, the Reserve Bank make a photographic and written uh, documentation of all relevant features. I um, commend these reports to the House. Order the clerk. Business notice number five, RAF Base Edinburgh, re redevelopment stage one, Adelaide, motion for approval of work. The parliamentary secretary to the <coughs> Minister for Finance and Administration. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move that in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Committee Act 1969, it is expedient to carry out the following proposed work, which was referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works and on which the committee has duly reported to Parliament. RAF Base Edinburgh Redevelopment Stage 1, uh, Adelaide. <coughs> the Department of Defence proposes to undertake a redevelopment in the technical area at RAF Base Edinburgh near Adelaide, South Australia. This base is the home of one of the frontline combat capabilities of the Royal Australian Air Force, the Maritime Patrol Group, which operates the P-3 Orion Maritime Patrol and Reconnaissance Aircraft. The Maritime Patrol Group conducts a range of operational and surveillance roles, including its prominent search and rescue activities, and comprises both operational and support units that provide logistic support and maintenance support to keep the aircraft operational. 
The base also provides flight line and technical support for the Aircraft Research and Development Unit. The role of this unit is to extend the capabilities of the Australian Defence Force Aerospace Systems. Tasks undertaken are mainly in the advanced technology area and entail applied research, engineering development, test and evaluation and electronic warfare operational support. The proposed scope of the works is in direct support of this role. New facilities are required in the base technical area to accommodate administrative and technical personnel of the Aircraft Research and Development Unit. This unit is currently located in dispersed facilities that were constructed in the 1940s, are not suitable for the function, are remote from the aircraft hangars and are in urgent need of replacement. In addition, it is proposed to provide aircraft shelters for six aircraft, provide additional electrical power in an existing aircraft hangar, provide some additional workshop and shelter facilities and refurbish a test rig uh, facility. The progression of this element of the works will enable the disposal of defence property and will lead to efficiencies by co-locating the unit near its hangar and its main client base. Also proposed are new logistics facilities comprising office accommodation and warehousing for a number of logistics units that support the maritime patrol group and the base. These facilities are to be sited in the technical area of the base in close proximity to the hangar flight line and will replace existing dispersed, inefficient and poorly located facilities, some of which do not meet, meet modern standards. The units to benefit from these new facilities are the Maritime Patrol Logistics Management Squadron, 92 Wing Logistics Operation and Joint Logistics Unit South. The Joint Logistics Unit South which also supports other defence elements in South Australia, is a part of an Australia-wide support organisation. The procurement, stock control and warehousing functions of this organisation are currently being market tested as part of the commercial support program of the Department of Defence under the Defence Integrated Distribution System project. The outcome of the market testing is to be considered by the government later this year. Because Joint Logistics Unit South provides critical support to the Maritime Patrol Group, the market testing tender specified government furnished facilities on RAF Base, Amb uh, RAF Base Edinburgh. Nevertheless, there may be an option for the successful contractor to provide these facilities. This would reduce the capital cost of the construction project. In keeping with the recommendation of the Public Works Committee, the Department of Defence has agreed to defer the affected elements of the Joint Logistics Unit South requirements from the proposed logistics facilities until the outcome of the market testing is known. Mr Deputy Speaker, to avoid unduly delaying the other elements of this important project, the Department of Defence intends to tender the construction works with an option to include or exclude elements of the works that may be affected by the logistics market testing. An upgrading of the engineering services infrastructure, mainly in the technical area of the base, is proposed. The basic engineering services at RAF Base Edinburgh date from the time each area was developed, generally in the 1940s and 1950s. Although some improvements have taken place, the systems are in need of replacement as they have reached their capacity and are increasingly unreliable and major repairs and replacement of deteriorated systems are necessary. It is also proposed to demolish and or remove facilities in the area to be developed. The estimated cost of the proposal identified in the reference motion was $37.7 million. This estimate was based on December 1999 prices. Now, with the project not expected to be completed until April 2003, this figure needs to be increased to an outturn estimate of approximately $39.9 million. It should also be noted that there is a potential for reduction in capital investment costs should a non-government-owned facilities option be progressed for the logistics element currently being market-tested. Subject to parliamentary approval, construction will start mid next year and be completed by April 2003. 
In its report, the committee has recommended that this project proceed subject to the implementation of the recommendations of the committee. The Department of Defence agrees with the recommendations of the committee and on behalf of the government I would like to thank the committee for its support and I commend the motion to the House. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the parliamentary secretary in relating to approval of certain works be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Government business orders of the day, roads to recovery bill, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by the member for Batman. Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this the honourable member for Batman has moved an, as an amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Patterson in continuation. And thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I must thank the uh, Deputy Prime Minister for the commercial during question time, when he, uh, above all, uh, was quite happy to quote me and indicate how hard I have fought for road funding. I do know how important it is. But again, I keep coming back to the fact, is this the best result that Australia could have had? And the answer is a resounding no. And uh, I was pointing out how this government has overseen the highest fuel taxes ever in Australia. And at the same time that it has been prepared to collect that funding, it has slashed road funding, particularly for regional and local roads. And uh, I'm quite happy to turn to the black spot funding because it's a thing that is often thrown up by this government. They come back to black spot funding. It was our program. Sure, we took it away. Bob Collins was the minister uh, back in 1994, I believe, when we took it away. And why did we take it away? Well, I best the, guess the government should go and have a yarn to people like uh, Jeff Kennett and uh, the Honourable John Fay, who was then uh, Premier of New South Wales, or maybe Mr Borbidge, who was Premier of Queensland, because they know that when they received road funding from the federal government, they would spend it on anything but. And then they would come along to the federal government and say, well, you know, give us some black spot funding. We did that. And they were simply relying on the black spot funding. So along came the uh, Howard government in 96, reinstated uh, black spot funding, but did they reinstate any other form of funding? And the answer is definitely no. I also remember quite vividly and passionately Laurie Burton and Michael Knight visiting Raymond Terrace, and it was a historic agreement in November 1995 when the federal government and the state government of New South Wales agreed to reconstruct the Pacific Highway. That is something that is all thro also thrown up in this parliament by the Deputy Prime Minister. But what he doesn't tell us is, at the time that Laurie Burton, five years ago, offered that money and offered to participate in that program, the federal government was putting in $750 million. What are they putting in today? $600 million. This is a government that has pulled $150 million out of the Pacific Highway funding and, uh, of course, many parts of it have stalled. Mind you, it doesn't stop you, the, the Deputy Prime Minister, for announcing the money. Uh, I think he's announced the uh, uh, Chindera to Yelgan bypass about 16 times. Uh, I can also recall the then Minister for Transport, the Honourable Mark Vale, going to a public meeting in Karua. And this would have been in 1998, early 1998. And at that public meeting, there was some debate about whether the town of Karua should be bypassed or not. And the then Minister of Transport said, well, you know, I know there are a few people here that are friendly to my side of politics that uh, they don't want uh, this town to be bypassed. I'm pulling the funding out. It's ironic. It's ironic that this week, four lanes of continuous divided highway from Sydney to Karua will be completed. They haven't even started work on the Karua bypass yet. It will be another four years before that work is done. 
And I use these as examples to show the sort of games that this government has played with transport, the sort of games that this government has played with roads. Oh, it's all very well for the uh, Deputy Prime Minister to come in here and beat his breast now about uh, school kids and buses on country roads unsafe. Where's he been for the last five years? Is he going to tell us that this is something new? Is he going to tell us this is something that's just happened? Because I can assure him, as a representative of one of those electorates, where my kids, when they went to school, also travelled over those same sort of roads, they've been around for years. They've been around for generations because we've never built the proper roads in the first place. So it's nothing new. So don't come in here now and preach to those people that have had to live and put up with it. Mr Speaker, I indicated that this legislation should be about roads, about the vital infrastructure that this country needs. It's not. It's about a government that is trying to convince the people of rural and regional Australia that it cares about them. They want those people to forget the last five years of neglect. They want those people to ignore the fact that they are paying the highest prices for fuel that they've ever paid. They want the people of Australia to forget that they are paying the highest fuel taxes they have ever paid. And this is the only response. This is the only response that the government is prepared to give them. $1.2 million sounds a fantastic sum. It is a big sum of money. Where does it come from? Well, over the same period of time, how much will the government take out of the pockets of the fuel consumers? They will take over $2 billion. In other words, at the end of the four-year period, when this road-building program is underway or completed, it should be completed by then, the government will still be in credit with fuel taxes it has taken from the people of Australia. And the thing is, we will still not have the road network that we really need as a modern country going in to the uh, next millennium. Mr Speaker, this government has failed Australia with its just carte blanche acceptance of high fuel prices, without its ability to think, what can we do? And I'll give you an example because I have listened, I have attended a few hearings of the caucus committee that is going around Australia talking to people that are adversely affected by high fuel prices. And one group, particularly that have a grudge, and I believe they justly have a grudge, are people that spent a couple of thousand dollars converting their, their petrol consuming car to LP gas or people that uh, went out and paid an extra $800 to get one of these new Falcons that only uses LP gas. When they first came out, LP gas was worth about 40 cents a litre around my area. People are now paying 59.9 cents, and I had one couple uh, convince me that they are now running their gas, th their gas-altered car, on petrol because they think it's probably cheaper. They wonder why they spent the $2,000. But where this government has missed the point is this, that Australia essentially is self-sufficient in LP gas. Australia has developed technology and there is a whole industry out there of mechanics that fit LP gas conversions to cars. LP gas actually gives our nation an advantage as far as a fuel is concerned. But the shame of the Howard Costello Anderson government is that they are the government that put a tax on it. Up until the 1st of July this year, there was no tax on LP gas. And, you know, I would, I would have thought that the government may have come in here and said, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to let the world know that uh, you know, we're pretty resourceful and we're pretty cunning and we're going to take the tax off it. I tell you what, I'd support it. I'd support it, and I would, uh, I would uh, uh, love that to be uh, included in the amendment. And I might have to go and uh, have a word with the member for Batman about that. 
Or what about our trucking industry? We hear lots about the trucking industry. Again, we hear the Deputy Prime Minister stand up and tell us uh, how things are going so swimmingly for uh, truck owners and drivers and operators. He must be talking to a different group than I talk to, because I have plenty of them in my electorate. And they know that despite the 24 cents a litre rebate they're getting, they are still paying more for their diesel today than they were paying on the 30th of June, before the GST came in. That is a situation, and this was traditionally a, an industry made up of small business people from the government that claims to be the representatives of small business people. What are you doing to the trucking industry? I can tell you. Within another couple of years, the trucking industry will be made up of three or four major operators, and that's all. The owner-driver operators, the small organisations, the husband and wife organisations, they will be gone. Where will your competition policy be then? It will not be there. And what does this legislation do about it? Absolutely nothing. Why isn't there a code of conduct included in this legislation for our trucking industry? They have been negotiating long enough, and this government simply turns a deaf ear to it and ignores the need. That is why this piece of legislation really is a con job. It is all about trying to convince the people of Australia out there we care about roads, come and vote for us. I will give you another example just to show that. Because in a question to me, in a question by me on Monday to the Prime Minister, and this was where I mentioned the adverse effects of fuel prices on meals on wheels. And I'm sure every member of this House would agree that that is a vital service to ageing members of many of our communities. And uh, when the Prime Minister answered, and I'll quote from his answer, he said about local councils. But the fact that they have extra money to spend on roads means there will be less pressure on other areas of the budget, including the provision of many charitable and welfare services. As a result, it's a good deal all round. Well, when we have a look at the conditions that apply to this money being given out to local governments, what do we find? Clause 7, funding conditions. They must use the grants for expenditure on roads. They must account for their expenditure properly. Fair enough. They must maintain their existing road expenditures. Now, the whole point is what the Prime Minister told me on Monday is completely false, that it will not bring any relief anywhere for the councils at all because they have to maintain their funding for roads as they were as if they weren't getting this money and so there will be no relief there will be no added services as the prime minister said let's have a look at some of the other things because this is what this legislation really is all about this legislation it says it is expected that these conditions will cover the following administrative aspects of the program Firstly, the local government uh, body is to provide the minister with a proposal for the expenditure of the grant. In other words, Big Brother is watching. Centralised government will be telling the local government authorities, yes, that's acceptable, no, it's not, because you've got to submit it to the minister to get it approved. I'd have thought in this day and age, government was all about allowing local communities to determine their priorities. Not with this piece of legislation, it's not. But how about this one? Because this is the one I like. I hope they're going to put a picture of the uh, Minister for Small Business, Business and Workplace Relations uh, maybe walking his dog on it. The conditions will ensure that the Commonwealth receives appropriate recognition for its contribution to the roads concerned. The conditions will require that the local government body must direct signs acknowledging the Commonwealth funding along the roadworks being funded for the grants. I hope it's not on the side of the road. I hope it's not a danger to the travellers. But I guess it'll have to be a minimum size, and I guess it'll have to have the coat of arms and all the rest of it on it. But obviously what it's about is parading that this federal government gave some money to, uh, to roads. They're going to have to put it on every pothole, because I tell you what, it'll cost you more money for signs than it will for tar patching. 
What a ridiculous statement, but that says it all, and that is what this government about, is about. It is not about building a decent road network. It is about being out there and getting the accolades for putting more taxpayers' money in the government's pocket and giving them less back and building a, a road system that at the end of four years, despite $1.2 billion, will still be inadequate. And that is the charade that the government expect us to accept. As I said when I started, I always welcome funding for roads because I know we don't get enough. But if this government thinks it's gone far enough with this legislation, it really does not understand the needs of rural and regional Australia. It really does not understand what the people out there are asking the government to do. Governments should show leadership, and this government certainly is not doing that. Thank you. Order. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Hume. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Mr. Acting Speaker, uh, I welcome the opportunity to talk on the Roads to Recovery uh, Bill 2000, and I welcome it for a number of reasons. Now, I've been a member of Parliament at state and federal level now for 13 years. I drive approximately uh, 100,000 kilometres plus per year over the roads for the electorates that I've represented and currently represent, and uh, I have, uh, because of that. Uh, movement over those roads, seeing the state of our roads for that period of time and know uh, what is required to get those roads up to standard. It was interesting to hear the comments from the member for Patterson, who at no stage uh, during his uh, contribution to this House made any reference to not wanting the money that he was given by the government, nor indeed did he make any reference to the need for the New South Wales government, as an example, as an example, making a similar contribution to uh, to road funding uh, as uh, the Commonwealth has done. And, Mr. Uh, Acting Speaker, the issue of uh, the state of the roads was well recognised when I was a member of the Griner government, uh, which was elected in 1988. And at that time, the Griner government introduced uh, three by three uh, tax uh, at the Bowser. Uh, for, uh, for road funding, 60 per cent of which went into rural roads in New South Wales and was great, great, graciously and gratefully received by the, uh, the local shires and the local councils, because the road infrastructure uh, that, uh, that they had in their, their uh, shires at that time was, as it is today, breaking down at an astronomical rate because they had been laid down for 50 or 60 years, five or six decades and they needed an enormous injection of funds to get them up to scratch and make them safe for motorists. And it's interesting to note that since the car Labor government came in, they reversed that formula. They increased the, uh, the petrol, uh, state petrol tax to uh, four cents a litre for four years and reversed it to the extent where the 60 per cent uh, portion of it went to the metropolitan area at the expense of uh, rural roads and it wasn't long before there were vis visible signs of the, the uh, progress that uh, had been made in catching up uh, on the repair of those roads which started to, uh, to fall back again. I, uh, uh, about a fortnight ago, um, released a press release with regards to um, the announcement of the $1.2 billion uh, roads uh, recovery program. Uh, and, uh, I cautioned the government to, to ensure that that road funding was uh, distributed fairly, equitably and based on a needs priority. And I said in that press release, as a rural-based member who regularly travels on roads within the electorate of Hume, I am well aware of the atrocious state of local roads which have rapidly deteriorated following unusual constant wet weather. I also said, more importantly, these conditions have accelerated the breakdown of road infrastructure to the point where roads are becoming extremely dangerous and beyond the capacity of local government resources to maintain, let alone restruct. And uh, I know that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, the government, in relation to the distribution of this uh, special road package, uh, which is in addition to uh, the uh, annual local roads grants, 
uh, that uh, the Shires Association and the Shires uh, right throughout uh, uh, Australia are very, very grateful for the contribution that's been made. In the electorate of, uh, of Hume over the four-year period uh, that this package covers, uh, there's going to be $21.65 million uh, uh, allocated to Shire, 14 shires in the electorate of Hume. Now that's an average uh, for the uh, annual grant of about uh, $1.43 million uh, over those uh, 14 shires, or an annual grant to each shire of an average of $388,000. That is a significant contribution. And uh, it's been acknowledged uh, in some uh, memos to me that I've received from uh, Shires and indeed uh, from the Shires Association of New South Wales as an example through their G division. And I received this, uh, this facsimile uh, uh, yesterday uh, from the uh, chairman of the G division of the Shires Association, whom I know required about 50 or 60 million dollars to, uh, uh, to um, uh, repair uh, and reconstruct uh, roads within that G Division uh, Shire organisation. And the, the chairman, uh, Mayor Paul Braybrooks of Cootamundra Shire, said this. Dear Mr Schultz, refunding for local roads. Please accept G Division's appreciation for your efforts in representing the needs of rural areas for local road funding and for the recently announced Roads to Recovery program. Enclosed herewith, please find a copy of a letter to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport and Regional Services, the Honourable John Anderson MP, expressing the Division's appreciation and requesting a meeting to directly convey such to him. Yours sincerely, Paul Braybrooks. Now, it's well known in this place and outside this place that I sometimes uh, uh, don't make too many favourable uh, comments with regards to my coalition partners on some issues, but I have to say that the, uh, the way in which uh, this road funding has been handled uh, is uh, exemplary. Exemplary in as much that it's, uh, it's met uh, the concerns that I raised in, in regards to fairly and equitably distributing the funding. And uh, uh, can I just quote uh, from uh, the letter that I received, as everybody did, from uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Honourable John uh, Anderson, on the 27th of November when the funding formula was released and the amount of uh, funding for each individual shire was released. And he said this uh, in the third paragraph and the second sentence uh, of that third, uh, third paragraph. We are now in a stronger budgetary position that allows the government to return a dividend to the whole community through this substantial investment in local road infrastructure. The federal government has chosen to invest in the local road network because we understand its importance to the Australian economy and to the social amenity of all Australians. The Roads to Recovery program will provide a substantial investment boost to local roads, allowing widespread upgrading and maintenance work to be undertaken and providing additional employment opportunities in local communities. And what he said in that uh, letter to uh, myself was absolutely right. And of course, he didn't just say that uh, by chance, because he had an opportunity uh, over the past 12 months to read uh, the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Primary Industries and Regional Services uh, uh, report ahead of time running out, shaping regional Australia's future. And wouldn't you know it, Mr uh, Acting Speaker, that in page 146 of, uh, of that document it had this to say in relation to roads and I quote from it, paragraph 75. Roads are the lifeline for rural and remote Australia. This statement in Austroads Austro 1997 report encapsulates the importance of roads to regional Australia, and in brief, roads play a very significant role in the social and economic life of the nation. They are a vital element in the transport chain on which Australia's international competitiveness depends. With the loss of many services from small towns and the need to travel to regional centres for shopping and services, there is also now a greater dependence on road infrastructure than before. And uh, that report goes on uh, in relation to responsibility uh, for roads, talking about all three levels of government sharing responsibility for those roads. 
And uh, that in itself is, is uh, a true indication of what actually happens and one of the reasons why uh, I'm amazed that uh, the member for Paterson didn't uh, call upon the New South Wales state government to match the funding that the federal government has given, in addition to the funding that they, that they allegedly still, they still supply to local government. And the sad reality of it is that the last budget they removed $111 million from road funding in rural New South Wales. So uh, that gives you an indication of the commitment that they have, despite all the rhetoric that comes from them and despite the rhetoric that comes from country Labor about its commitment to uh, rural uh, New South Wales. Uh, and it also proves that they have absolutely no knowledge of how vital the, the restructuring of our road system is to those people out there who need to get their produce to market and for country people to drive considerable distances to get to work safely. safely. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Acting Speaker, I'd also like to, um, to, to make the point uh, that uh, it is, in my view, uh, a, uh, a very, very important um, point for me to make uh, in this chamber about the, uh, the needs of rural road funding for shires right across Australia, but more specifically the need for additional funds into the Hume electorate that I represent and an electorate uh, which uh, uh, some of my parliamentary colleagues uh, seek to covet prem prematurely uh, before the, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, redistributed boundaries take effect. But just in the Hume electorate alone, over those 14, over those 14 uh, uh, shires, uh, there is approximately there is a need for approximately 70 million dollars just to get all of the roads in those 14 shires and the rural electorate up to a standard that you and I and everybody else would expect to be safe for uh, the community, whether it's for business uh, people in the community or the ordinary uh, person on the street from those communities, from those many small villages, towns and cities in, uh, in uh, rural Australia who need to carry on for, uh, and drive over those uh, roads to get to their place of work and to, to deliver their, pro their, um, their produce. So I uh, welcome uh, the, uh, the announcement by both the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister on this very, very uh, worthwhile and gratefully accepted road package, and I thank them for listening to the concerns that I've raised uh, um, uh, on behalf of my constituency and indeed on behalf of the constituencies of uh, uh, all of the members across Australia, regardless of their political persuasion, for the fair, equitable distribution on the basis of needs for each of uh, those uh, groups of uh, shires that needed some additional funding. And in closing, Mr Acting Speaker, can I say this? I look forward in anticipation to a decent contribution to the repair of the road infrastructure in New South Wales by the New South Wales Labor government. And uh, I hope and, and uh, sincerely, sincerely request that they make that uh, contribution to match the federal, Labor, uh, the federal uh, coalition government's uh, contribution to roads as quickly as possible in the interest of road safety for everybody in New South Wales. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. I call the honourable member for the Northern Territory. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to make a contribution to this, this, to this debate uh, for one reason in particular, and that is to point out uh, to uh, the government, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister in particular, uh, the contradictions and the inequity within uh, the way in which this funding package has been put together and distributed. <clears throat> I was impressed this afternoon, Mr Deputy Speaker, when I heard the uh, Deputy Prime Minister during question time uh, regale us with the social benefits uh, that accrued to the community as a result of uh, better roads. And he made the point, uh, I made a number of points, uh, but a number of, uh, including uh, among them was the importance of road infrastructure to improving educational outcomes for people who live in rural communities. He also made the point about the importance of road infrastructure for improving the health outcomes for people who live in rural communities. 
And uh, frankly, Mr Deputy Speaker, I agree with him. I agree with him. But the plain fact is that in the context of the Northern Territory, this money will go next to nowhere to improving or providing social benefits to people who live in the Northern Territory. And I say that, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, knowing full well uh, that uh, the $20 million which the Northern Territory is to receive is going to be very welcomed by those, those uh, 70 odd community based, uh, or those 70 odd community councils and local government councils who will receive funding. But the fact of the matter is that the average uh, distribution of uh, these funds to rural communities outside of Darwin and Alice Springs will be around $10,000 per community over four years. $2,500 per year is, what the, uh, is the average amount that local government authorities will get in the Northern Territory. Now, you only have to ask yourself, does that sound fair or reasonable? And I have before me, Mr Deputy Speaker, a list of those uh, um, 17 or 18 uh, electorates that received the bulk of the funding. And it comes as no surprise, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that the electorate to receive the most funding was, of course, uh, that of the electorate of the member for O'Connor. And uh, the member for Wider, the deputy leader of the National Party, was the second or third uh, highest beneficiary of uh, this money. Now I make this observation, Mr Deputy Speaker. We've heard a lot today about the way in which this money was, distribu dis was being distributed. We haven't seen the formula which has been used. We've heard about population. We've heard about road length. We've heard about historical circumstances. Well, let me ask you this question, Mr Deputy Speaker. What strikes you as peculiar? In the case of uh, the electorate of Guida, its area is 114,000 square kilometres. It has 72,930 voters on the roll, and uh, it has a population of the 1996 census of 111,146 people. That electorate received $42,386,389. Now, I did two simple calculations. I uh, divided the population into that amount and got an amount of $581 per head. Uh, uh, sorry, $381 per head, and $581 per voter, and $372 per kilometre. And what I did then was use that, use those figures, and apply them to the Northern Territory. And what we discovered when we apply it to the Northern Territory, if we use uh, the population ratio. Uh, the population figures of the Northern Territory, bearing in mind the population of the Northern Territory is 190,000 and there are 105,000 voters, we would see that if you use the population criteria alone, the Northern Territory could expect to receive uh, something in the, in the vicinity of $72,457,000. We got 20. If you use the uh, um, uh, voting population, we could, have, we could have expected to have received $61,053,000. If we used the area figures on their own, the Northern Territory could have expected to have received $409 million. The fact is we got 20. And the fact is that the most isolated people in Australia, those people who need road access most, live in my electorate. And the people who have been disowned by this government, the people who they have made it very clear they have no concern for, are the people who live in my electorate. And I'm not alone in saying this, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm not alone in saying this, because I have in front of me uh, an extract from the Northern Territory News, dated the 29th of November. The headline is, $20 million for NT roads is just nonsense. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, you would expect me to be saying that, and I've done it. But you wouldn't expect the Northern Territory Transport and Infrastructure and Development Minister, Mick Palmer, to be saying it, but he has. He said that this, uh, and I quote here from this extract, 
It is extremely disappointing. It is just nonsense. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is nonsense for a number of reasons. You see, unlike the member for Guida, the National Party leader and Deputy Prime Minister, who sits in the Cabinet room and with his colleagues orchestrates where this dough goes, unlike the uh, member for O'Connor, also a minister who sits in the deliberations of where these monies go, we're in, a we're in a situation, Mr Deputy Speaker, where the government has concocted a formula, concocted a formula, and what we've seen is a very inequitable distribution of these resources. $1.2 billion of taxpayers' money flushed down the drain effectively in terms of my electorate because it'll do nothing, nothing to materially advance the state of the road infrastructure in the Northern Territory. And let's make it very clear, Mr Deputy Speaker. Not only does it not do that, but of course this package does nothing to alleviate the problem of high fuel prices. And Mr Deputy Speaker, high fuel prices are something I have an experience of. And I want to use the example of a couple of communities. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, you may or may not know where the community of Numbulwar is. You may or may not know where the community of Nooka is in the Northern Territory. And I'm sure the uh, Deputy Prime Minister has got no damn idea where either of those community, communities are. But between them they have roughly 3,000 people. Right, roughly 3,000 people. And there is a road length of some 156 kilometres. And they join the Roper Highway. The Roper Highway goes to Catherine. These two communities in South East Arnhem Land, for around six months of each year, they are in inaccessible by road. Inaccessible by road. And why are they inaccessible by road? Because, of course, the wet season, the rivers flood. And what do they need to ensure they get all round, all year access? They need a bridge, a bridge across either the Wilton or Roper rivers, or both. Plus, they need uh, road works done to give them all weather, all weather seal on the road. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the cost of just putting the road up to a reasonable standard is three million dollars. Now. Understand, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in the case of uh, these two communities, uh, the community of um, uh, Numbawa received $70,000 out of this uh, extra. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. $282,000 over four years. It will receive. And uh, Yugalmungi Community Council will receive around $307,000. Now they have local roads they've got to look after. The connecting road between these two communities is not their responsibility. It is a responsibility of either the Northern Territory Government or the Federal Government, and nothing, nothing in terms of the contribution being made out of this road money is going to assist in the development of an all-weather road for these two communities. And let me tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, what this means. The people at Numbulwa pay $1.83 per litre for diesel. $1.83 a litre for diesel. It's been estimated, uh, I understand, Mr Deputy Speaker, that if they had an all-weather road, an all-weather road to Numbawa, their freight costs would come down by something like 70 per cent. And the reason for this, of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, is during the wet season, during the wet season, for six, six months of the most of the six months of the year, they have to barge from Darwin. Now look. I hear the, uh, the leader of the National Party, the Deputy Prime Minister, come here and proselytise about the importance of rural communities. And I accept, Mr Deputy Speaker, that they are extremely important. And I, my heart goes out to all those farmers in northern New South Wales who have been ravaged by floods. But understand, Mr Deputy Speaker, the communities that I live in, they're not farmers, they're not farmers, predominantly Aboriginal communities. They have the lowest incomes of all Australians. They have the lowest level of infrastructure support of all Australians. Yet they pay the highest costs in Australia for fuel and transport, and their roads are miserable. And what do we get from this government? We get a maldistribution of these resources to the extent that we get $42 million going to the, the electorate of Guida, and uh, we have. Uh, um, 
the uh, member for O'Connor, uh, if we use, and I go back to using the figures for his electorate, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if we use the member for O'Connor's uh, um, figures, what we find out um, is that we use the population ratio of the Northern Territory uh, for the seat of Guida. The seat, the seat of Guida would receive $13.8 million, not 42. And I would think, in terms of my own communities, that's a far better distribution of the resources. Give us the $42 million in the Northern Territory, and Mr. Anderson, you take 14. You take 14. Because on any measure of disadvantage, on the edge of any measure of inequity, the people who are most disadvantaged in this whole process are the people who live in rural communities in the Northern Territory. Yet not one jot of notice is taken of that issue uh, by, this, by this government. And I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, I say to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, if this government wants to illustrate that they are actually working for all Australians, they would go back to the formula which he's created in his little mind back in his office here in Parliament House and come up with something which is fair and reasonable and come up with something which says of that $1.2 billion, we accept that the electorates of Kennedy, well, I beg your pardon, Kalgoorlie, and the Northern Territory, just by their nature, just by their nature, must get the lion's share of, this resource, of these resources which are being made available. But we don't find that at all. And while the electorate of, Ken of, uh, of Kalgoorlie is high up on the list, as it should be, where does the Northern Territory rate in the, uh, in the, in the hit parade of those, uh, of those communities, those, those uh, electorates which will receive money from this government for this purpose, for these roads? It's almost off the screen, almost off the screen. And the persons responsible for making these decisions are, of course, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and his Cabinet colleagues. And so when I hear the Deputy Prime Minister talk about the social benefits that can be garnered from improving roads in uh, rural and remote areas, I say to him, yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. What do you know, Mr Deputy Speaker? Of course I agree that if you can get kids to school across roads, it's very important. But did you know, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in the community of uh, Umbacumba on Groot Island, there are no teachers resident in the community of Umbacumba. They live something like 70 kilometres away from Alyangula and Anurugu, two other communities, on a dirt road. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is not an all-weather dirt road. Not an all-weather dirt road. This program will not provide them with sufficient resources to fix their roads. As a result, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are often times when neither teachers nor nurses can visit that community. So the kids go without education on those days and the community goes without the benefit of uh, the medical service provided by the registered nurses. Now, is that fair or reasonable? And if the Deputy Prime Minister is concerned about improving the social benefits that accrue to people who live in rural areas, what he would have done was allocate this money on a needs basis, not on some hairy-fairy formula made up in his office based on historical circumstances. I think the historical circumstance he was talking about was who won the last bloody election. Order. And given that they won the last election, what he said is that we will make a determination of what the priorities will be on the sort of formula we will create for ourselves. The Leader of the Opposition has been 100 per cent on the money about the use of these funds ever since it became clear where they were going to go. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, because uh, this money is being distributed in this particular way, there is no, there, there is no uh, recognition of the strategic importance of developing infrastructure in regional Australia. And we've got the $400 million of the uh, other program, which is yet to be distributed, uh, the National Highway Fund. And this afternoon I had, the, I had occasion to talk to uh, a constituent of mine who is also a director of the Australian Trucking Association. And I asked him what he thought of this program. And he said that they were extremely disappointed. He said it was a slap in the face for territorials. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, he's 100 per cent correct. 
It is a slap in the face for Territorians. The Northern Territory government, not a friend of mine, but supposedly an ally of uh, the coalition, they've got Senator Tambling sitting in the Senate, a national, sitting with the National Party and a parliamentary secretary. What influence does he have on this government? Clearly none. Clearly none. And what we've seen, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that uh, they've made decisions which, as Mr Cooper has said, is a slap in the face for the community of the Northern Territory. And as a result, Mr Deputy Speaker, whilst I would like to see some of that $400 million go, to, for example, to uh, upgrading the uh, uh, highway between Catherine and Darwin, Highway 1, I'd also like some of that money to go to uh, the highway, from, highway 1 from Burrillula to Burketown. I bet it won't. I bet it won't. Because it, it's the four hundred million dollars, the four hundred million dollars which is coming from the National Highway Fund, which I'm talking about, which is yet to be announced. And I'll bet we don't get a cent of that. I'll bet we don't get a cent of that. And it won't, if we, even if we do, it won't go to addressing the, the huge need that is, is, is clearly obvious in the Northern Territory. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's important that I said all of these things, because in 1996, when the Howard government got first elected. They canned the regional road program in the Northern Territory, a regional road program which was based on strategic roads around Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory. Now they canned that program. $15 million over three years, gone. As it happens, Mr Deputy Speaker, the roads which it was earmarked for, the Daly River and Port Keats Road, 128 kilometres, $2 million, serving a population of about 3,500 people. The Arnhem Land Link Road, 393 kilometres, $5.3 million, uh, serving a population of 3,500 people or thereabouts. The Nooka Numbawa Road, which I've spoken of previously. The Anurugu Umbacumba Road, which I've spoken of previously. The Papunya and Kintour Road, which I've spoken of previously. These are strategic roads identified by a collection of people, the Northern Territory Government, Aboriginal people through the Land Council of the Northern Territory, is requiring funding. Funding which was identified by the previous Labor government and made available for this purpose. Funding which was knocked on the head by the Howard government as soon as they came into office. And you're, you cannot believe, Mr Deputy Speaker, how aggrieved I am that this money which has been made available across Australia hasn't gone to provide, hasn't been done on a strategic basis, hasn't been done on a needs basis to develop the infrastructures required in the Northern Territory in terms of roads. Mr Deputy Speaker, what I can say is that this, uh, uh, this is failing the needs of my communities, this is failing the needs of the Northern Territory, this is failing the needs of Australia. This is not done on a strategic basis or on a needs basis. This is done on the whim of the government. And you've only got to see the distribution of funds to understand that that's a fact. And the people who are being most disadvantaged in Australia in terms of access to infrastructure, access to resources, access to good education, access to good health, those things which have been identified as the sort of social outcomes which the Deputy Prime Minister is trying to achieve, the people most disadvantaged in all of those areas are Aboriginal people who live in remote communities of the Northern Territory, and whilst they will receive some monies for their— the 70 communities will receive smaller amounts of money for their local roads, nothing, nothing, nothing is being done to uh, make uh, a reasonable fist of doing a strategic analysis of what money should go into roads in the Northern Territory and that money being provided. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Watson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move the debate be adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. The adjourned debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those that have been say aye, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The chief opposition whip. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I move that leave of absence for the remainder of this year be given to the honourable member for Bass for maternity purposes. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those that have been say aye, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the House to now adjourn. The question is that the House to now adjourn. I call the Honourable Member for the Northern Territory. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, Mr Deputy Speaker, to use uh, this short time available uh, during this uh, adjournment uh, to read to you a letter uh, from a Year 8 student uh, from Jabiru School in the Northern Territory. This letter has been written by Miranda Tapsell, a 13-year-old girl uh, who attends the Jabiru School. Uh, recently, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Year 8 students from Jabiru Area School uh, completed an a unit of work on argument and persuasion. At the end of the unit, 
the students had to write a letter to the editor on a topic that interested them or about which they felt strongly. The subject matter was entirely up to them. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, this student uh, wrote a letter about the apology and the failure of the Prime Minister to say sorry. And I might say, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that the views which uh, she expressed in this letter I'm sure goes to, the, goes to the heart of many arguments which have been had in this place about the necessity for the Prime Minister to apologise on behalf of the government and the people of Australia. But I would like, Mr Deputy Speaker, just to read this letter from Miranda Tapsell. The heading is sorry. Dear Editor, I am ashamed of the way our Prime Minister, John Howard, consistently refuses to say sorry to the stolen generation. These people have literally been taken away from their family because the government of the day believed that the Aboriginal children of mixed races would have a better education by being removed from parents and relatives. Because of that, hundreds of Indigenous Australians have lost their culture and language. They do not know where they come, where they come from and, most importantly, many of them do not know who their family is. Of course, John Howard himself may not feel that he should say sorry because he personally did not do anything. But he is the Prime Minister, the head of the government, and he should have the compassion to apologise for the actions of previous governments that have caused this terrible trauma for these innocent victims. Stop and think how you would feel not ever having known your parents because you were taken away from them. How would you feel having been told that your parents died a month ago when you had finally found out where they lived? Mr Howard, if you were not the Prime Minister, and you were part of the stolen generation, you would be in there pouring your heart out on the subject. Some citizens of Australia may ask, quote, what will say sorry, what will saying sorry change? End of quote. Saying sorry always helps. This apology is like any other one. On behalf of the stolen generation, I beg you to say one simple word that will heal the rift between black and white. Come on, John Howard, make the effort to apologise now. Yours sincerely, Miranda Tapsell. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, you'd have to say that's a heartfelt plea from a young Australian who feels deeply about the subject, from a young Australian who clearly understands the hurt that's been felt by members of the stolen generation, from a young Australian who I know knows many people who are members of the stolen generation. And that heartfelt plea which he's making is something which is shared by the majority of Australians, yet it's something which our Prime Minister cannot confront. He can't accept the legitimacy of the demand that he should say sorry on behalf of all of us. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think he'll have a very good opportunity. Next year, when, when the centenary of our Federation, this parliament will sit in Melbourne. And I'd make a plea to the Prime Minister, accept, accept the requests by so many Australians of goodwill for you to apologise on behalf of the people of Australia and use the occasion of that meeting of the parliament on the centenary of our federation in Melbourne to say sorry. The question is the House to now adjourn. I call the honourable member for Gilmore. Deputy Speaker, tonight I rise to read a reader's speech prepared for me by Dean Little, a Year 10 student from St John Evangelistic High School in Nowra, and he's sitting in the gallery. He has been doing work experience with me this week in his own time, Mr Deputy Speaker. His first week of work experience with us was performed at the electorate office in Nowra, and this apparently infected him with such interest that he has decided to spend another week with his local federal politician. I asked him to prepare a five-minute speech for me in his work experience and any other topic and this is what he wants to say, and I quote, Work experience this week has been a wonderful insight into the effort that goes on behind the scenes to keep this country running. Before, I thought I knew roughly how much work politicians did or didn't do. Now I fully respect and admire them. Politicians put in almost a whole day's work with little sleep and no time to just sit down and breathe. Politicians are constantly running to meetings or trying to get into the House of Representatives or the Senate before they are locked out. I especially <laughs> admire the dedication MPs have for representing their electorate. During this week, I have enjoyed the many privileges and learning experiences given to me by everyone in the House. 
I was fortunate enough to meet and shake hands with people that I had previously thought were untouchable. I have learned information that no, not many others would know, like why the doors behind the Speaker in the House of Reps are so tall and why the clocks are so high. I will cherish this week for a long time indeed. Finally, I would like to thank not only the people with whom I have worked, but also the people who showed me the way around and the people who taught me the detail of government that I did not know. The people in the library were all too willing to help, and the part of the speech you are about to hear would have been a hundred times more daunting without their help. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, racism, he says racism in Australia has been a big issue ever since Federation. The people subject to this most are the Indigenous. At the school I attend in Nara, I have heard quite a lot of racism, which I find strange, because the students with whom I hear these remarks don't have a lot of interaction with the Aboriginal community. At our school, there are less than a handful of Aboriginal people. Given such little interaction with Aboriginal people, how can students who are 14 to 17 years of age make informed racial remarks, especially since they have a negative edge? I feel that my peers are becoming more racist, but the racism that is displayed is not true racism. I believe these acts of racism don't sp uh, sprout from hate or contempt, but rather ignorance, greater social acceptance of negative comments and the early learning from parents. And the way we can put an end to this, in my opinion, is by raising awareness and education. Although these acts of indecency are not being conducted in front of our Indigenous students due to their small numbers, it is still having negative effects. With each joke, comment or racial remark that is negative to our Aboriginal community, the children listening feel more superior. Because through these jokes, etc., we are putting the Aboriginals of Australia down and projecting the Anglo up higher in the social minds of my peers. With more children having an idea of superiority in their heads, more jokes will be told and the situation will snowball. The quicker we can start to educate people to understand that even the smallest racist joke is not okay, the quicker we can melt this snowball down. I feel that to start educating my peers, we must show them the effects of their action and also make them realise what they are doing, because society does not condemn such insensitive speech and therefore not all children realise what it is they are doing. I find it quite strange to find that 0.01 per cent of our genetic makeup is responsible for this entire ruckus and the detriment of human rights. You see, on page 22 of September the 4th issue of this year's Time magazine, it writes that 0.01 per cent, the percentage of a person's genes that is reflected in outward appearance, colour of skin, eyes, etc. And that is what it boils down to. We all have the same colour blood that runs through our veins, so why should colour matter? We are all human, after all. We should celebrate the one thing that unifies us and not try to find ways to separate different cultures. While we're, we're, we are not black or white, we are the display of our genes which we should all have the right to show and not be subject to different rules or standards. Those with darker skin should not feel intimidated when walking into a room full of people who have fair skin and vice versa. A white skinned person should not feel intimidated when walking into a room full of people with dark skin. We need to stop seeing each other as black and white. We need to get past that and see people as humans, fellow man, and to try to see things from their perspective. I think it would be better if we were all colour blind. And those are the words of Dean Little sitting up at the media gallery. Thank you. The question is the House to now adjourn. The Honourable for Swan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, last week I received information relating to the use of entitlements in my office. Since then, I have searched record the records of my office. I've examined relevant uh, entitlement guidelines and I've questioned my staff. I've also sought advice from senior parliamentary colleagues about the most appropriate way to proceed. I've decided that the circumstances warrant me making a voluntary repayment to the Department of Finances and Administration. I'm conscious of the precedent set by the now Special Minister of State, Senator, Senator Allison. In 1998, uh, Sen Senator Allison made a repayment to DOFA of $9,063 for charter allowance claims over which some doubt existed as to their compliance with guidelines. I have also decided to put this matter on the public record, given the high level of public interest in matters relating to MPs' entitlements. Accordingly, I inform the House that this afternoon I have sent the following letter to the General Manager of Ministerial and Parliamentary Services in the Department of Finance and Administration. And Mr Roger Fisher, General Manager, Ministerial and Parliamentary Services. Dear Mr Fisher, it has recently come to my attention that a member of my staff has lodged three claims for reimbursement of private vehicle usage in my absence from the electorate office without appropriate authorisation. This has led me to review my office procedures for the administration of this allowance. I have consulted the guidelines on the use of this entitlement 
examine my office records of such claims and question my staff in relation to these matters or these claims. I've regretfully come to the conclusion that the verification procedures I have employed have not been sufficiently rigorous. I've also discovered in consulting the guide to members of parliament staff certified agreement that I'm required to authorise an employee to use a private vehicle for official purposes in advance of travel. I've been authorising the claims after the travel has been undertaken. I note that the guide is dated the 23rd of December 1999 and I'm unsure whether advance authorisation was a requirement prior to this date. However, even if it was not, uh, there are sufficient defects in the administration of these claims in my office from the time I became a member of parliament to undermine my confidence in my office systems. In the circumstances, I would be grateful if you would advise me as a matter of urgency of the total amount of private motor vehicle allowance which has been paid to, to staff in my office since October 1998. It is my intention to repay this amount. Depending on the quantum, I may need to do so in instalments, which I will discuss with you subsequently. I have also informed my staff that it will, I will no longer be authorising any claims for reimbursement of expenses for private vehicle usage. Instead, I have recommended that any such expenses, duly documented, be claimed as tax deductions for work-related expenses. I am also considering what disciplinary action might be appropriate in, the circumstance, in these circumstances and will advise you further following discussions with my staff. I have consulted with senior members of the opposition on this matter and have taken their guidance into account in writing to you. Yours sincerely, Kim Wilkie, 30th of November 2000. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The question is the House to now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Curtin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two weeks ago, the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business addressed the 2000 Corporate Work and Family Awards of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And one of the winners of an award was the Hollywood Private Hospital in Nedlands in my electorate of Curtin. It's a 350-bed private teaching hospital employing some 850 people, and it won the award in the large business category for over 100 employees. Hollywood Hospital was cited by the minister as a paramount example of the economic and social virtues of innovative and flexible workplace relations. In fact, Hollywood Hospital was the winner of the National Gold Award for the highest performance overall in these corporate work and family awards. At the core of the hospital's family-friendly policies is a flexible approach to their employment conditions that allow employees to control their working hours to their advantage and to the advantage of their employer. The hospital offers flexi time, job sharing, part time work, access to single days, annual leave, annualised hours, and many other initiatives, including arrangements for full time ward managers to work at the hospital during the school hours of their children and then from home outside school hours. And that offers an extremely important consideration for many parents and families. A high proportion of the nurses at Hollywood are employed on a part time basis and not as the opposition would have it because they are somehow economic victims, but rather that is what they want according to their requirements and that's what they expect from their employer. As the minister described it, the hospital gets the skilled and experienced nurses it needs and the nurses get the hours they want. This is 21st century workplace relations at its best and it's easy to forget that if those who had opposed industrial relations reforms had had their way, these kind of flexible and innovative arrangements would never have seen the light of day. Not because such arrangements aren't supported by workers, by management and by business, but because they are opposed by trade union leaders and their delegates in the parliament. Only a commitment to flexibility, efficiency and reform on the part of successive Liberal and coalition governments has allowed workplaces to be transformed from calcified battlegrounds into places where efficiency and productivity go hand in hand with family and personal responsibilities. But having achieved great reforms is no guarantee to the community that those reforms will endure. For in my state of Western Australia, the Australian Labor Party actively threatens the labor relations achievements of that state. Under the coalition government led by Premier Richard Court, the adult minimum wage in Western Australia has increased by $21.30 to $368 a week. The introduction of the Workplace Agreements Act in 1993 created an alternative industrial relations system that's delivered more flexible and productive arrangements for employers and employees. There's been an increasing acceptance of workplace agreements over awards and industrial agreements, more than 254,000 since their introduction. 
employees not previously covered by awards other than those remunerated by commission or piecework now have their wage rates protected under the Minimum Conditions of Employment Act 1993, the first of its kind in Australia. Pre-strike ballot laws came into effect on 1 January 1998, allowing West Australian workers to vote democratically on potential strike action while preserving confidentiality and privacy on the part of workers placed in this situation. And the results have been impressive. Western Australia consistently outperforms the other states in most labour market outcomes. It's consistently amongst the best states for job creation, low unemployment and youth unemployment, and has had relatively high wages growth. And in the past decade, there's been a steady decline in industrial disputes, and West Australia's average number of working days lost remains below the national average. Yet the twin dangers that federal labour and Western Australia labour pose to these achievements is very real. Back in August, the leader of the Labor opposition in Western Australia was steamrolled by his federal colleagues at their national conference into supporting the outlawing of individual agreements, despite his own public admission that these agreements are of benefit to West Australian workers, particularly in crucial industries like our mining industry. The state Labor leader admitted publicly that he held the cause of Labor Party unity and union amicability as a priority obviously in higher regard than the interests of West Australian workers and business. Not that we should have any sympathy for state Labor in Western Australia. They may have thought that they were only being collegiate in backing what had actually been federal Labor policy in 1998, but they themselves are a threat to good workplace relations in Western Australia. Plainly, Western Australian state Labor is cut from the same cloth as that of Queensland Labor, where Queensland work agreements have been neutered by the Labor government despite their pre-election posturing on the a pseudo-commitment to the principle of individual expired. agreements. The question is the House to now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Capricornia. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've spoken before about the concerns held by people living in the mining communities of the Bowen Basin in my electorate in relation to what they see happening to their communities where they've built their lives and their homes. Over the past few years, there's been an increasing mood of insecurity fuelled by industrial disputes and downsizing. There's been a lack of trust between the companies and the workers and their families due to the failure of companies to communicate effectively and openly with their employees. There's been a population decline as a result of redundancies and more often the shift of companies to contract labour instead of a permanent workforce. 12-hour shifts have also encouraged families to move to the coast while Dad stays in the mining town for his shifts and comes home on days off. These factors are having a big impact on the mining communities. Families are anxious about their future and under pressure. The decline in the population is affecting the viability of small businesses, local community organisations and important services such as schools and hospitals. People are sick of feeling like their communities have been forgotten by governments and that they are simply at the mercy of mining companies. The people who I've been talking to in the mining towns want some reassurance that there is a general commitment to the life of their towns so they can, can be confident about building their families' futures there. As a result of this call from the community, the State Minister for Rural Communities gave the go-ahead for a local committee to organise a forum sponsored by the state government. Participants were, in, were invited to discuss the problems causing anxiety and anger in the mining towns and spell out how they see their futures and what support is needed to achieve those goals. The Positive Futures in Mining Communities Forum in Murrumbah this week brought together local councillors and CEOs, state government department representatives, union delegates, community people, mining company representatives and small business owners from across the Bowen Basin. There was an acknowledgement that the coal industry is under more pressure today than in the past, but even in the current environment there is no justification for the constant threats by the companies of imminent disaster which undermine the confidence of these towns. It is now time for communities, companies and governments to agree that these towns do have a future and they deserve the commitment of each of those partners to strengthen that future. It is good to see that at least one of the mining, town, mining companies sees a role for itself in that process. I quote from the uh, Daily Mercury of the 29th of November where Ian Dimmitt from BHP said, and I quote, however there is, is a future in the coal business and the communities, and it is great to see everyone participating, the government, the unions and the local residents, to try to, as a community, come up with the answers. The State Minister for Mines and Energy, Tony McGrady, announced a significant measure by the state government that it will now require companies opening new mines to give undertakings about local jobs. And of course, the, uh, the industrial relations policy announced by the ALP at its um, recent national conference this year 
will also help to uh, bring some security back into the, uh, the industry from the employee's point of view. Mr Speaker, I want to support the initiative of the people who pushed for the idea of the forum and who worked to make it possible. Linda Pollock and Joy DeGuara um, are those people I'd name in particular, although I know that many others were involved. But it was really Linda and Joy's baby from the start, and it was a success. I thought the forum was a valuable exercise and a very positive one. I know how hard groups in the individual mining towns are working to pinpoint opportunities that can diversify the economic base of the towns and promote a positive view of the mining communities. I know there are also groups who are taking up the challenge to mining companies to accept their responsibility for the well-being of the towns and the people in them. The forum was a chance to support those people uh, in those individual communities, to bring them together, to build partnerships between the communities and to get mining companies talking to the communities that they, uh, that they are working in. I hope that the forum will prove to be a first step towards putting an end to the environment of insecurity and uncertainty that has stifled the mining towns of central Queensland and that the new relationships created by the forum will provide a strong platform for capturing future opportunities identified at the forum this week. Question is the House to now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Groom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. They say a week is a long time in politics. I wonder exactly what the Queensland Premier Peter Beattie is thinking after the re revelations this week at the Shepherdson inquiry into electoral fraud. <laughs> Just a fortnight ago, Premier Beattie and his deputy Jim Eld arrogantly closed down State Parliament for the year, packed their bags, and set, set about heading overseas on government business. Member Premier Peter Morton. Beattie. Premier Peter Beattie flew to Japan and Mr Elder prepared to go to Africa. Well, Mr Beattie made it to Japan. Mr Elder, on the other hand, feigned an illness and stayed at home. However, instead of going to the doctor, Mr Elder paid a very discreet visit to the Queensland Criminal Justice Committee. The rest is history and I'm, sh I'm sure the actual events will be embedded in the minds of senior Labor officials for quite some time. I'm sure, too, that the specific events of the last two days will leave better memories in the minds of ordinary Queenslanders. I'm sure Yesterday, State Member for Springwood, Springwood, Grant Musgrove, admitted to witnessing four false electoral enrolment forms. Today, former Deputy Premier and Labor Member for Kapalabar admitted to enrolling some of his brothers and sisters at a Brisbane home when they did not permanently live there. Shame. Mr Elder also said his brother Philip and then wife Linda were enrolled at his sister's home but did not live there. But that's not all. I am led to believe that in evidence this afternoon, high-profile Ipswich Labor councillor Paul Tully admitted to also to fraudulently filling out enrolment forms. Unfortunately, Jesus, I suspect shocker. the list does not stop there. Already the inquiry has heard evidence that, about the involvement of a number of other state and federal Labor MPs in electoral fraud. It has also brought to the surface allegations about the $1,400 payment the honourable member for Lilly made to the Australian Democrats. These are all very serious allegations and the people of Queensland have a right to be concerned. Worse still, they have a right to be outraged. For well over two years, Premier Beattie has used every opportunity to extol the virtues and integrity of his government. Well, Mr Speaker, the truth speaks for itself and history will record that the Beattie government was full of fraudsters and rorters. The question mark ever even hangs over the Premier himself. As we well know, yeah, yeah. Premier Beattie was State Secretary of the Labor Party and has been around the traps for a very long time. It is quite unbelievable to think that he was unaware that his deputy, the chairman of his Legal and Constitutional Review Committee, his successor as State Secretary and other prominent members of the party were up to no good. Mr, De Mr. Speaker, I think if Blind Freddie was a member of the Labor Party, with as much involvement and experience as Peter Beattie, that even he would have been able to see that there were problems with rorting. But Mr Beattie's problems don't end there. Just today, his government was plunged back into minority status with the resignation of Jim Elder and the eminent resignation of Grant Musgrove from the, from the, party, from the Labor Party. Fortunately for Mr Beattie, Mr Elder and Mr Musgrove will have indicated they will continue to support the government in parliament. However, in my view, the Premier accepts this support, he would be a fraud. To say that he will not tolerate rorters and cheats in his party and then turn around and accept the, the, the support of rorters to stay in office is nothing but a hypocrisy at the worst. This is a farce. What the Premier is saying is that he is not only happy to have the support of rorters to get elected, but that he is happy to have the support of rorters to stay elected. 
a government for rotors, by rotors, with rotors. <laughs> if Mr Beatty is serious about cleaning up rotting in his party, he sure. should reject the support of rotors and send a clear signal to, uh, that criminal behaviour will not be tolerated in the Australian Labor Party. Mr Beatty must also answer the question about how many more elected members of the Labor Party are going to be embroiled in this scandal. Hopefully, for the sake of Queensland people, the Shepherdson inquiry will help in answering this question and restore integrity in the electoral process. Thank you, Mr know. Speaker. Before I recognise the member for Fowler, I'd just like to make a brief uh, comment to the House following events in the House earlier today and yesterday. The member for Burke had in fact raised with me his concern about whether it was consistent to allow a request for the withdrawal of a remark that someone found offensive, that that request was not pursued by the Speaker. I just want to indicate before the House rises this today that in the last hour or so um, the clerk has found many instances where speakers have in fact been asked to make us, uh, been asked to require someone to withdraw a statement and the Speaker has chosen not to do so. Madam Member for Fowler. Mr Speaker, have I three minutes or five minutes to address my speech? The Member for Fowler has until, the, until 6 p.m., at which time the House will automatically adjourn unless anything she should say would provoke a minister at the table to require the debate to be extended. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the electorate of Fowler is regarded as the safest Labor seat in Australia, so it's unusual that a Liberal government health minister should promise something for Liverpool Hospital in the electorate of Fowler. But Liverpool Hospital serves a much greater area of southwestern Sydney, including the marginal seat of MacArthur, held by the Finance Minister John Fay. So when the Health and Aged Care Minister announced in a press release dated 1998 that he and the member for MacArthur supported the placement of an MRI scanner at Liverpool Hospital, it seemed like a sure thing. The minister said at the time, and I quote, I expect the hospital to have an MRI as soon as possible. Well, Mr Speaker, we are still waiting out there in Liverpool. Two years ago, the minister described Liverpool Hospital as the largest new teaching hospital in Australia, located in a rapidly growing area which already serves 750,000 people. He went on to say, and I quote, Liverpool Hospital has established its case at a, as an underserviced region and is clearly el eligible for assistance under the Federal Adjustment and Relocation Scheme and subject to the New South Wales Government providing the necessary supporting documentation. I expect the hospital to have an MRI as soon as possible. But here we are, two years down the track and no sign of the scanner. scanner. Now, we all know how the Minister for Health and Aged Care likes to help out his mates when it comes to getting an MRI for them. And his media release gives credit to his mate, the member for MacArthur. The original announcement praised the member, saying that Mr Fay, who has worked hard to secure the new technology for the South West Sydney population, said his constituents and the people of Sydney will receive enormous benefit from an MRI scanner at Liverpool Hospital. Since then, or rather since the redistribution, which makes the seat of MacArthur less safe for him, Mr Fay has bailed out. He's taken his carpet bag off to the seat of Hume. He doesn't care about MacArthur anymore. No sign of the promised MRI scanner and no sign of the hard-working member for MacArthur either. But, Mr Speaker, while the member for MacArthur is no longer around, the need for an MRI scanner at Liverpool Hospital remains. Patients at Liverpool Hospital who need an MRI scan are forced to go to a privately operated centre. They are required to pay the difference between the fee charged and the Medicare rebate. Patients can expect to pay up to $500 from their own pocket for essential scans. That is, when the centre is open. When it's not open, this major teaching hospital has to send patients requiring scans to Westmead Hospital. So patients with brain and spinal cord injuries, patients including road accident victims, face an ambulance trip of 40 minutes each way to access this life-saving technology. The dedicated work of health professionals at Liverpool Hospital is building its reputation as an excellent teaching hospital. However, without an MRI scanner, Liverpool Hospital cannot achieve its full potential as a teaching hospital. By now, 
patients at Liverpool Hospital should have had access to an MRI scanner. Instead, they have had to pay through the nose for private scans or be shunted all over Sydney to access this service. They have, Mr, Dep Mr. Speaker, the hard-working member for MacArthur to thank for their weight. John Fay, thanks for nothing. The people in MacArthur or Hume at the next federal elections, when they cast their vote at the ballot box, will remember what John Fay has done for them. Question is the House do now adjourn. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The House stands adjourned until 12.30 p.m. next Monday.